for those of us joining online. We'll be going live in a moment. Thank you so much. <laughs> Recording in progress. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. We will bring the order the May 21st, 2024, uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting, um, on the, the county agenda and then, or sorry, county budget. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? And Chair Cummings? Here. Um, I'd like to see if there's any, uh, Additions, revisions, and or deletion to today's agenda. I'll turn it over to Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. Yes, Chair Cummings and uh, members of the board, we do have some revisions. Uh, the regular agenda item number eight, there's additional materials, revised memo, packet page 47 is replaced. The Human Services budget presentation should read, revenues FY23-24, 176,123,000. Um, change is nine million five ninety one nine nine one. On item eight, there's also additional materials. There's a revised memo. Packet page fifty five is replaced. The May revise update bullet points should read: housing deferrals plus elimination in FY twenty five twenty six. Additional CalWORKs program reductions, APS IHSS reductions and eliminations. And then on item nine, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo. Packet page 61 is replaced. Slide one, a public defender's public presentation should read Office of the Public Defender 2425 requested budget. And that concludes the additions to today's agenda. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance. Is there any board member who'd like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, we have a person in uh, Watsonville that, that was a former mayor, former council member back in 1989, and good dear friend of ours in South County, uh, Todd McFerrin. Okay. Um, you know, other moment of silence, we'll dedicate this moment of silence to Todd McFerrin. Thank you. If you'll all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and set up the world. All right. The next item on our agenda is oral communications. Uh, any member of the public may address the board during this period of time. Um, speakers will be given two minutes and you'll be able to speak to items that are not on the agenda or items that are on our regular agenda or consent. However, if you speak to items that are on our regular agenda, you will not be able to return to speak to those items when those items are heard. And so at this time, if any member of the public would like to come up and speak during oral communications, you can approach the podium at this time. Thank you. Uh, Supervisors, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, I believe a lot of you have uh, abandoned the Constitution. Uh, there was a group in 1998 called Visions in Action that was supported by AMBAG, which is a COG, it's a Soviet. It was sponsored by Bruce McPherson's uh, 
and Blitzer and other people involved with this, together with the head of AMBAG, uh, which is, again, a Soviet. Uh, city ma managers are also uh, dividing and destroying your independent power, just as your county administrative supervisor is. They are trained for, uh, initially from the University of Chicago, but they have universities throughout the United States uh, that advocate global government. Uh, the two uh, congressmen or supervisors here today uh, came from the Santa Cruz City Council. They belong to the California League of Cities. The founder is James Pellin, uh, who advocated keeping California white. They belong to the Bohemian Grove, which sacrifices for 120 years uh, the children in effigy and in real life, according to a number of people. The uh, United States uh, Federal Council of Churches or National Council of Churches this is according to Time Magazine, says that uh, collectivism is coming or not. That's world government under communism and socialism. And it says the local stuff will be replated by, uh, it will be done uh, effectively by international authority. Uh, it would allow a world to be uh, politically uh, policed by an international army and navy, and it goes on with open borders, which of course we have right now. And I think each time you do a prayer, it should be for the 100,000 Americans that have died of COVID in the last three years because of so-called sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Cummings and board members. I'm Bruce Van Allen, and I'm here this morning as a advisory board member of the Tenant Sanctuary and as a member of the broader eviction defense coalition. Um, I'm speaking this uh, this morning because I'm on the Board of Education and we have graduations starting in a couple hours. I've got to be over there for the preparation, so I can't stay for the agenda item. But um, I just want to remind you, as I'm sure you know, that tenants in Santa Cruz County as around the state are very stressed right now by rising rents and um, the, the transfer of properties to new investors, which means higher rents and more evictions. And so the need for legal advice and representation for tenants is greater than ever. And at Tenant Sanctuary, we are doing what we can for it. We are grateful for the board's support for a, an attorney who can actually represent people in court as opposed to just legal education, um, which we were previously doing. And we urge you to continue this funding. In addition, the Eviction Defense Collaborative is a group of community members from all over the county working to, in general, strengthen the the rights of tenants. And they are here with a, a larger budget request that Tenant Sanctuaries is, is part of, and we support that request as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, hello. Mila Boyka and my supervisor, Manu Koning and um, Justin Cummings, who helped the Community Action Board to open the second location for services here in Santa Cruz. And uh, I thought it will finally maybe change, but um, I'm talking about the, the deep corruption that the immigration project uh, got involved with uh, some criminal syndicate that uh, within the this government and criminal syndicate i mean this is behavioral health division and the somehow the public guardian also office and uh, i'm talking about and i'm representing my daughter who is developmentally disabled with schizoaffective disorder and it is another problem that immigration project creates for 10 years already 10 years ago i came to them and i asked to help my daughter with the citizenship so and it lasts for 10 years they just continue to block her from citizenship not to help her to get citizenship but to block her because social security used that um, denial uh, that she is not a citizen so they cannot give her social security benefits and at the same time county uh, human services department didn't um, 
keep giving her food stamps or disability income, so keep her homeless and hungry. This is where homelessness comes from, you know, from those departments. So, and when I came to a new location, I was told that it's primarily for undocumented aliens, not for residents of the U.S. who was resident for 30 years. No, it's for undocumented aliens. And the director, Kate Hanninkamp, she also, I saw her recently at the library. She again confirmed that there is no way that they're going to help my daughter to get citizenship. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, I'm on my way to work at the Dakota Apartment Buildings, which I believe, Manu, is in your district. It's an apartment building for seniors, and you need to qualify by income, and you also must have a disability to live there. Um, I'm here to speak on the need for Meals on Wheels. We receive Meals on Wheels uh, twice a week um, because, I, I mean, the need seems obvious to me, but I'll spell it out. The income, they can't afford food. Uh, by the end of the month, um, limited mobility. They don't have, the people who receive don't have cars. So even though we have lists of pantries in the uh, county, uh, in, the, in our area, they can't get to the pantries. They do um, also have limited cognitive skills. So we actually prefer some of them not even to use the stove um, because it's dangerous. Um, and these meals come prepared and uh, easy to eat. Um, they have limited strength and endurance in order to um, make the meals. Um, they don't have unlimited personalities. They play the ukulele, they garden, they can't go anywhere because they don't have cars or money to travel or go out to dinner. Um, and if you will allow me to be a little snarky, and I apologize, um, when I was growing up, no one had to tell me to um, help people who are weaker than me. In fact, we had a, a Boy Scout promo cartoon that helped, um, that had a Boy Scout helping an old lady across the street. And um, this is kind of like, if I did a promo, if the any supervisor wanted to take away the um, Meals on Wheels funding or make it difficult, it would be like a supervisor knocking an old lady over at the crosswalk, which I assure you, people will go hungry. Um, they're coming to me now telling me they need help. So thank you for helping. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Barry Domer, and I supervise the Santa Cruz County CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program. And I've been a social worker with the county for 24 years. While I'm not here to represent the county, I am here to share my own significant concerns about the state's proposal to eliminate the CalWORKs FS program. In Santa Cruz County, family stabilization provides intensive crisis intervention to families experiencing severe mental health challenges, chronic homelessness with children, abuse and trauma, and destructive substance use. Our program has existed and served Santa Cruz County families for over 26 years, well before California implemented the statewide FS program. At that time, we were, we were funded locally by the single allocation fund. In the past 26 years, Santa Cruz County Family Hub Stabilization has served over 5,000 local families, an average of 250 families per year. If state funding is eliminated, it's my sincere hope that this program can remain in operation with local funding. It would be a tragic, it would be tragic to lose this critical program permanently when we know that state and local budget circumstances will improve in years to come. I sincerely believe that the loss of this program would put already struggling families in greater danger of heightened crisis and instability, prolonging their time on public assistance and deepening their level of poverty. I strongly encourage anyone with influence on the outcome of this matter to support local funding to maintain the family stabilization program in Santa Cruz County. Thank you so much for your yeah. consideration. Good morning. 
Our names are Uni Pomper and Victoria Reagan, and we are social workers with the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program. We are here to share our own thoughts and concerns about the proposal to eliminate the FS program and do not represent Santa Cruz County management or directors. Some members of our team came to speak to the board in March following the January release of Governor Newsom's proposed budget for next fiscal year. The January proposal included major funding cuts to CalWORKs, including the complete elimination of the FS program. Our team was hopeful that with a unified campaign in Sacramento, advocating on behalf of the families our program serves, and outlining all the reasons why our work is necessary and important, that our state legislators would remove our program's elimination from the May budget revised, but this was sadly not the case. Our team plans to continue our advocacy and lobbying efforts between now and June in hopes of convincing the governor's office that eliminating social services programs that assist our state and county's most vulnerable families, people who have experienced severe trauma, childhood, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, and neglect, those struggling with homelessness and untreated mental health issues, substance abuse, domestic abuse, kids who are bearing the brunt of their parents' struggles and instability, those living with mental and physical disabilities left to navigate monstrous bureaucracies on their own, that cutting funding for programs that serve these populations in our communities is unethical and wrong and should not be eliminated. Our program, Family Stabilization, has been locally funded by Santa Cruz County since 1998 and became part of the California budget in 2014 in recognition by the state that parents who are dealing with crisis and safety and stability issues, as previously mentioned, are not practically able to participate in seeking and maintaining employment. The work we do as FS social workers involves working closely with families in crisis to help increase stability and safety and support our families towards well-being and employment and educational opportunities. Good morning. We provide intensive case management with our families and the work we do includes getting families housed, providing mental health intervention, assessment and treatment, getting families into mental health and substance abuse treatment, helping survivors of domestic abuse establish safety for themselves and their children, and navigating the legal system and working to support our families in goal setting and learning independent life skills. We work collaboratively with community partner agencies to ensure our families are getting appropriate services and our work offsets the impact on other safety net services, such as emergency rooms, courts, and jails. The Family Stabilization Program is prevention focused. The program was created with the understanding and assumption that investing time and energy and help into people in crisis earlier rather than later not only minimizes the negative personal and societal impacts, but generates the potential for exponential positive outcomes and contributions to our community long-term. Our, our work in family stabilization is in the best interest of our state and the County of Santa Cruz. We are here to respectfully request that you consider the negative consequences on the families in our community and our community as a whole if our program is eliminated as proposed. We urge the Board of Supervisors to take action to protect this program locally and keep our services active should Governor Newsom not, reserve, not reverse his detrimental proposal to eliminate our program's funding at the state level. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lisa Gonzalez and I'm part of the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program. I'm here to share my own thoughts and concerns that do not represent Santa Cruz County management or directors. As my colleagues have stated, I feel strongly that cutting the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program would be an injustice to the families we serve. It would create more barriers to resources for the communities that need it the most. Finding access to therapy, resources, and case management for families living with everyday challenges, generational trauma, and traumatic events is not an easy to find. And even less so, if you're trying to find therapy and resources for our Spanish-speaking communities. As we all know, they are a huge part of our South County community who can benefit greatly from the CalWORKs FS program. I'm hoping, I'm asking, on behalf of the families, that we find a way to continue funding this important program, and on top of that, bring more data and community indicators to light. It is important to confirm whether or not there are inequities between these types of services in North and South County. And if so, that we are working proactively to address them. Thank you.
Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Fernwood, and I'm a uh, social worker with uh, the Human Services Department, and I am currently doing uh, child welfare investigations. And I want to say that the last four speakers were my gateway drug into social work, and they were my inspiration for becoming a social worker. Um, we do not have voluntary child welfare services in Santa Cruz County. That's something that exists in other counties, but not here in Santa Cruz County. And we rely in our um, uh, uh, front end child welfare division um, heavily on the services that they um, provide to be able to mitigate crises and get stabilized families so that their children don't end up in foster care, that their families don't end up in court ordered the juvenile dependency services, that they provide a, a, a crucial service to our community that we cannot afford to lose. And as they said previously, we had funded this program for about 16 years on our own before it became something that the state pitched in for. And so, you know, we, we were leaders on that before and we can be leaders on that again. Um, you know, it's, if we lose these services, it's gonna have a serious detrimental impact to the work that we do in our child welfare response because we won't have that to lean on. We lean heavily on that program. So thank you. Hello, members of the board. My name's Max. It's been a little bit since I've seen you. The last time I saw you, I was a social worker. I'm now a licensed clinical social worker working on the access team. Uh, when I was in my master's program, my college placed a very high priority on educating the next generation of social scientists, teaching us to read, parse, and understand research. Research like the University of California, Irvine published, looking at the annual cost of services for chronically homeless people. Counterintuitively, providing services for chronically unhoused people leads to more than a 50% reduction in the costs of those individuals. Emergency service use goes down, police use goes down, ER use goes down. As I said before, I'm on the access team. My nine to five job every day is to connect people with those supportive services. I connect people with psychiatry, medical doctors, therapy appointments. I connect them with housing resources. I connect them with drug and alcohol programs, the sorts of things that help them because at, when you actually look at the numbers, when you actually look at the research, it costs more money to be cruel to the chronically unhoused than it costs to take care of them. You just witnessed five people whose job it is, is to take care of the chronically unhoused. That is my job. I understand that you're in a budget crunch and I understand that it's scary. Help me help you fix this problem. Because fundamentally, not only are we providing these services and saving you all this money, we're billing Medi-Cal while we're doing it. We're revenue generators bringing in federal and state funds. You're, if the budget crisis is scary, fully fund, fully staff the positions who can fix it, saving you money on the streets and bringing in federal funds while we do it. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Diana Verastica. I am a benefits representative for the, at the 500 building on Westridge in Watsonville. I've been a benefits representative for 12 years now, and I help clients obtain medical benefits and food assistance. So as my previous coworkers have mentioned, we, our community has a high need of benefits. And right now, due to the staffing issues and the caseload, our clients are waiting um, at least an hour and a half on the phones to be able to get through and actually obtain their benefits when um, you know they need essential medical services or as the homeless need essential food you know so i am asking to please consider the fact that you know as we all mentioned we provide essential services to this community and just keep in mind that keeping us funded will help everyone in the long run thank you Or the next speaker, I'm just going to ask for folks to please hold your applause. You can do spirit hands or what have you, but we just want to make sure that we're not having back and forth yays and boos and we get to that point. So um, just appreciate everybody's perspective and, um, and, and thank you so much. Okay, next speaker. 
Good morning. My name is Nina Stratton. I'm an in-home support service worker and one of hundreds taking care of your grandparents, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your daughters, and your sons. We keep people in their homes and save the county money. All that we ask as we go into budget negotiations is that we are recognized as essential workers as we were throughout the pandemic and that we are afforded uh, a living wage and better benefits. Um, we ask that you remember us come negotiation time. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Danilyn Rutherford, and I'm also here on behalf of SEIU 2015 to call for a living wage and benefits during the contract negotiations. Um, I'm an IHSS worker, but I'm also a widow and the mother of a 23-year-old client. Uh, my daughter, Millie, is nonverbal, non-ambulatory, and has a seizure disorder. She's also absolutely delightful. Um, she requires round-the-clock care. Um, there are seven care workers who work with her. I'm incredibly grateful to them because they really make her life possible and my life possible. Um, but I also am aware that they are prone to be exploited. They're vulnerable to be exploited because people's vulnerability, some people's vulnerability makes other people vulnerable because those are the kind of people who are not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they can't walk away. They're doing it because they care about other people. And I think it's completely unconscionable that our society rests on the labor of people who are willing to expose themselves and care about vulnerable people. So I want to urge you uh, to keep this in mind when these contract negotiations come up. AI is going to replace a lot of our jobs. Robots will replace the rest of them. But caregiving is something that only living, breathing humans can do. And I really want to live in a county that takes that into account. Thank you. Good morning, members of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Can you, pull the mic, or can you pull the mic down to your mouth? And, yeah, thank you. My name is Haley Cristante. I am here to share my story and advocate for increased funding and support for the Eviction Defense Collaborative. Recently, I had the opportunity to work with the Tenant Sanctuary in Santa Cruz, which works in collaboration with the Eviction Defense Collaborative in Santa Cruz. I was initially introduced to Tenant Sanctuary via a flyer posted at the public library. Tenant Sanctuary offers monthly landlord-tenant informational and educational meetings at the public library. Later, I found Tenant Sanctuary online. I made use of their walk-in office services when I was issued a very unusual 30-day notice from my landlord. I have been a landlord and tenant and had never seen anything like this notice before. My experience with Tenant Sanctuary has been a blessing, and I am very grateful for their presence and unique service in our community. I am treated with respect by the entire staff without any age, gender, or financial discrimination. The attorney and his assistant are very attentive, professional, and skillful. The staff is resourceful and also very helpful. The attorney even responded to an email I sent on Saturday, on a Saturday, which was greatly appreciated when my landlord sent me an ultimatum on Friday evening with a deadline to respond by Sunday evening. The kind help and access to information at the tenant sanctuary has greatly reduced my stress in the situation. I am more informed about my options and the choices and potential outcomes of each of these choices. I am now more educated about what to look for in a landlord-tenant agreement and in a landlord. I am more knowledgeable about tenant rights in this county, how they are enforced, the likelihood and need for police involvement in my situation was also reduced. I believe as a result of working with Tenant Sanctuary um, and putting this information to use in the current situation, if we can wrap up here over your two minutes. Oh, can I finish? I'm sorry. We have a lot of people here who are waiting, but we very much appreciate your comments and we'll take that into account as we move forward. So thank you. And you can also email us uh, the full text of, of what you uh, were reading today as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director for SEIU. We represent over 2,000 of your workers. We're probably the largest bargaining unit that you have. And in the last 14 years I have been here, prior to that I was a social worker for the County of Santa Cruz here. Every single contract negotiations, you guys go out to the media and the public and say, there's no money. There's no money for negotiations. Every single two years, every three years, every four years, whatever we've negotiated. You hold 2,000 workers accountable every single day to do their work. They are expected to rise. And during the pandemic, what we realized is that who makes this country work every single day are workers. Workers, not management, not board of supervisors, not none of you. It's workers. Workers are the foundation of this country. The labor movement is the foundation of this country. People have died. Workers have died. And again, you come to us and you let us know there's no money. This is the year of accountability for both you, management, and everybody because you hold 2,000 workers accountable every single day. So we're coming and we're hoping that we negotiate it. We negotiate a fair and just contract for workers. Thank you. Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Gloria Palomo. Soy miembro de Holy Cross y líder de Copa. Estoy aquí para hablar de la problemática que estamos viviendo de vivienda y muchas personas que estamos pasando por la problemática de viviendas de muy alto precio y con unos sueldos que como yo soy trabajadora también de IHCS, 1875, creo que es imposible para poder pagar una renta ahorita que necesitamos como ocho mil dólares para poder obtener un, una vivienda. Yo hace un, año, hace un año murió mi esposo, lo cuidé por 20 años con el programa de IHC. Y ahorita me encuentro en un, viviendo en una sala y tengo mis cosas en un storage. Pero estoy aquí para ser la voz de muchas familias que están en K Street con viviendas de muy malos, malos situaciones de mojo, personas que se han enfermado de... Perdón. De neumonía, tienen asma, otros tienen artritis y están ahí. Vinimos a solicitar ayuda de abogados para ellos de bajos ingresos y, y sucede que no hay eh, ingresos para ellos y necesitamos urgentemente abogados que nos representen para este problema. Por favor, pónganse la mano en el corazón. Todos somos humanos y tenemos dignidad. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Can you translate that? Or? Sure, go for it. Uh, Laurie, can I have the paper? Sorry about that, Supervisor. Uh, my name is Gloria Palomo. I'm a COPA leader at Holy Cross, um, and I'm here today to express our support for money for attorneys um, to represent those with low income. Um, this issue comes out of hundreds of stories that we've heard from our member institutions and the reality that we all live in, knowing um, how expensive it is to live in this community. I am a IHSS worker myself. And I know that I can't afford to live in this community. Specifically, we're looking at members of K Street, um, but a, a place here in Santa Cruz, who have a terrible living situation, flooding, mold, um, you know, folks who live with arthritis. And the result of that is um, their landlords never fix anything <laughs> in their apartment. So they continue to live in apartments that are broken down, that are making them sick, that are damaging them and the lives of their children. We're here today to ask for money to fund attorneys and eviction defense so that those who are low income can represent themselves and don't have to live in fear of powerful landlords. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Carol Childers. I'm a 30-year employee of Meals on Wheels. Um, 
And I'm here to talk briefly about both sides. <clears throat> as I work for both the congregate side, our meal sites, but I'm also responsible for doing assessments and keeping track of our home delivery clients. <clears throat> At this point, uh, since January 1st through May, 5th, May 17th, we added 212 home delivered clients to our weekly deliveries. That includes a woman <clears throat> that uh, due to being on oxygen 24 hours a day, can't access her kitchen and her small mobile home because it's gas. So her family has moved her microwave out of the kitchen so she can eat our meals. Um, on the other side is the meal site program, which I'm very fond of. That's where I started. Um, and, you know, we serve everyone from the Watsonville area. Uh, we have a large site down there. We have London Nelson downtown. We have Ben Lomond at Highland Senior Center as well as uh, people can drive by at the Live Oak Center and pick up their meals. There are a few that stay and visit with their friends. Um, and I have a couple of plates I'm going to read to you and hopefully not cry. <laughs> uh, this one is from one of our volunteers who's, I believe she's almost 90 now at Ben Loman. Please support the Meals on Wheels program. I love lunch with all my friends. Without it, I would be isolated and alone. She's in her 90s and still serves lunch to her friends five days a week. Um, this one, I know Bruce knows her, uh, Penny, Penny Drew. Um, I look forward to my lunches with friends every day, along with the good food. I've been doing it for 30 years. Don't quit now. Penny Drew Leibovitz. Penny just turned 101. She met her late husband at our meal site. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Rios. I'm from London Nelson Meals on Wheels program. I have the best site. Um, I did, did bring some plates that I kind of wanted to read to you, and I just kind of picked them out and said these would be good. I come for socialization. Food is good. But eating with someone is the best. <laughs> eating together allows independence. I have only meals on wheels to rely rely on the source of food. Without them, I would starve. That's a true plate, really a true plate, because he would starve. And so uh, meals on wheels still need funding to help the people. That's all I want to say. Thanks, guys. Good morning, board. Uh, my name is Kendall. I've been with the county going on 16 years with Public Works Sanitation specifically for 12 to 13 years. Um, I just wanted to take a second to address uh, being open with the public and with the employees about budget. I was just reviewing the sanitation budget and public works budget. And I know that we have some big master plan projects coming up and I didn't really see anything specifically talking about the extensive um, projects that are happening and the multi-story buildings that are being um, planned and upgrades at Load Street, uh, which will greatly affect the neighbors as well as the employees that report there for work. Um, there just needs to be a lot more transparency. It, I think the improvement for county projects or county uh, properties, I think it said zero when I was looking at the spreadsheet just now. So that's a county property and that's a very huge project that we're told is happening. So I'm, I'm confused as to why it would say zero for that, um, especially going into negotiations and budget. Um, we really just want parking for our employees because we currently have 18 spots there for county employees. And we have, I think, 52 to 53 employees. Um, we're parking on the street, off the street, in front of neighbors' houses. Um, these are your constituents, specifically, I believe, Manu's constituents. Um, I know that it's an issue to expand, but maybe if we work with the neighbors, we can expand and not cause a problem. Um, but it, it doesn't seem like there's really any transparency in working with the employees and the neighbors to come up with a better solution than a two or three story building that has a view um, for offices. I'm a field worker, so I really don't need a break room that I'm not gonna have access to because I work in the field. So, which most of us do. 
Hey, what was the name of that building? Uh, Boat Street Sanitation Facility. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name's Leanne Martinez. I've spoken to a couple of the Board of Supervisors when we had the meetings for pay raises. Um, I just wanted to explain what our job is. We deal with Medi-Cal, food stamps, cash assistance for the homeless, and cash assistance for families. Um, I know people say, oh, Medi-Cal, no big deal. I have patients, clients come up in front of me and ask about their application that was turned in 30 days ago. Tell me, I have cancer. I need to see a doctor. I say, do you have an appointment? No, I don't have medical insurance. Okay, well, it's not an emergency unless you have a doctor's appointment today or tomorrow, or you need to go to the emergency room. I don't know when cancer didn't become an emergency. We cannot fund or fill our positions because we are underpaid by $9 compared to Santa Clara. We cannot retain employees. They leave as fast as we hire them. And the stress is ridiculous trying to keep up with the workload. We've had three people in my building go out on inpatient mental health. We've had one taken away in an ambulance who curled up in a ball so small she could have fit in one of those chairs. I don't want to get emotional, but to me, it is emotional. We are not helping the community. And by you guys cutting the budget and making more upper management positions, more assistant directors, more analysts, more directors, if there's money for those people, there is money for us. We need to be paid for our work. We are doing overtime to keep up. I don't want to spend my Saturdays doing overtime. I'd like to spend them with my family like I'm sure you guys all would too. Please consider that during the negotiations. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephen Hendrickson. I am a COPA leader at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church. We are here today to show our support for allocating $250,000 for eviction protection and legal defense. As a longtime Santa Cruz County resident, I am a renter. I am fortunate to have a stable and tenable relationship with my landlords. Many people do not have this. The reason to provide eviction protection and especially legal defense is to help keep families in housing and keep them off the streets and homelessness. Being proactive now will save money for the county and will improve the quality of cash scrapped, scrapped uh, renters. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings and members of the board. My name is Ken Thomas. I'm a COPA leader at Peace United Church in Santa Cruz. Um, COPA is an acronym for Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action. We're a member, uh, we, we are an organization of organizations made up of civic institutions such as uh, faith communities, uh, nonprofits, health clinics, schools, and labor associations. Um, the, the, the fundamental thing about COPE is, is that we organize around stories that we hear from our institutions, from members of our institutions. And then we uh, take those stories and um, uh, meet with other leaders and um, do actions in the community. Um, COPA is here today to uh, because of um, hundreds of stories we have heard in our institutions of people facing eviction, of sudden rent increases and, and families living in dismal conditions for fear of eviction. COPA is in support of $250,000 in eviction protection and defense. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Jim Weller. I'm also a COPA leader at Peace United Church of Christ. And I'm also here to urge you to uh, consider and act favorably uh, with the city of Santa Cruz in our request to provide funding for eviction protection in the public defender's office. Um, I remind you all that uh, COPA uh, was active in supporting the county's successful sales tax increase recently with the understanding that our working with you in that respect 
uh, would result in your working with us uh, for our agenda. And in this instance, our agenda is for funding to help support tenant eviction protections in the public defender's office in combination with the city of Santa Cruz. So I'll just say that another voice from COPA faith institutions for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other members of the public uh, who, is, who are here present in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item or to like to speak to us at this time? You're seeing none. Are there any members of the public online who'd like to speak to us during oral communications? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Yeah. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, please follow the direction of the numerous speakers advocating for the poor. We are told we cannot afford Social Security, Medicare, public colleges, bridges, roads, public transit, food stamps, public housing, student debt relief, child care, child tax credit, public schools. But we are told we can afford disastrous wars and proxy wars in Vietnam, Indonesia, Latin America, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Ukraine, Syria, and soon China. Boondoggle weapons programs such as the F-35 funding Israel's oppression of the Palestinians since this was written, now it's genocide of the Palestinians. And we can afford an empire of over 750 military bases. Funding for wars and weapons, about one trillion a year, I think higher since this was written, is the only thing Democrats and Republicans can agree upon. And I would like to add to this list, we can afford expensive and dangerous militarization of our county sheriff's department on last week's agenda and ubiquitous cancer causing cell towers, antenna, 5G everywhere. Look up on the roof. And, um, you know, I think we're suffering from capitalism. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of powerless, fear, apathy, boredom. Thank you so much. Tony, your microphone's now available. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, my name is Tony Nunez. I am the marketing and communications manager for Community Bridges. Uh, I live in Watsonville. I'm a resident of District uh, 4. Um, I just wanted to follow up on uh, the letter that we sent to the Board of Supervisors and I appreciate the opportunity here today to speak before you. Um, and the letter was concerning the uh, recent decision to uh, not set aside a portion of the core funding or general fund dollars on a recurring basis to support Meals on Wheels for Santa Cruz County. And also the changes that were made um, to the core funding process that limits uh, agencies with larger budgets to be ineligible in certain tiers. So you've received the letter, you understand um, now um, our concerns and not all of them uh, with, the, with the current core funding process and the changes that were recently made. Um, and in, in that letter, it included the reductions to uh, that the county board of supervisors has made to senior meals, um, uh, a decrease of 19% just in the last decade alone. What the current uh, core funding process uh, could mean for Meals on Wheels is um, a complete loss of 15% of the total contribution of meals for Meals on Wheels, and that equates to 41,000 annual meals potentially lost if uh, recurring and long-term um, commitment to Meals on Wheels is not funded. So uh, just thank you for your time. Um, thank you for um, listening to our concerns. And we have also uh, placed that letter up um, uh, 
uh, for folks who are not able to make it out to these meetings um, to sign on and support. And uh, we are now inching towards 300 uh, signatures that have signed on in support of Meals on Wheels and support of um, changes uh, to the core funding process um, that will um, help keep uh, vulnerable seniors in our community fed. Thank you. Tim, your microphone's now available. Hello, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I really appreciate that. Um, just to let you know, the public out there, I am a landlord and I do see things from uh, both sides, okay? I am highly supportive today of SEIU and these people that are speaking before you because these things also support, they, they affect me as well in dealing with my mother in a memory care unit, okay? And I, I'm also, just so you know, I am child labor, and I am the kid that comes from a violent household, okay? That's where I came from, so I know what it's like, all right? So, you know, when I look at this whole situation here, we cannot have a culture of indifference towards people that are disabled and that are in these situations, okay? So I look at things from the big picture here, when it comes to our I heard the other individual that was speaking just recently here. When it comes to the military, military, sorry, I don't agree with people on this. Military, healthcare, and our education combined. Those are three huge pillars of our economy and our entire society. We cannot have any of those go down. Okay. So I look at this whole situation here um, from the landlord perspective and everything. You know, and insurance, just so you know, if people pull the insurance rug out, out from underneath me and say one of my places burns down, then, yeah, then people are out on the street. So that's another angle as well. So other than that, though, I am highly supportive of these folks that are speaking to you today because this affects me personally. And I don't like to see elderly people and disabled people out on the street and hungry and starving. It is wholly unacceptable. So that's kind of how I'm looking at the whole situation. And I also want to remind you that our World War II generals were highly supportive of these kinds of programs. So we cannot let these people fall you know, through the cracks in our society. That would be awful. That's my comment for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Call in user 8245. Your microphone is now available. Call in user 8245. Your microphone is now available. As a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute yourself. Good morning. My name is Daniela Solis Salinas. I am the housing program manager for the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County, or the CRC. The CRC offers a variety of mediation services to the county, but I'm going to focus on our housing program. The CRC's housing program provides free mediation and informational services to tenants and landlords in the county. Our goal is to prevent homelessness by keeping people housed or creating a soft landing through extended vacate dates and security deposit returns. So tenants have the time and funds available to secure new housing. Our housing mediation program is able to exist and offer these services to the community in part because of the Eviction Defense Collaborative or the EDC, a collaboration with senior legal services, tenant sanctuary and community bridges. I'm advocating for funding for the EDC so we can sustain its impact throughout Santa Cruz County. The EDC has been a vital resource to the county since September of 2021, and we provide initial intake, peer advocacy, mediation, legal services, um, legal advice, and representation. For the past few years, the EDC has continued to grow as a, as a resource in the county. Specifically in 2023, the CRC alone resolved 142 housing cases through mediation with all agreements focusing on our goal to prevent homelessness. Here is a testimony of Whitney W., a tenant who was served with a 60-day notice to vacate. The CRC helped her be aware of her rights as a tenant, which allowed her to remain housed for three extra months. This program has been a mental lifesaver for me. It has provided me with ways of communicating with my landlord and resolving issues with my landlord. Plus, they offered support during this very stressful time to help me keep on top of it. Everyone was very kind, compassionate, empathetic, and very helpful. The Conflict Resolution Center is the only thing between me and homelessness. As you know, it, has been, it is financially better for, to help someone before they are homeless and after. It is financially better for the county. 
This success story underscores the impact of the EDC in preserving housing stability. I urge you to allocate the necessary resources to sustain and expand this initiative. Thank you for your consideration. Terry Lynn, your microphone is now available. As a reminder, it's star six to meet or unmute. Am I, am I muted? We can, can hear you. Hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Good morning. Good morning, esteemed members of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. My name is Terry Lynn Decker, and I'm here to navigate for the victim's defense collaboration. There is a need for them to have their funding increased, and I'm here to share a story about how they helped me in my hours of complete confusion and frustration because I have no idea how to navigate the eviction system. Sylvia was there for me and she made me feel more comfortable. And I was given um, information on the senior center as I am a senior and a disabled woman that was evicted from my residence for no reason. I had to do represent myself in a court situation where I had no representation and I had no idea how to present my case, although I have a very good case. I've, I lost, I did not prevail in this situation and, and now I have an eviction on my record and the sheriffs are going to come and put a notice on my door. I live in Watsonville. I've been in Santa Cruz County for 40 years. I've been in Watsonville and living here for nine. They want to raise the rent, and that's the reason that they've chosen to evict me. Um, I would, I would, I would like you to prioritize funding for the eviction defense collaborative, and by investing in this program, you're you're resting in the well-being and stability of our community. And there aren't many like Sylvia in this community that I've met. And I can tell you the way she made me feel when I walked in the office was comfort, was no other comfort I felt in a long time. And I felt like I belonged and was not alone. Thank you for listening. And thank you for your commitment to the housing needs of our community and the support of our program. Thank you. Call and user ending in 2915. Your microphone's now available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I would like to speak to um, consent agenda item 19, and actually I think this should not be on the consent agenda, the General Services Department budget. It illuminates the fact that capital projects will now be handled by the General Services Department and not the Department of Community um, development, formerly public works and planning. I have real concerns about this and I'd like, I'd like explanation how this will improve the, the flow of work and payment in capital improvement projects. This will require a, a shift of 10 full-time employees from H, from uh, community development to general services. Is this possible? Is this is this realistic? It will also add another full-time employee to general services for this purpose. I see that on the slide, the budget presentation, zero money for general services will now be taken from the general fund, where in the past it was almost four and a half million dollars. Who's paying for this now? Well, I can tell you that in the case of County Fire Department, which is administered by General Services Department, County Fire will now look at um, from $10,000 in the past to $322,000 for GSD administration. Please, um, please discuss this publicly because I do not think this is in the best service of the public. I also want to speak to number 23 on the consent agenda, the debt service. I see that um, eight and a half million dollars will be taken out of the general fund solely to pay the debt service on the 95 million dollars that the county is borrowing just to stay afloat. Something has to give here. 
You, you yeah. cannot. Thank you so much. Reggie, your microphone's now available. Hi, can you hear me? Not yes. really. Can you speak up a little louder? Can you hear me now? That's better. All right, great. <clears throat> Uh, today, our current understanding of behavioral science says that the best way to raise pets and children is positive parenting, a method of pro-social behavioral guidance that completely eliminates punishment. Um, and yet, despite the fact that we have this almost sort of universally accepted understanding of how we treat uh, children and our pets, this seems to have not yet expanded to how we treat adults. We continue to spend over $100 million a year doing the exact opposite. We decrease or leave stagnant our investments in housing and health care and other pro-social uh, behavioral guidance uh, systems of support. And then we increase fundings in um, police, prisons, surveillance, uh, and other sort of methods of just incarceration and torture, really. Um, so I think we need to ask ourselves real questions uh, about not just our budget changes, but our base level assumptions about what we're doing. Um, by the system's own metrics of success, it does not work. We have a 60% recidivism rate. Can you imagine the sheriff's office trying to promise zero murders or zero rapes in the coming year? It would seem ridiculous. And yet we spend a hundred million dollars torturing people under the false assumption that this is actually the best way to deal with this issue. Let us try to imagine better than what this terrible system is. Let us listen to all of these speakers and invest in eviction protection, public housing, voluntary health care services, not more health care services that reimagine the same kind of torture and false deterrence of the existing system. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela, your microphone's now available. Good morning. My name is Pamela Nell, and I am with Community Bridges as a program manager of two of our four family resource centers. And I wanted to speak about the Eviction Defense Collaborative and the minimal, many, meaningful impact the collaborative has made since its inception. The collaborative came together in 2021 and includes Tenant Sanctuary, Senior Legal Services, Conflict Resolution Center, and Community Bridges as partners. Through the collaborative, 300 families across Santa Cruz County have received eviction prevention support, from eviction prevention counseling to legal assistance and representation to mediation. The collaborative has provided tenant rights education and supports for individuals and families to make informed decisions, and in many cases remained housed. The value of this collaborative and the work accomplished thus far is helping our community thrive, and I hope that the Board of Supervisors also sees this um, and continues to provide support in order for this essential work to continue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Zab, your microphone is now available. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors, members of the public. Um, my name is Bob Hirschfield. Um, I'm an advisory board member for the organization Tenant Sanctuary, uh, which is a member of the Local Eviction Defense Collaborative. Uh, Tenant Sanctuary uh, has served over 240 uh, residents of the county in this just this year, excuse me, just this year. And the staff attorney at Tenant Sanctuary has worked with over 90 uh, households uh, and supporting them with a variety of issues, including preventing eviction, dealing with severe habitability problems, and issues of landlord harassment. Um, Tenant Sanctuary, in its role as a member of the Eviction Defense Collaborative, provides information to tenants about their rights uh, in their rental, rental home uh, so that they can ensure that their uh, needs for safe and stable housing are respected and that the law is the law of the pelt. 
Um, I am calling to ask you to continue to support Tenant Sanctuary. We're very grateful for the county's support, um, as well as to, to expand support for the Eviction Defense Collaborative. Um, just because the something that I learned in my years of working at Tenant Sanctuary before I became a, a board member was that the existence of a law uh, protecting tenants uh, has has very little to do with uh, the actual enforcement of that law or it being followed. It's, ex it's in in incredibly important that tenants have access to an attorney uh, in in enforcing their rights under the law because without an attorney, as uh, one member of the public spoke, who spoke said before me, uh, people are often completely out of their depth, um, which is, you know, no judgment on them, but the law is not set up for normal, for everyday people to handle. So please continue to support tenant legal services and prevent homelessness and evictions in this county. Thank you. Neilpa Collective, your microphone is now available. Yeah, good morning, Chair and Board of Supervisors. My name is Bernie Gomez. Uh, I am with Mirpa. Um, I want to share something that I learned from the governor's May revision. Um, he, uh, his crew, right, has saved $80 million, right, for the state in deactivating empty prison cells, right? Um, and I, I want to, I say that because looking at our local incarceration system, right, um, there is approximately 150, 170 empty beds, right, at in the county jail, uh, whether it's in Roundtree or the main jail. Um, so what does it look like if this county um, tries to save a little bit of money, right, tries to reinvest that money into what you're listening to today, people advocating for? Um, they're empty cells, right? Meaning they're being unused. You know, I suggest, request, would love to see a, a deactivation, a decommissioning of these empty units, empty cells, right? Maybe not all of them. I would say all of them, but if people get too nervous around it, let's say a hundred of them and see how that goes. See how much money is, is being saved, right? Um, and how, with that money, how we can support uh, the continued uh, deficit that we're facing, right? But also thinking about uh, the juvenile hall, right? There's currently around six, between six and eight youth, and that facility houses 40. Well, it's set to house 42 or 40. So there's many empty incarcerated cells, and it's time to do something different and restructure the way uh, we deal with certain problems. Thank you. Raymond, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm heading on my way there. Appreciate your time. Uh, my name is uh, Raymond Cancia, CEO of Canadian Bridges. Um, just wanted to make a public comment that uh, understanding the deficit and understanding the needs that are uh, coming before us, um, we still need to continue to invest in the basic services to provide uh, the most meaningful impact in our community. So I'm here um, continuing to advocate for the 405 committed ongoing dollars that have been helping support um, uh, seniors in our community and meals in our community and ensuring that seniors in our community are taken um, care of. Um, there's other opportunities uh, for the county to save additional dollars as well as transition uh, post May revise. Obviously, we have the in-home support service uh, reductions and removals of individuals that are undocumented that is going to be hitting our community. Uh, we welcome um, HSD department and for you to direct the HSD department to refer those clients to Elder Day. Um, a large portion of them would be eligible for our services and help minimize the local impact of this loss of service for these uh unfortunate seniors in our community. In addition to that, uh, we continue to open the opportunity and one of our requests that had been made to Board of Supervisors had been to support the Family Resource Centers, which helps support many of the eligibility benefits uh, components as well as uh, enhanced care management, which can support some of the uh, family support program um, clients that would be affected by the proposed reduction. 
So I think it's an opportunity for us to invest uh, in our community as well as an open invitation for the county supervisors as well as the department heads uh, to partner with large organizations that are moving in that direction and uh, able to meet the need. Thank you for your time uh, and consideration. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. And thank you to all the people who came and spoke to us today um, during oral communications. Okay, so um, I just had a couple questions real quick in response to what we uh, just heard from members of the public. My understanding is that historically the Meals on Wheels funding, CalWORKs, that kind of falls under uh, Health and Human Services. Is that typically the case? Maybe it's, I see the director of HSD here before us today. Because the reason why I bring it up is I feel like some of these questions can be answered during that presentation rather than us kind of, you know, steering in a direction where we spend a lot of time answering the questions that came up that if we can identify during which presentations these questions will arise and be appropriate, we can just have them answered at that time. Uh, good morning, Chair Cummings. Yes, Human Service Director Andy Morris. I'll be up in front of you, the third item. And uh, your two specific program questions, Meals on Wheels and CalWORKs, I'll take them separately. Meals on Wheels is funded by the federal government, the state government, and it goes through our local nonprofit seniors council. This board in the last core procurement cycle, which HSD manages, augmented that. And what I think is very important for your board to be aware and those who made public comment is we are currently in a three-year procurement cycle and next fiscal year, the county funding to augment Meals on Wheels is untouched. The comments that were made are about the core cycle in two years. So that's the Meals on Wheels. Cal works, yes, that's proposed state cuts to our budget for next year. Okay, and I was just, the reason why I ask is because rather than getting into a dialogue right now, if we can talk about it during the presentation. Then. Yes, so okay. anything under the Cal works cuts or anything to do with core, we can speak to during the HSD presentation. And then the legal defense, because I know that um, Housing for Health Policy Board has been supportive of that. Is that something we can speak to at that time as well? We can speak to what's in the HSD budget that relates to Housing for Health funding okay. during our presentation. Great, yes. thank you. Okay. All right, so we'll hold off on questions and comments related to those items until HSD's presentation. And with that, um, we will move on to the budget manager overview of the budget today. And just to give folks uh, kind of a sense of what's gonna happen, we'll have the budget manager's overview. And before that, some uh, some comments from board members. We will then take action on our consent agenda, and then we will be fo we'll follow the consent agenda with our regularly scheduled agenda, which today is the Departments of Health and Human Services and um, and public safety and justice. So with that, um, I'll see if there's any board members who'd like to make any opening remarks regarding the budget here today. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we're gonna hear uh, more about this, of course, uh, but thank you for letting me give my perspective on uh, this final budget that I will approve uh, as nearly 12 years as a member of the County Board of Supervisors. And it's clearly the most challenging budget I've seen in my 12 years uh, on this board. Um, in addition to the unfunded state mandates that have been mentioned previously uh, in other meetings, uh, there's $144 million of outstanding natural disaster reimbursement from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and $85 million in new unfunded repairs from the CZU fire in the 2023 storms. Uh, the county is financing up to $95 million in new debt, and we have yet to fully understand the ramifications of the dire budget situation at the state level. In many respects, it's it's a perfect storm, or a, the worst storm you can almost imagine. Um, until the state settles its final budget, and we have a full understanding of those impact on our budget, which are, are severe, uh, I caution against veering off the prudent course that is proposed here this week. Um, if, and wait for our final adoption on June 4th. The state, by law, if, uh, they don't pass it by June 15th. The legislators don't get paid. They usually get it done by June 15th. Um, but I do see many positive things as I look at this budget. As always, I'm impressed by the way uh, our, the array of services our county provides to these uh, on these challenges that we're facing. And that's because of our people and our dedicated employees that we have here in Santa Cruz County. When I look 
at the complete complexity of the services offered from healthcare to human services, parks, planning, public works, financial, technological, technological and, and elections and public safety. It's really incredible. So I, I want to thank in the opening of us facing these most challenging times that I've experienced. I want to thank our county leadership, especially CEO Carlos Palacios and his team, including our county budget manager, Mark Spimitel, and all of the analysts that have put this budget together, department heads and those who had a role in shaping this budget. Uh, it's a challenge like we've never experienced, and uh, we'll get through it one way or the other. And I just want to thank you for that, uh, having it, allowing me to give my perspective. Any other supervisors? Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, you know, I just want to say ditto to Supervisor McPherson's comments in terms of where we're at. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that in our presentations, uh, we do have kind of elaborate on the uh, so the multiple speakers that we had from the eviction defense collaborative partners and who the partners are uh, and with tenant sanctuary as well. And also that I hope that this budget also reflects the upcoming labor negotiations that we have and the need to retain employees and not lose them. All right, seeing no further comments, I will go ahead and turn it over to Marcus Pimentel to kick us off with our presentation on the budget. Uh, yes, Chair Cummings and uh, members of the board, I wanted to open up with a, a brief statement. Um, I wanted to convey some very important information um, that has recently arisen uh, both to the board and to the public, uh, and it's concerning uh, our Measure K uh, sales tax. Um, as you know, Measure K was approved on the March ballot um, by the voters of this county. That's a half cent sales tax and um, was approved not only in the unincorporated area, but in every jurisdiction in the county. As, as you know, we are in, in the county, we serve everyone in our community. Uh, every resident, um, including those who live in cities, um, receive county services. And so Measure K has very, very important ramifications, not only for the unincorporated area, but for the, the cities as well. Uh, recently, an individual has indicated that he intends to pursue an existing lawsuit over Measure K. Um, this individual uh, prefers, preferred that only voters in the unincorporated areas vote on it, despite Measure K benefits going to the whole county, and despite having lost a preliminary injunction prior to the election, and despite voters in the unincorporated areas supporting the measure. Measure K, as I had reiterated, passed in every jurisdiction. Nevertheless, this individual has indicated <clears throat> that he intends to pursue this lawsuit over Measure K <clears throat> and who is allowed to vote on it. <clears throat> the ramifications for the county and the community are severe. Unfortunately, state law says that Whenever there's a local jurisdiction that has a lawsuit against a uh, local tax measure, that any revenues from that measure must be embargoed. Um, they must be uh, collected by the county, but they will not be allowed to be spent until any pending lawsuits are resolved. Uh, we don't know how long this could be. It could be six months or it could be uh, multiple years. So while we don't have a lot of clarity on this issue still, but we and we know that it is frustrating for the board and for residents who favored and who voted in favor of the programs and services we are intended to offer through Measure K. Unfortunately, we cannot at this time spend any measure, Measure K funding on behalf of the community. Uh, our intent is to come to the board on June 4th, which is last day uh, when the budget will be approved. Um, to allocate um, what we would have spent the money on in the event this lawsuit uh, is not pursued. <clears throat> so the board's will will be dealt with, but unfortunately we won't be allowed to be to spend any of those funds. They, As I said, they will be embargoed. Uh, we hope to resolve this lawsuit as quickly as possible to carry out the will of the voters. Um, what will the impact of this lawsuit be? Well, we, the board had voted when the ballot measure was placed on the March ballot 
to allocate uh, funding in four specific areas, homeless services, housing, road and infrastructure projects, and parks, uh, as well as uh, potential wildfire prevention. Those were the four areas that the board had indicated as priorities and it uh, indicated that the $1 million from Measure K would be allocated to each of these areas. So $1 million would have been allocated to homeless services. Uh, from staff's perspective, there's a great need to fund our year round shelter program. Uh, as you know, that we are also establishing three low barrier navigation centers, uh, but there's no uh, ongoing funding for any of those uh, services. So this would help. It wouldn't fund it completely, but would certainly help. Second, on affordable housing, we had uh, the board had indicated uh, intent to spend a million dollars on affordable housing, uh, especially um, prioritizing workforce housing uh, on the Freedom Campus, um, where Measure K could help explore the feasibility of housing for our own employees, as well as other uh, public employees from the cities and school districts. <clears throat> they also, uh, we are also pursuing an affordable housing project at 7th and Brommer. And this uh, is another area that we are considering having some of these funds help in that pre-development phase. Uh, the board had also indicated a million dollars in road and infrastructure projects. Um, these were for road impairs, potholes, as well as potentially emergency road repairs. The county still has more than 140 repair projects from storms going back to 2017 that have no local funding. Let me repeat that. There's over 140 repair projects from storms going back to 2017 that have no local funding. And then we had the board had set aside a million dollars for parks. Some of the potential projects that were going to come from that allocation were new soccer fields at the Polo Grounds and Pinto Lake Park, new baseball fields at Polo Grounds and Aptos Junior High, new playground at Seascape County Park, Hidden Beach Park permanent bathrooms, community gathering space in downtown Boulder Key Creek, new fields at Anna Jane Cummings Park, Moran Lake County Park improvements, additional bike, bike bed investments along East Cliff Drive, possible contributions to Treasure Cove, investments related to the North Coast Management Plan, including efforts to improve public safety and public access at North Coast beaches, improvements and opening of South County Park property, um, the new South County Park property, um, which would prevent the remediation of longstanding inequities over access to open space. Uh, we also um, could use some of these funds uh, for climate change resilience um, so that is another area that would be um, would be lost <clears throat> as you know this is a very difficult budget year uh, the state um, has a multi-billion dollar deficit to somewhere between 46 to 56 billion dollars according to either the department of finance or the, the uh, legislative analyst office that is going to have ramifications on our budget in addition to ba balance this year's budget I made two decisions. One is that I reduced the contingency fund from a minimum of seven and a half million to uh, 1.25 million. Uh, 7.5 million is 1% of the general fund. It's a minimum amount considered by best practices as a contingency for budgets. That's our normal amount that we carried forward. Um, I reduced that from 7.5 million to 1.25 million also made the decision not to fund any capital from our general fund. Last year, we had $5 million of general fund capital expenditures. This year, that amount is zero. Uh, I've made some very difficult decisions because otherwise, the only other option would have been to make budget cuts, which would very likely would have resulted in layoffs. So I've already made some very hard decisions that I presented for you, um, and that's part of this budget. I know there are some CAOs that would have funded the contingency at 7.5 million, that would have funded capital at 5 million, and that would have brought to you a layoffs. I chose not to do that. So I'm presenting to you a very minimal budget, a difficult budget, because it is a difficult year. Uh, Measure K was gonna help us balance that budget as well. And now that it is um, basically subject to this potential lawsuit, um, that is also provides another layer of uncertainty.
So with that, uh, I'll close my comments and I'll present, present it over to uh, Budget Manager Pimentel for an overview of the budget and then an introduction of today's budget items that are before you. Um, Mr. Palacios, it would, uh, Metro K would raise about, what, $10 million for the county per year? Yeah, it would uh, ra raise $10 million uh, annually um, for the county and general fund money. Uh, next fiscal year, it would be $7.5 million. And that is because uh, we we'll only get about three quarters of a year of collections. Uh, just for the point of clarity, um, so this budget doesn't reflect any Measure K funds, correct? Uh, that is uh, correct. At this point, we were going. To, our plan was to come on June fourth, where we were going to allocate Measure K funds. That was our plan. But now, you know, with this lawsuit, there's a lot of uncertainty about how we're going to proceed with that. So there's no Measure K funds in the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Um, it really sets the stage that the board and the community is facing budget decisions with both hands tied behind our back. You've got significant cuts coming from the state, which will drastically impact our decision-making capability. And the assumption that that would be uh, blunted by the significant support of local voters for a local tax measure that now is imperiled by this litigation. So I think that we're, I mean, as we talked about the other day, I think that we're going to have some pretty significant challenges, not just in this budget cycle, but moving forward. And um, assuming even that we ultimately prevail uh, in the litigation, the reality is, is that the need is now and the costs go up. And so the, the efficacy of the measure goes down. This is uh, it's disappointing and sobering news. I appreciate that you brought it forward, but it doesn't make the decisions any easier, especially when there's continued asks from the community for new investments uh, that came through today. I think that that makes that, that we should, we're going to have to contemplate how that's going to be possible, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Supervisor, so, any comments? Okay. okay. I just had one question for clarity, um, and I'm sure many members of the public are probably wondering the same thing is, is this currently a threat of litigation or have they actually filed the, um, the case? It's currently, I would qualify it as a threat of litigation. The, the, the case um, against the implementation of Measure K has not actually been filed. Okay. I just wanted that to be clear for folks because we're kind of in this limbo position, you know, with the uncertainty around the state budget, the uncertainty around whether or not this case will get filed, we are definitely in a pretty challenging position. And so as we get through the budget hearings, I think we're going to you know, try to figure out how we can get a little bit more certainty um, because it does sound like there's interest in you know, funding certain programs. We have some potential new funds that are kind of sitting out there if we can get access to them and this lawsuit isn't filed and then we have no idea what's happening at the state. And so um, it's just trying to do the best we can under some very uncertain times. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can try to do our best to make it through this session with some clarity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marcus Pimentel to kick us off in the presentation. Good morning, Chair Cummings, board members, um, members of the public. My name is Marcus Pimentel. I'm your county budget manager. Uh, this has been a challenging budget cycle. Uh, we, we thought the disasters were a challenge and now with, me, with the Latest news: We're we're just we're being challenged in a lot of fronts. Um, you know, another example of what we couldn't help and do and present in this budget is and you'll hear from HSA they they've experienced um, in the state reforms with Cal Aim effect, effectively we're finding changes at the state level are rolling down to us as new funded mandates or unfunded mandates or increased services or reduced revenue. And that's an example of Cal Aim that while it strives to aim uh, improve our community uh, on the whole. To our particular county, it's taken about a $10 million impact to, the, to their budget. You're going to see their positions reduced by 39.5. They've, they've eliminated 39.5 positions in their budget. 28 of those were COVID-funded programs so that we knew we were going to lend. But still, we were unable to try to support about 11 and a half net reductions. Um, we couldn't help. We couldn't find funding to keep those positions in place. Um, so that's just, we're just been really challenged. It's been a particularly hard cycle. Um, with that, uh, I 
I'm opening up our, our budget hearings. This presentation opens up our budget hearings today. This is our second budget hearing. We're continuing the hearings from our April 9th uh, first budget hearing where we presented the proposed budget. Um, this today's presentation folds in some supplemental increases. And we every year the county has what's called a supplemental budget. There's a PDF online that summarizes all the changes in the supplemental budget. And what it typically represents is uh, changes in the state in state funding or grant funding that were not known in January when the departments finalized their budget uh, submittals. Um, so you'll see some new funding that came through in grant funding, some uh, federal Medi-Cal funding that came through about 12, uh, uh, 19 million in total. So there's some changes in the supplemental budget, but they're more functional uh, grant tied funding than they are. There's no discretionary for adding this or decreasing this, but you'll, you'll see those supplemental changes folded into today's presentation and also reflected in the online budget. They've been updated to reflect the new proposed uh, budget for 24, 25. So where we're at in the budget cycle, um, we, you know, we kicked off the budget in uh, November with uh, final instructions to departments. Uh, we had the mid-year uh, presentation on the budget, the status of the current year, uh, and, and what we projected for the initial outlook in, into next year's budget in February 13th. Uh, departments submitted all their budgets uh, at the end of January and, and first couple weeks of February. Uh, we then presented to the board uh, the published budget that was published on April 2nd. It was presented to the board on April 9th. And today we're, we're starting a two-day budget hearings, uh, 9 a.m. today, and then we'll continue into tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., uh, bringing this through uh, consideration of the proposed budget on June 4th. There will be some other actions in the proposed budget on June 4th, including the unified fee schedule. Um, and then we'll bring back the final budget, adopted budget, based on board direction on September 24th. That's the final version of the budget that is helped and prepared by our partners in the Auditor Controller Treasurer Tax Collector's Office to conform with the state budget requirements and, and, and publication. Now, we, we discussed a lot of our achievements in more detail on the April 9th uh, presentation of this board. This is just kind of a summary of a lot of those items, and it's important just to reflect that despite our challenges, we are still making incredible successful achievements across our county. Uh, of course, the headline is the opening of the new South County Government Center uh, that will do a lot of things, including reduce com commute patterns, reduce our impact on the environment, more importantly, providing services to a portion of the community that had to drive, you know, an hour in traffic sometimes to try to get uh, county services. So that's a huge win for our community. And it saves us money over the long term. We're consolidated leases that we were paying 30 part leases that are, you know, those rent increases are out of our control. Um, and now we own the property and the debt service. Um, the least savings is, is is funding that those debt service. We're going to be working on the development uh, and opening of the new child's crisis residential unit. And in the interim, doing a partnership with the Watson Community Hospital to provide immediate crisis support for the youth in our community. These are just some of the many examples that uh, we reviewed deeply on, on April 9th and that we're really proud of. And um, just for the sake of time, I'll kind of go through this. You'll hear, you'll hear these cycled out through all the department presentations today and tomorrow. In our imminent challenges, um, the California deficit, the governor's projecting that uh, the budget problem he was trying to solve for was $45 billion. There's different estimates on that, depending on which is the Department of Finance or the Legislative Analyst Office. But somewhere in the $50 million billion range is the size of the deficit. I think the LA AO pegged at a $73 billion challenge in, in, in November, and I think that's more credible. But, uh, you know, the governor believes his, his deficit is closer to $45 billion. They've solved some of that, or they claim to solve some of that in already in this year's legislative actions, leaving $27 billion that are proposed reductions that came out with the May revise uh, uh, that were uh, published last Tuesday of the details. Uh, we're still understanding the details, associations, uh, supporting the health services, human services, public defender, sheriffs, uh, public works. They're all going through the details of the budget and trying to really understand what the impact is across the state. And then more importantly, what it is for us. So we're still working very aggressively on that. Um, I'd say it, some of it feels like a glancing blow, but when you're when you're hearing the updates from the departments, there are some there are some real threats uh, to some of our programs and services. Again, each department has been asked to to highlight that as best they could with one week of information uh, what what they believe the the risks are in the state's budget. As you heard on May 14th last just last Tuesday, we presented to this board a financing plan to solve for the uh, the, the the federal 
disaster, natural disaster funding system that just is, doesn't work for us. You know, it, it, it requires us to put money up front to help recover our community, especially when it's large infrastructure projects, road projects, um, to the tune of we've had to get authority to borrow up to $105 million. Uh, the annual cost or the long-term cost of that debt could be $33 million in new costs to the taxpayers just because our, our federal partners are unable to, to reimburse quicker. Um, so the delay is waiting five, seven, sometimes nine years, depending on the, the, the amount of scrutiny, um, will slow us up. And it's unfortunate that while we're having operational challenges, um, we're also having to deal with recovering from many, many natural disasters, uh, seven major events since 2017, and then a lot of sub-events um, that have just been challenging. Again, we, we think the total cost is that exposed to our taxpayers about $32 million. The county will have to absorb over the life of the debt. Um, we hope that with our advocacy, the successful advocacy, this board has helped us lead, and and we've seen great progress in that advocacy in the last year. It's not going to end up with federal reforms, and we don't see that being the end result, but we just hope that we can get prioritized and move up the list and get funded faster. Um, that $32 million cost could drop to 20, 20 to $22 million with some quicker re, uh, reimbursements, but there is still going to be cost of, of debt of financing and recovering from our disaster. And as uh, CEO Palacios mentioned, um, the funding we, we authorized does not bring us to full recovery. There's still over 140 projects that, that we don't have a financing plan for um, since the project damage since 2017. Um, we, we've talked about and we'll be diving deeper into and doing more work over the next six months on the unfunded mandates and how this county can partner with other counties to getting and holding the state accountable for when they when they pass legislation that requires us to do more services, increases our cost. They're mandated to provide funding for that. And we want to be a better partner and better collaborator with counties across the state and how we can do uh, test claims so we can expand and, and validate all these unfunded uh, services that we're seeing um, that are impacting us. You know, our, our storyline last year was <laughs> ironically pretty, we're, you know, we were on the coming out of the storm. We didn't know the full magnitude of, of the disaster. If you remember mid-year last year, February, we had one storm event and then the next big one hit in March. Um, back then we were concerned just with our normal aging infrastructure and we still don't have a, a pathway to how we deal with our normal uh, roadways, our normal um, um, pipes, and our normal facilities, our normal parks. We're still working on those strategies. And as CEO, CAO Palacio has mentioned, we've had to balance the budget on the on reductions in general fund support, uh, reducing our contingency um, from a, a best practice 1% number, 7.5 million down to 1.2 million. That's 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 a risk for us. And that number will probably drop a little bit more with last day actions. Um, that will really reduce our ability to to respond and, and react to um, any any new crisis. And, it, to, you know, uh, I think we, we've all been around long enough or, or understand the impacts of the great, uh, great recession in the 2000s and one of the things that it did is it forced government agencies to focus on maintaining services and and held back on investing in capital which has created these huge backlogs for us over 300 million of deferred maintenance we're now adding to that this year by not funding any general fund capital projects that's going to add to um more costs in the out years we know that but we're, we're really trying to keep our services and focus on on services uh supporting our current services so no general fund projects that would have been five million um, a reduction of our general fund contingency, 6.4 million. Those are some big cuts just to keep us in balance. And as we, we know, we've been talking about over the last several years, our systematic underfunding that, that the underpinnings are, we're, we're an atypical county that we're the biggest city in the county and also a provider of county services. Over half of our population lives in the, in the unincorporated county. Uh, the, the norm is about 20%. The extreme is Santa Clara at 4%. Um, but we half of our county is gets struck municipal like services from the county in addition to countywide services. So we, we have a we have a, a dual challenge in that it's shown up in these in these charts every time we show them. We're on the wrong side of this quadrant. We're in the bottom right of the lowest funded level um, per capita, about four hundred sixty dollars per capita in property tax. Uh, but yet we serve we have to spread that out and serve a greater portion of our population. And I appreciate all the boards help and work on this. And there's a lot of creative thought about how we might change some of these allocation formulas in the future. Um, just as an example, if we just looked at property tax uh, with redevelopment allocation, we're about a 13.4% um, 
13 cents on the dollar uh, of your property tax paid comes to the county. People often think every dollar paid in property tax comes to the county, but it's a very small share. And if we, if other counties, the average in the county across California counties is 19 cents. For us, that's 36 million more. We would have every year if we were just funded or allocated, not funded, if the same property taxes were allocated uh, as the average for all California counties. We're way, way, way below average in that allocation. That would be 36 million more every year in general fund that we'd be able to, to invest. Um, our, our partners, and we appreciate them in, in Monterey County, if we had their allocation formula, it'd be $80 million. So, I mean, it's just, it's we're really systematically underfunded in this allocation. Um, I have to mention, you know, my pet peeve, and that is, that's property tax, sales tax with the convenience of online reforms. It still has a, a big loophole in that we're losing $5 million a year in sales tax allocation for when our residents who are living in the unincorporated county are buying online because it's convenient. Um, often those sales tax that they pay does not come to this county. It goes to others, to other agencies across the state. And that's, that's at least $5 million a year in general fund that no longer comes to this county. What we have pro proposed for you all to summarize the overall budget, um, then I'll provide a preview of the departments you'll see today, and then we'll, I'll, I'll gladly step aside and let the departments uh, take the show. Um, what we presented to you today is a revised, proposed, and supplemental county budget of $1.15 million. We had some supplemental changes that reduced the size of our total county budget by $43 million. Some of that is, is reflecting the changes with debt service. Some of that is uh, reflecting some lower costs in, 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 in some of our CSAs and, and public works. Um, but, but we are still a lower, smaller budget than we were last year across the county. Last year's total adopted budget, almost $1.3 million. This year, $1.15 million, where it currently stands. Uh, breaking down our budget by functional categories, general government, health and human services and such, um, you'll see that uh, we, we did propose some positions, and I'll talk about those position changes uh, in the supplemental. 7.8 positions are included in the supplemental budget. Uh, most of them are either Almost all of them are CARE Act related, and there'll be a separate, there's a separate report in, in the consent agenda about the CARE Act. Um, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit, and you'll hear those updates during the departmental presentations. Across the entire county right now, our current FTE count would be reduced from last year's by 25.3, and we were reducing positions across the entire county by 25.3 positions. Drilling down a little bit more, um, the yellow kind of highlights the changes by departments. Um, and then I'll, 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 a lot more of this information is available in the department presentations. This is meant just to be a kind of an archive of a summary of what we'll see. And then I'll present uh, a different slide that'll help quantify that a little bit more in a few seconds here. Um, I just want to reflect that we have, I have not yet updated with our team, our, our financial forecast, meaning we know our debt service, thankfully, is going to be a little bit less for the general fund, the, the costs. Uh, we had thought uh, the general fund could see a $1.5 million cost next year and about $4.4 million cost in the out years. We think that's going to be greatly reduced. We have not yet updated our forecast model, but we haven't factored in the, the impacts of the state budget. So we're going to be updating our forecast model over the probably the coming months. And then when we bring it back with the adopted budget in September 24th, we'll provide the our best estimate of where our, our latest forecast is. But we know we're going to have some savings on the general funds portion of debt service, but we don't yet know the full extent of the state budget. And we appreciate that the state budget will have a balanced budget on June 15th. But what we've often seen is during the month of July, there were a lot of trade of the bills that still reflect some significant changes. So we're really expecting to find out what the final budget impacts are in August. And again, we'll provide those updates to this board um, as, soon as, as soon as possible and certainly no later than September 24th. Uh, just as a reflection on where our reserves are at, this is the same story you've always heard, just put it on repeat in the last couple of years. We, we are grateful that our reserves are at 10.5%. Um, most cities around us have reserves at least 15%, if not up to 24%. Uh, so we're, we're lower than, than most, but we do have a, 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 a decent reserve at 10.5% level and above our, our target of seven. Um, the unfortunate part of that, including that reserve, is some Medi-Cal dollars that if we if we Factor that out and reduce the cuts our reserve in half. Again, that's there, but hypothetically, we like to envision a point in time when some of those medical funding would be able to use for investments in capital. Um, without that medical funding, our, our reserve coverage is about two and a half payroll cycles. Breaking it down to the 
just the general fund on the whole. So I was just talking countywide. Now moving down into the just general fund operations, we did have some uh, supplemental changes of to about twenty four point two million dollars added to the budget. Most of that is in the health services, and they'll touch on that in their presentation. We've seen recognition of some additional Medi-Cal funding and some new grant funding opportunities that were not included in the February budget. So most of those changes are are with uh, HSA, but there's also the CARE Act, the CARE Act funding, bringing on some new positions and some new costs, uh, particularly with a public defender, um, having three positions being added to support the CARE Act, uh, county council, one position being added, and then in June 4th, HSA will come forward with some additional costs related to the CARE Act. So there's CARE Act and some grant funding, that, and that's really the large uh, changes in our supplemental within public works you'll hear their presentation and the community development of infrastructure they're recognizing some new costs attributed to the debt service um so that's that's those are the three big quadrants uh grants care act and debt service costs on the revenue side the supplemental is just recognizing those revenues a lot of it is intergovernmental federal revenue that's gone up on um the supplemental so again those are positive developments outside of the CARE Act, another uh, state funded mandate that they're providing some funding, but not enough for, for what we're seeing for our county. So moving just as a general overview of the departments that we'll be talking about today included in the consent agenda item are all the general government departments. These include the assessor recorder, um, the auto controller, treasurer, tax collector, your board of supervisors budget, the county administrative office budget, um, there's a, re a independent report on just the changes in the CARE Act, so you can see that you've seen that in the published packet. And then we also have reports of the county clerk elections, uh, county council, general services, informational services, and personnel and risk. On the whole, those departments account of 151.7 million for the county-wide number. Um, the general fund of that is $40 million. So a lot of these costs are, are out in our other fund categories, especially our risk, informational services, and general services related to internal service funds. So there's a $40 million general fund portion and $111 million in, in other county funds. This pie chart just uh, shows the, the, the allocation of budget appropriations. While personnel and risk has a low, maybe a lower funded FTE count compared to other departments, uh, the risk budget is large and that includes our property and liability, workers' compensation, and a lot of our self-insured programs are in uh, the risk management section. And that's what makes that pie so large for personnel and risk. Looking at position changes within these, uh, I'm sorry, looking at the general fund contributions for these departments, um, you'll see the, the largest is the, the CAO, county clerk elections, and risk management of, of between 4 and $4.8 million. Uh, that pie chart in the top right quadrant um, really tells the story, though, that green section is the other revenue that, are, that is covering the operations of these departments. So on the whole, there's about 16% uh, funding required to keep all these departments going. The rest of it of it has outside funding sources or internal service uh, funding sources. From a physician count perspective, uh, this has the total position count for all the departments. Uh, the bar in orange are the uh, additions in the proposed or supplemental budget. There's one position being added in the assessor recorder's office, one position in county council for the CARE Act, uh, and 11 positions in general services. 10 of those are the transfer in from uh, capital real property into general service. General service already has a large facility maintenance program. So there's a lot of efficiencies that we'll get from merging facilities maintenance with facility projects. So that'll be a very streamlined and we, we expect a much lower cost for the county in, in project delivery. Moving that with general government, uh, moving into county financing, this is your contingency fund that took a big hit this year, uh, debt service fund and county revenue. The cost of these departments is 13.6 million. Uh, debt service fund is 8.5 million. Uh, a lot of that is our lease revenue bonds and prior debt, including the tax revenue anticipation notes that were talked about last Tuesday. Every year we have to borrow money to uh, have cash flow for the entire county's operation. This year we're proposing to borrow $48 million, and with that comes one year of debt service that's included in the general fund debt service fund. Uh, but what you see there is the contingency in orange, a big reduction. Um, typically we would have expected that to be a 7.5 with a revised budget about 7.8 million, we're down to 1.2 million. That's a huge um, risk for the for the general fund going into next year to not have those uh, that flexibility or ability to respond to immediate needs. Um, I thought I'd just summarize some of the uses that it, 
we have a department called general county revenue it's largely the collection of all of our tax revenue and, and general general revenue so your, your property tax vehicle license fees sales tax um, but there's also some costs in that department and and those costs kind of roll into places that don't fit elsewhere so in, in that general uh, re county revenue there's uh, we have a cost allocation plan that allocates some county costs to other departments but it also receives a share coming in within this fund is are the net expenditures for the cost allocation plan about 3.4 million i'd be happy to talk to you about the cost allocation plan in the budget study session at your desire whenever you like um but i just want to reflect in the general county revenue there are some cost categories that really don't fit with departments that that are picked up here other examples are uh, we have audit services for for taxes transit occupancy tax sales tax that are done and and charged to the general county revenues um Again, I just want to highlight our general fund contingency, typically targeted at a 1% funded level, reduced by 6.6 .6 million this year. Um, our hopes and expectations are that when and if we you can bring Measure K revenue in, that it can help restore a portion of this contingency or, or other revenue sources that we find. Uh, I do want to reflect one thing on the, on the debt service. The, the debt service for the general fund that's presented in the department does not yet include um, any potential costs for the general fund in the disaster financing. Again, our expectation is that there might be no cost to the general fund for a couple of years. So the current financing that the board approved, uh, we expect to have a, a, a holiday, if you will, a debt service payments for the general fund for two years. So that's that's a good thing. We've tried to manage and, and reduce our, our costs as much as possible. As an overview, I'll, I'll just provide again the same general broad strokes for health and human services. You'll ha have two departmental presentations here today uh, following me, health services and human services department. And then on consent are the child support services and the second year of the core investments, um, or the third year of the core investments. Across uh, the county, there's 493.9 million in these departments of which only 4.3 million is other funded sources, and that's largely the environmental health funds um, from health services agencies. So this is largely a general fund um, responsibility for all these services. Um, health and Human do a really nice job, again, looking at that top pie chart. Um, they bring in on a lot of other federal funding sources that help really reduce the impact on the county. So while there are some big uh, general fund support provided to human services and health, Across the board, um, we're only providing 10% of their total operations, and they're bringing in 90% of largely federal dollars into the county to help bring and, and support programs and services. Uh, their funding staffing, uh, no orange growth on the right. In fact, um, both health, well, health has a big, big impact this year. 39.5 positions are being reduced. Again, 28 of those were reductions we knew were coming were COVID funded positions. 28 of them were limited term that were gonna expire at the end of this year, but there's still 11.5 that are, are there of net reductions that are, we just we just can't find the funding or resources for. Um, child support, child support is not a necessarily a county only program. It provides services across multiple counties. So across the entire network of support, they're reducing one FTE. Um, that should have no impact on our services, but that's their ability to to support their budget for their entire uh, counties they serve. Public safety and justice will finish off today's presentations. You'll hear presentations by the public defender's office and probation department. And then on consent are, uh, that are part of tomorrow's consent, um, 911 animal control contributions of Superior Court, County Fire, Grand Jury, and OR3 Office of Recovery Response and Resiliency. And tomorrow morning we'll be opening presentations from the district attorney and the sheriff coroner. Um, the total public safety and justice is 214 million, so about half the size, uh, a little less than half the size of health and human services. Um, and this is their allocation of, of, of costs across their departments. Sheriff Coroner is the largest department in this section, $110 million. Um, of the 214 million, 16.7 million is outside of the general fund, so it's largely county fire and some CSA funding for the sheriff. Uh, their position, uh, their position, uh, their general fund contributions, excuse me, I keep jumping ahead. I want to finish my slide deck. Their general fund contributions um, all received some, some modest growth uh, tied to the core costs of employees like other departments. Um, but unlike the other departments, they're more dependent on the general fund. So 
uh, nearly 60% of their funding is supported by the general fund and about 40% are other funding sources, uh, typically a lot of grants and some CSA funding. So these departments are really, really lean, uh, dependent on the general fund to help keep their operations going. From a position count perspective, um, you'll see some some increases. The district attorney um, adding one position, public defender, six total in the budget. Uh, three are care court, and three were were contracted positions that were brought in house. So it's kind of a net neutral cost. Um, but so they're bringing three positions that are that were being paid for in house, and the sheriff coroner is adding two positions across the budget. So. Near the end of my presentation, again, following today's budget hearing, we'll, we'll continue tomorrow's budget hearing uh, with public safety and then uh, land use and, and and then finishing the day with the capital program. Um, you'll have presentations, again, by district attorney and the sheriff in the morning, and then parks, uh, community development infrastructure, which is both the former public works and planning. And then we'll finish tomorrow with capital projects. Uh, with that, I'm available for questions and your recommendations, actions today are to approve what's on the consent agenda and then uh, have the presentations from health, human, uh, public defender, probation, and then continue the hearings to tomorrow. So that concludes. Thank you, Thank you very much. Any questions from board? So let me ask, does this need to go out to, to public comment since we're discussing consent and just receiving a presentation? No, you just come back to you. To Bring it back to your board for discussion of the consent agenda. Okay. Um, are there any board members who'd like to speak to items on consent? Supervisor Koenig. Oh, I just, uh, given the slightest questions, had a question for our budget manager, Marcus Pimentel. Thank you for the uh, fantastic presentation. A lot of material there, a lot of figures. Um, you know, one challenge I frequently face when discussing our budget with members of the public is, you know, that billion dollar amount yeah. and sort of like, well, what can't you do with over a billion dollars? Um, and then, I mean, you pointed out it's going down from, um, you know, 1.3 to 1.15, but still it's, it's over a billion. But of course our board doesn't have discretion over that entire billion. What, what is the figure that, um, you know, we could, we can reasonably control? Well, I, I respond in two ways. So is largely the general fund, again, the general fund is, is about 700 and Seventy million dollars, and then, but within that general fund, as you saw with health and human services, a lot of that is federally funded programs and services that we have mandates to deliver. Um, it's really that discretionary revenue that gets down to about two hundred twenty thousand dollars or so that's allocated across all those departments. So when you you have the slides on our general fund contribution, you, you could see the different allocations that each department gets. That's really the discretion, the board's discretion. Mm -hmm. But departments have built an expectation that of delivering services based on that funding being there. So it's really it's it. It's it's the hardest decision this board has faced is how to allocate those limited, um, again, or systematically underfunded limited allocation of taxes to across the entire county departments. Right, right. So we actually have discretion over two hundred twenty million dollars. Um, I think possibly one of the more challenging or confusing elements is, as you mentioned, that sort of use of the general fund term. Right. I mean, seven hundred and. 700 plus million in general fund, but actually only have discretion over 220 million of that general fund, which is from the from local revenues primarily. Yes. Um, and and of the the local revenues, we have discretion over what percentage of it is from property taxes. Uh, property taxes are about 85 million. Vehicle license fees, a little over 40 million. Mm -hmm. um, so that's those two are about half of the total discretionary revenue. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, and on the contingency budget, I mean, that is, um, as you said, a, a significant risk built into this. I mean, um, our CAO mentioned that was a, a hard decision uh, already put forward in the budget. But I mean, contingencies, that's what we would pay for emergency road repairs or other, um, you know, emergency shelter, uh, uh, other emergency response with. Is that right? Yeah, it could be anything from a disaster to a failed elevators, failed units across our county facilities. We've seen a lot of that recently, not necessarily the elevators, but they're mm -hmm. safe. Um, but, you know, we, we have had a lot of HVAC issues. We have a lot of county buildings that are you know, pushing their 40, 50th, 90th year. Um, and the, the investments in those has not been um, there in, in, in the last couple of decades. So we're starting to see a lot more failures in our, our county infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and facilities so it would be available to help quickly respond to we, we had a, a, we have we've had several of those risks in this last year 
Yeah, it's just a big concern. I feel like uh, the county is becoming like, you know, the majority of American families don't have four hundred dollars to respond to an emergency here. I mean, what happens if we do? You know, we do need to replace a couple elevators. Or we do actually have a significant disaster event, that, and we when we get through that one point two million dollars and need more. I mean, then we need to contemplate budget cut or uh, um, cutting positions at that point. <laughs> Well, there's a there would be a few options when we do have permanent reserves, right? So uh, those are then the figures that if you had a major uh, disaster that you had to respond, earthquake or or another big storm event like 2023, in theory the board could make the decision to go into those um, those reserve funds, uh, which we have done in the past, right? I mean we did that a while back um, temporarily. We did use some reserve funds. Uh, so that's that's one issue. Uh, the other issue is that I know a lot of counties this year, I was on a CAO um, meeting Friday, and a lot of counties right now are implementing countywide freezing of positions, uh, freezing of travel. Um, so that would be another option is that you could implement an immediate, immediate freeze and then start trying to save money that way. But those are difficult because those positions are all critical and and so it's difficult decisions. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, as has been said by my colleagues, challenging budget situation here. Thank you. Supervisor Brad. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I just want to say uh, some nice things about the departments on consent, if I may. We have, um, I, I recognize that um, people work very hard throughout the year and then these budgets come through very quickly on consent, but there are some pretty remarkable accomplishments that some of these departments had, and I, and I will be missing uh, some of them, but um, I just want to make some comments about um, ICR Auditor Controller. There's about 15 titles you have, but I'm going to cut it short to that, uh, is here. And one of the things that we never have to deal with, in part because of your leadership, is uh, any broader questions about our finances or the integrity of the numbers that we put forward or the ethics of the way that the county spends finances. I mean, you look across the country and it's pretty common to see challenges in that. That has never been the case uh, in Santa Cruz County. And, and uh, you know, your leadership makes sure that we, uh, and your team's leadership, who I see here, really make sure that, that we stay uh, clean on that. And I appreciate that. Um, I see that our information services folks are here. They, they also deserve some pretty significant praise. And we've taken some huge leaps and in investments on increasing broadband equity and access over the last year and will continue moving forward. Uh, they were also some of the leaders in ensuring that land lines were protected throughout our community and continue to make that that case. So, uh, Tammy, you and your team have done uh, really remarkable work. Um, every year it's important to uh, praise county council because if you don't, they'll turn on you. But, um, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, you, you know, there are a lot of options that people, in particular attorneys, have for other types of employment, those that are choosing the public side or really choosing the correct side uh, of the fence to be on. I know that it doesn't pay as much as the private world, but you're making a difference in people's lives from the pandemic to even just the litigation that we're just now talking about. Those that are fighting on the good side of the fight are in your office, Jason. They're a very ethical and very talented group. And so I just want to make sure that your team knows how much we appreciate uh, all of their work. So, I mean, I could go on for quite some time, Mr. Chair, but I just want to make sure that even though you're on consent, <laughs> Uh, the board appreciates the work you do, and and uh, you serve an important function serving the community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, just uh, two. I, I agree. Um, these are there's a bunch of um, uh, offices that are mentioned in the consent agenda, but thank you very much, and each and every one of you, as you have mentioned, uh, the um, the general fund contingencies really are concerned. I know to all of us uh, re being reduced from seven and a half million to one point two. Um, that's really troubling for a county that's uh, had seven disasters, as we've heard, in seven years. And God help us if we have another one this year, this fiscal year. But um, um, what we have now is really not enough to meaningfully respond to the breadth of the challenges that we've seen recently. But um, it is what it is. And I think we're taking the right uh, approach, the, the proposal. Um, the number, the item number 26 on the core investments, that is uh, a controversial issue uh, sometimes, but I just want to thank the, especially the Human Services Department for working so well with our community-based organizations or CBOs. Um, 
I, it's some numbers that I saw. This is the third year of the current core uh, the contract cycle, and I think the numbers speak for themselves. We have 57 programs provided by 50, 41 agencies with a 94% satisfaction rating uh, from almost 62,000 uh, undisputed clients. So it's. I think it's been a great um, formula for us to provide these services uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, and we are the the investment is relatively small, but it's what we can do with our general fund from with a six million dollar total budget. Uh, well, it's five million dollars from the county and uh, one million dollars from the city of Santa Cruz. So I, I want to thank the health services department in, in particular for. Uh, and the staff are responding to the community's input and for the the uh, request for, for for proposal process. I think it's been efficient, and I think it's really uh, addressed the issues that we need uh, as efficiently as we can. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, I just want to ditto um, Supervisor Zach Friend's comments about thanking all our departments that are here in our consent agenda. Uh, you know, the only thing that came up, I think, is that um, I had a question about, do we have any planned uh, FEMA reimbursements either this fiscal year, this coming fiscal year? Do we know if we have any upcoming FEMA reimbursements? Yeah, we're, we, we need those. We're, we've uh, anticipated, okay. uh, I think, nearly 16 million in next year's budget on FEMA reimbursements. So, we continue to push hard and you know, appreciate uh, Chair Friend, his leadership a year and a half ago at saying, you know, partnering us with uh, our federal representatives. Um, we've been able to move up the list. We still have a lot of money out there, um, but COVID is, is starting to free up. So we, we are anticipating about 16 million and we need that. Oh, good. That would be general fund, right? And would that be, that would be um, CZU or? No, that, COVID. That, um, era. We're expecting it largely to be COVID era funding for the general fund. Uh, again, that's part of the bill, the general fund balancing. So for short, we'll be talking some different conversations and at the mid-year if we end up short because we need that money to have the budget balanced. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you for that presentation. And I want to um, just congratulate and thank all the departments for um, being able to get us the budget in a, in a timely manner so that we can have these discussions today and continue moving forward. I did have a couple questions and um, I want to start with item number 14, which is the um, proposed budget for the Board of Supervisors. I know that um, with the empty cup tax that passed a couple years ago that board members are allocated $10,000 towards um, environmentally related issues. And I, I think it was, what was asked of us earlier this year was that we kind of identify where we want that funding to go, but knowing that things change throughout the year and it's hard to really prioritize where that funding can go. Last year, we were given some flexibility on what projects we can allocate to, and we were able to do that throughout the course of the year. And so I'm just wondering if that is an option for us to move forward with this budget. Okay, great. Um, then great to hear about, great that we are able to continue with the same process that we had in place last year. Um, I did want to see if, um, Maybe someone from staff could speak a little bit to uh, the CARE Act. So I know that in District 3, people have been really um, con concerned about CARE Courts and how we're going to move that forward. And I know that um, we do have a separate item that kind of spells out um, like how we're going to fund it. But I'm just wondering if we could just speak to that really briefly in terms of how much money is the county like allocating in this budget towards the implementation of care courts um, so that we can really get people to understand that, you know, we're taking this seriously and we're making the investments necessary to implement that program. There we go. Um, Sven Stafford from the County Administrative Office. I've uh, been uh, coordinating CARE Act services for the county, uh, working in partnership with a superior court, uh, public defender, county council, and health services. Um, the CARE Act is a, um, a program to provide diversion opportunities uh, for people with schizophrenia spectrum or other psychotic disorders. Um, since August of 2023, we've been uh, coordinating to 
uh, implement uh, implement Care Act services starting December first, twenty twenty four. So, uh, yeah, we've been uh, in the in the supplemental budget that we have before uh, the board on the consent agenda. Um, I think we're uh, we're the total expenditure for Care Act is about one point seven million dollars. Um, we expect that Care Act services in the first year will serve anywhere between 30 and 30 and 50 individuals. Uh, so the, the requirements and entry barriers for Care Act are quite high and significant. Um, and then in terms of general fund uh, for fiscal year 24, 25, we're proposing to uh, invest about an additional 300, $360,000 uh, in general fund to leverage um, leverage state funding and uh, and other general fund investments across the the departments and so you know care act is another state mandate uh, it does come with some state funding uh, but it's not quite enough to fund um, fund the full full program great thank you very much um, there was a question that came up during um public comment around um moving um capital improvements from cdi to gst and so i was just wondering if someone might be able to comment on that question that came up yeah i'll i'll start with that and then uh we have um alisa benson can come in and talk more specifically um so uh capital projects is a division that did not exist when i became cao mm -hmm. so we did not have a central capital mm -hmm. management division in the county at that point. Uh, capital projects were managed by each department. Um, I'm sorry, I need to uh, step out real quick, but Elise is going to come in and, and cover that, the rest of that. Yeah. So, um, while we're waiting for Elisa Benson to come in, I do want to say that I'm um, just really supportive that we're continuing to, to support our public defender's office. It's really great that we're able to provide people who are low income with opportunities to have a legal defense. And I'm hoping we can also discuss the legal defense around tenants' rights a little bit further into the um, conversation. Um, and so with Elisa here, I'm hoping we can return and maybe you can help. Us. Oh, I will come sit at the table. <laughs> Good morning, board. Nice to see everyone. So um question was about the decision to move capital projects and real property from CDI to GSD. I think as um, a CAO Palacios talked about it, this has been um, an interesting um, organizational structure over the last few years. And with the changes in CDI combining DPW and planning, uh, we were reluctant at that time to move it, just given all the change underway. In many um, facility management, modern management programs, you try and have your CAP projects division uh, situated with your building operations teams as well. This makes for much stronger integration and collaboration when you do new construction, while you're doing um, tenant improvements to really understand and, and collaborate with the folks who are actually going to run the building at the end of the day. So by doing this move, we're really moving towards an integrated management approach for facilities management. Uh, it, it will help with things like HVAC specs. So when you're actually specking out a design for something, you have the folks that are actually running and operating the system after the project goes live much more heavily involved. We've already started a lot more integration between the Capital Projects Division, which is now uh, run by Damon Adlow, uh, with a GSD, and we're already seeing some of the, the real gains and having that level of collaboration. Um, and then I think we also spoke to, we'll have real property be moving as well, just sort of to a one-stop shop. So uh, these are positions that are just being moved. We've all been working together pretty strongly for the last year. So it's not going to be, it'll be pretty seamless in terms of the experience for um, county agencies in terms of moving forward. And with GSD moving to an internal service fund, we'll also sort of um, change some of the costs 
of the capital projects division, it should be a little bit cheaper in terms of um, their hourly rates, which I think will be better for uh, for many of our county customers. Happy to answer answer any additional questions. Um, that's the last question I have on on that item. It looks like Supervisor Hernandez might have a question as well. Uh, similarly, it was uh, brought up during public comment, but there's four workers from family stabilization and one that came from there previously that had talked about making sure we maintain those services. Can we, what's, what, it seems like that department is I, under threat. Or, I, I think that Director Morris will be speaking okay. to that since that program sits within HSD. Um, but I, I definitely know the teams have been talking about that for quite a while and, and trying to make appropriate plans. Thanks. And then I guess my um, final comments on item number 17, the uh, budget for the clerk elections. Just want to appreciate, um, you know, continuing to have a really great elections department. The one comment I do have is that I know during the elections this year, there's some folks who receive their mail-in ballots before they receive their pamphlets and their informational packets. I'm just hoping that we can, that next year uh, when we have our primary election and this fall when we have our presidential election, that we're able to um, have those materials arrive around the same time so that people can read their ballot arguments and have that information before um, they're voting. And then um, lastly, just want to also thank personnel and risk management department. Um, had an opportunity to meet with them. And I know one of the concerns that came from this board was really trying to improve recruitment and retention of our workforce. And so to the extent we can continue to offer um, um, you know, hiring benefits and um, continue to provide opportunities for, you know, retention, whether it's through um, bonuses at certain times you know, after working for 5, 10, 20, 25 years, what have you. But the, the more we can work towards um, retaining our employees, I think the better off the county will be. And just want to thank them for all their work in this space. And so with that, um, that concludes my comments. Are there any further questions or comments from board members? We ask the elections. Um, I think um, mail-in ballots, does that account for, I think it's over 80% of our voters that vote by mail? Anybody have that number? Maybe it's closer to nine. So somebody might be able to answer that question. Good morning, board. You just turned it off. Can you hear me now? Okay. Rita Sanchez, Assistant County Clerk. Um, I believe it is 80%. We do have Trisha Weber on Zoom. Hi, this is Trisha, uh, Santa Cruz County Clerk. Thank you very much for allowing me to remote in. Um, yes, of the people who vote um, in our election, over 80% of them will vote by mail. Um, and part of that is because we had a large number of people who wanted um, permanent vote by mail voting back when that was an option. And now the state mandates that we mail a ballot to all registered voters that are active um, 29 days prior to the election. And over 80% of those people will return it by mail or will return that mailed ballot that was given to them. Most people return by mail, but we have a lot more people returning it through our drop boxes or at one of our in-person voting locations. Thank you very much. And um, and so with that, seeing no further questions or comments, I'd like to see if there's a member of the board who would like to move the consent item. I'll move consent. Second. So we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Koenig. And with that, I'll have a roll call vote. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, okay, just looking at the time, um, maybe if we want to take a five minute break, um, we can come back and we'll get our first presentation um, on the regular agenda. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. So the first item on our regular agenda uh, for the Health and Human Services presentation 
is consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for the health services agency, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. And with that, I'll turn it over to the director of HSA, Monica Morales. I think your mic. I don't think your mic's on. There we go. Oh, there we go. Good morning, board. Uh, for the record, Monica Morales, Health Services Agency Director. Appreciate the time that we will have today to share with you our uh, budget for fiscal year 24-25. I am here with my, uh, excuse me, my team, um, Jennifer Herrera, uh, Assistant Director, and Jessica Randolph, our Director of Administration. So with you today, I, you know, we'll cover some of the key highlights that, um, Marcus already covered in a little bit more detail and don't want us on too repetitive. So we'll, we'll definitely monitor and be uh, mindful of the time that this might take as well. Um, you won't be surprised to uh, see our budget. I think for the most part, we've shared it with you in terms of the great work that our team um, really does to leverage state and federal dollars, both in grants and in Medi-Cal. Um, so you'll see a lot of that reflected in our budget. Um, specifically, I think for us, our vision and values really align with the priorities of our budget, ensuring that our communities are safe and our environments are also safe and healthy for our constituents. We value a lot the work of our stakeholders and our community partners. We cannot do this without community-based organizations um, that are really at the core of the work that we're doing as well. So the collective impact for us is incredibly important. Um, you heard from our community today, the needs are high. The role of um, health in our community is vital and our team really works hard to ensure that we're bringing some of those key services into the most needed um, communities. Most of the budget that you'll see here really aligns with our vision around equity. Our the majority of our services go to serve low-income communities and primarily uh, Medi-Cal uh, recipients. So you'll get to, we'll highlight a few of those bullet points as well. But it does take a mighty team to make this happen. We have about 730 um, staff members. I really want to extend my gratitude for all of the work that they do. Everything from, you know, making sure that our um, environments, our restaurants are safe, our water is safe. We can't take that for granted, right? And also serving the dire need of our young people when it comes to mental health and substance use and addiction. The stories that I've brought to the board before in terms of our um, clinical services, really serving those that for much too long have not seen treatment and then they come to our clinics to really um, address issues that are now chronic issues and our team does a magnificent job really serving those populations. Um, our public health team that for me really they are the servants that we a lot of times forget are doing a lot of the great work like our outbreaks and we'll talk a lot about that as well in terms of the work of public health. So what you have in front of you is an org chart really composed of our leadership team at HSA that drives more than 25 plus programs um, and we'll talk a lot about uh, as well the key services that you've seen here. Um, I just want to highlight a few kind of data points for you in terms of the services. You know, our facilities and environmental health see dozens and dozens of uh, structures or, um, you know, everything from restaurants to wells to ensure that they're safe for our community. Our clinics um, highlighting and seeing over 15 um, thousand clients in our community, primarily low income, as I was mentioning, behavioral health, you know, really reaching about 6,000 clients in our community. And hopefully with the work that we're doing, that number actually shrinks because we want to see less people in our facilities and our, our team's doing a magnificent job with that. In public health, as I mentioned, really doing cross-cutting work across our county around disease control, emergency response, 
Just alone in the past two years, they've had to address over um, five different outbreaks and um, excuse me, response and outbreaks. And, you know, just in the outbreaks this year alone, we've probably accumulated about two hundred thousand uh, dollars just just on salary, just on uh, public health, really addressing the work that we're doing. So just a couple of bullet points for you to kind of get a sense of the magnitude of the work that's taking place. The budget for us, what you'll see is that um, we're about 95% funded um, through state and federal grants, right? So our budget, we work our tails off to write those grants and really maximize Medi-Cal. I wanted to highlight a few of those achievements um, that we've been able to look at. So what you're seeing here is, and this is a, just a little snapshot. Remember, it's about 200 a million dollars that we have um, that we leverage from state and federal dollars. But I'm highlighting a few because I think they're important. In terms of our enhanced care management, this is a new service through CalAIM. We've been able to leverage about $1.4 million. Um, this is through various different grants that you see outlined here, really to reach about 435 clients um, that we have enrolled in the program to date. Our mobile crisis, um, we want to see a 24 hour mobile crisis. We've had a great model in the county. It's gone through its ups and downs and now trying to meet the new state mandate of having mobile crisis. They've leveraged about $12 million state and federal dollars, excuse me, yes, yeah, state and federal dollars to really make this program work. Our opioid overdose prevention work, leveraging about $2 million uh, through the settlement, 850,000 of that going to community grants. Um, and we've distributed over 80,000 kits uh, of MAT in our community. And finally, when it comes to mental health and uh, housing individuals experiencing mental health and homelessness, $10 million have been leveraged to really um, ensure that we're building those facilities um, in our community. So again, just a snapshot of the great work that's taking place um, that you see reflected in our previous budget and that hopefully will continue to align um, in our uh, budget that we're going to be discussing with you. So the budget priorities that you see um, are really for us uh, matching the community need. Our mental health, as you've heard me present just last week on the work that we're doing for our youth prevention and early intervention, our substance use um, work that we're doing in combination with the opioid settlement and our public health team has been very impactful as well. And all ensuring that folks experiencing homelessness have excellent clinical services as well as behavioral health support. So the key um, line items in our budget are really a, a reflection of that and we'll cover a little bit of how they outline by uh, division as well. So what we're requesting to you today is a budget that reflects about $289.4 million to continue to provide the needed services in our community. And I'll walk you through this table. It's a, it's a little bit um, busy, but what you're seeing here, if you just focus on the third column, is our request for fiscal year 24-25. And the revenues that we're projecting at this point will equate about $270.5 million. Expenditures will be about $289.4 million. So we use the general fund to offset that. And the general fund contribution would be about $18.6 million. Um, as I mentioned, we need a strong, resilient team that's flexible to address the uh, diversity of work that we do in the community. So we're requesting a staffing level of um, 730 staff for our next budget. So on the right side, that's where you see the change between um, current fiscal year to our projected or proposed requested um, budget year. Um, we do see the growth continuing. So we're not slowing down in our department. Um, there will be pauses in the state fund, and we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. But what you're seeing is a couple of things. One is the increase ability for our team to maximize uh, federal dollars through our uh, Medi-Cal reimbursement. 
Um, and also thinking about us um, at this point, leveraging existing state dollars that will continue to come in through behavioral health. So with that, um, I also just want to highlight to kind of step back and look over the 10 years of the history of uh, our department, we have doubled our budget in the last 10 years. Um, and you'll see on uh, the blue uh, pillars basically represent the growth of a uh, non-general fund. So primarily state or federal fund coming to our department and a significant increase from, you know, uh, 15, 16, we were only at $131 million. And on the right side, far right, you'll see we're about $266 um, million that we're expecting to work with for fiscal year 24, 25. This reflects, as you can tell here, a very small percent of general fund that we leverage at this point, only about 6%. So a lot of work from our team members to ensure that we keep our staff, that we're really bringing in resources for um, key functions uh, based on the community need. With that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Jennifer. Thank you, Director Morales. Uh, so the community benefit from HSA. This next fiscal year, HSA's budget reflects an increase in direct services in our focus areas. We plan to increase crisis services and mental health system, increase SUDS treatment services, and develop low barrier temporary housing for community members experiencing mental illness and homelessness. By expanding these direct services, HSA aligns with the county's equity statement to embrace individuals of every status by developing intentional opportunities for accessible services. In addition to increased direct services, we will continue to support the community through upstream population-based initiatives. This includes participation in health policy collective impact efforts, such as the Community Health Improvement Plan, climate change efforts, and maintaining readiness for public health emergencies. We'll be conducting well water education to mitigate effects of drought and support our health and social service systems with Medi-Cal reform. An example of this last point is our Medicaid Administrative Activities Program, also known as MAW. With the expansion of Medi-Cal eligible populations and services, HSA will continue to play a critical role with, with supporting MAW revenue for our entire community. This is a funding opportunity for county and community-based organizations supporting Medi-Cal outreach, program planning, and contract administration. HSA acts as the required local governmental agency or LGA for the entire county, facilitating fiscal claims and providing technical assistance for our county and community providers. Over the years, HSA's efforts to bolster our mall infrastructure has led to increased revenue for our entire community, both internal county departments and community-based organizations. From 2017 through 2022, our revenue has increased by 134%. We have seen great revenue, the greatest revenue growth among our community-based organization partners. In fiscal year 17, 18 revenues were just under a million. Our most recent invoicing for uh, coming in for fiscal year 22, 23 project revenues to be over 3.7 million. And our current projections overall estimate bringing in close to $8 million in more revenue to our community this year based on our recent claims. So we are committed to support safety net services and infrastructure that enables healthy, safe, and thriving community. Our revenue for this year, as Director Morales mentioned, is around $270 million, over a quarter of which is expected from our charges to services. This includes our environmental health fees, as well as, as other charges through our health centers and public health divisions. And as you see here, the vast majority of our revenue, about 70%, is from intergovernmental revenue. This is that mixture of state and federal sources, including grant funding and Medi-Cal reimbursements. So this upcoming year, we anticipate revenues being affected in this area, uh, primarily due to changes in our healthcare billing with medical transformation, such as CalAIM, decreased public health revenues due to uh, the sunsetting of COVID dollars, and decreases in realignment impacting behavioral health and public health. This slide just shows a breakdown of our revenues by our HSA divisions. And as you can see, much of our revenue exists through our behavioral health division. So the revenue impacts we anticipate in behavioral health, uh, which with payment reform and budget changes will have a significant impact overall to our agency. This pie chart here covers expenditures. Uh, we have budgeted about 289 million in expenditures for this next fiscal year with the majority of 
uh, that being in salaries and benefits, followed by services and supplies, which is um, mainly our contracted uh, services with our community providers. We anticipate our expenditures being impacted by behavioral health inpatient care, expansion of behavioral health crisis services, as well as building out new Medi-Cal services, such, such as enhanced care management, community supports, and community health workforce. Broken down by division, you can see that the majority of our, our expenses align with our divisions providing direct services in our behavioral health and health centers. And I will now turn it over to our Director of Administrative Services, Jessica Randolph. So the budget recommends staffing, thank you. Recommend staffing uh, 730.05 positions, which includes the unfunding of 18.60 positions and deleting 37.55 positions. The positions being deleted, which was current. Is it not? I think it's on. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> the positions, as has already been mentioned, being deleted include 28, limit, 28 limited term positions that are set to expire at the end of this fiscal year uh, due to the sunsetting of COVID related funds. As you can see from the charter, vacancy rate remains about 26%. We continue to have difficulty recruiting in our environmental health division and for our crisis workers in mental health. And next week's fiscal year, we'll be returning to your board along with uh, collaborating with the personnel department to work on some recruitment and retention programs to focus on process improvement in those areas. Let's see. Here we just want to highlight our great work um, as some capital improvement projects that we're working on. The Children's Crisis uh, Center construction is currently scheduled to be completed at the end of August 2025. This will include eight chair, uh, an eight-chair crisis stabilization unit and a 16-bed crisis residential program. The new facility will enable our county to fill critical gaps in the current youth crisis continuum of care and enhance collaboration with programs in the current system to reduce or eliminate repeated, uh, repeated cycles of crisis. Uh, the Behavioral Health Bridge Program is a collaboration with our Human Services Department and their Housing for, uh, Housing for Health Division. Community Infrastructure and Development Department is managing construction of this new 34-bed temporary housing for people experiencing mental illness and homelessness. This will be a referral-only center with on-site comprehensive health care, behavioral health, and supportive services that will connect individuals to stable housing and help reduce homelessness in Santa Cruz County. As required by the state, the new program will prioritize access to individuals participating in the CARE Act plan and program. And the estimated completion will be uh, the winter of this year, early uh, 2025. I'll pass it back to Dr. Morales. <laughs> so a little bit of what we know about the state impact so far. Um, our team has been meeting uh, with our associations, both on the behavioral health side, on the public health side, to track what we're sensing from the governor's proposed um, May revision. And right now, these are some of the key categories that will have direct impacts to our department. Although I will highlight, there's definitely proposals out there still floating around workforce reductions in general for health that we're also monitoring. In addition to reductions, for example, in naloxone funding, uh, we used to get millions of dollars for the distribution of naloxone in our county. So that's something that we're also tracking. But right now, some of uh, the items that are keeping us up at night, for example, is the elimination of the public health infrastructure funding. So this is about $300 million that was um, to, in fiscal year 22-23 allocated to fund state public health as well as $200 million to fund local public health. What that means for us locally is approximately $1.4 million that would be in jeopardy for our public health division. Um, we currently are assessing the impact, monitoring if in fact um, the full cut will move forward. As you know, the legislators were actually hearing the public health budget last night. They were up quite late um, discussing the impact specifically to our public health department. So a lot of advocacy taking place there. We'll continue to monitor and come back to the board once we get a sense of what that will actually look like by uh, June 15th. 
In addition, this is a little tricky one. We're seeing eliminations in our behavioral health funding. It's not our core funding, so it's not an additional cut, for example, to MHSA or realignment, um, but it is a cut to some of the core capital projects or infrastructure projects that we have leveraged. For example, right now, the Youth Crisis uh, Stabilization Building that we were able to fund through the BCHIP program, um, that fund has multiple rounds, right, up to like five or six rounds of funding. We obtained one of the uh, rounds and came to your board last year to uh, basically bring that into our, our budget. So that's a line item that for us, it's important. Um, it won't jeopardize our current building, but it does hinder our ability to continue on the path to build infrastructure for treatment, for example, in our community. Another one for us is the BHBH, which is our Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Funding. That one has funded the 34 units that you're seeing in Mid-County. Um, so again, that funding will continue to move forward in our county, but it's future projects that we're very concerned about that we won't have the ability to continue to work on. I will share with you, though, that from the uh, lens that the governor's budget is kind of leaning is that, well, you'll have Prop 1 funding coming your way through the bond for housing, and you'll be able to use some of those resources. So again, we're in that same situation where it's just funding allocations being moved around with basically um, not really seeing an addition, but uh, um, counties continue to struggle to really meet the demand of what it takes to build these buildings. The youth crisis building, it was not a whole new building. We actually just did, a, a, you know, some um, upgrades and it's $26 million, right? So it just gives you the magnitude of the cost um, that we really need to think through as we see these cuts really hitting um, important uh, behavioral health funding. Um, I will also note that in the proposed uh, May revise, we see no ongoing funding for Prop 1 and also for SB 43. Um, this is a, very difficult for us because you have a workforce that, as you can tell, has really been working hard to leverage federal and state dollars. So we're doing a lot to bring money in, which also means that there's a lot of services that we're mandated to provide with these grants or through the Medi-Cal uh, reimbursement. It leaves very, like no room to do anything else. So when you have Prop 1, which continues to be unfunded, or SB 43, or you saw the, the impact of care cord, it leaves very an overworked staff. I mean, bottom line, that's what it means to us. So we're trying to navigate a lot of the impacts that we're seeing, trying to continue to see also and assess the impact of Proposition 1 on behavioral health, what will the bond look like? We don't know. We're expecting to get more information through the end of this year um, and the implications of the 30% cut to our uh, behavioral health division. We are estimating at this point that Prop 1 will reduce about 6 to $8 million of our Mental Health Services Act funding. Something for the board to keep in mind is that we use general fund and MHSA to meet the 50% matched required. So let me give you an example, and, and, and this is not you know, exact, but if let's just say we see a cut of $5 million in the MHSA due through, uh, through Prop 1, that means you're actually losing $10 million, right? Because you're not leveraging that federal match. So it's a lot for us to navigate. So this year, what we're thinking is based on the budget that you see, we will be, um, you know, holding, holding strong, um, next year, though, I do anticipate if you continue to look at the budget reductions that we might actually see further cuts. So we'll be coming to the board, uh, you know, presenting on the impact of Calame. We do have a low rate in our county to top it off. <laughs> so we'll have a low rate. We'll see the impacts of Prop 1 and what that means to us in terms of our behavioral health budget and come back to the board and uh, work with you to make any adjustments needed. I covered this a little bit. Um, I think what I'll highlight is just some other areas that you um, that we haven't talked about. Um, you know, as Marcus and uh, our CEO uh, 
Palacios has mentioned, climate change is really also impacting health. What happens in our department is we're responsible for the med health branch. And which, what that means is every time there's an outbreak or some form of emergency, we have to activate our department. We have to ensure that the key medical services that are needed to address the issues are in place. So we don't have any funding for that. That's just, you know, in uh, a response that we have to be prepared. We don't see those, uh, re you know, reduction in outbreaks. We don't see a reduction in disasters. So that always also means an impact to future considerations as we look at our budget. Um, the aging population, you guys have heard us present to you on the aging population. It will continue to have a significant impact on health services as we see the aging uh, cohorts increase in our county, um, specifically in treatment for clinical services and behavioral health. Um, I'll talk a little bit about SB 43. Right now, we have been meeting um, across our departments to really start thinking about the impact. We're doing right now a preliminary assessment of what that would mean. Um, right now, about 300 individuals go to our ED uh, that can qualify um, under SB. Um, so with the expansion of SB 43, we know that the substance use and addiction will probably double that. We're probably estimated about 800 individuals uh, would qualify under the new criteria. So. You know, in terms of a hit or an expense, um, anywhere um, right now it's about $13 million uh, that that impacts our budget um, or the county, I should say. And we see that if it actually doubles, it can be anywhere between 15 to $20 million of an impact to um, county. So lots of work there happening. Um, we'll come back to the board and continue to present um, on those changes. Um, so in conclusion, our request is uh, for the board to approve our proposed budget for our health services agency, including any supplemental materials, um, revenues of $270.5 million in our expenses at uh, $289.4 million with the offset of the general fund at $18.6 million and our staffing at um, 730 uh, full-time FTEs. With that, I'll pause and take any questions. Great, thank you so much. I think what uh, we'll do is we'll go out to the public and see if there's any members of the public who like to comment on this item and then we'll bring, or have, who have any questions and then we'll bring it back to the board. So if any member of the public, public who's here in chambers would like to speak to us on this item, I'd like to invite you to the podium right now and you'll have two minutes. Uh, there's a gray button kind of on the black stock that you can push. There you go. Is it? Okay. Hello. Um, I, my name is Susan Cohen, and um, I am part of SURGE showing up for racial justice and um, represent uh, other groups of people. And <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, so we want to encourage you to improve funding that's been mentioned. And, uh, and and to address all the concerns that so many community members brought up today, I'm just boosting what others have said so far. Um, there's so much need every day people have and Health and Human Services is doing what they can with this limitation, limited budget. Um, it's an underfunded department, many would argue, and many people in our county are not thriving. And because of this underfunding, our jail is being used as a mental health facility. Uh, the 2022-23 grand jury report states clearly that behavioral health must be more thoroughly addressed. Um, and a budget represents values and a county supervisor that's tasked with taking care of people who live in your jurisdiction, take action that speaks to your values. It's your job to do what will help all people, not just those with two pockets. What's the point of having your position if you're not taking care of those? those most in need and those who suffer from mental health and substance abuse are in serious need. We need to ask yourself what we can do differently. We can't keep passing off to other higher up elected officials or blame the budget deficit. Yes, there's a deficit, but why is it always the programs that directly serve people's well-being and actually keep people safe and healthy go first? Why are these services 
Measure K funds, for example, and Measure K is only $10 million. That's a minuscule portion of the budget, so you can't honestly put so much em emphasis on it. And why are the critical programs such as Meals and Wheels and Tenant Rights paid for by Measure K anyway? Um, in fact, you see the sheriff's budget, budget, you'll see tomorrow, increased even though the need for sheriff roles has decreased because actions that land people in jail have gone down. Of course, this is not easy. Um, we need to get people involved in a meaningful way. Does that just go off? Yeah. So okay. you, can just wrap, you can wrap up real quick. Okay. So we need to open these meetings up to people and not have them at 9 a.m. We need to please get more people involved in this process and, um, and start to please think differently of what else can be done uh, outside the box getting bringing more people in thank you thank you uh good morning i'm uh, mike Beebe. i represent nami and i just want to voice my appreciation for all the work that uh, health services and behavioral health does and acknowledge all the moving pieces so legislative changes changes in funding uh, that the board and the department, you know, has to deal with. And I think they do an incredibly professional job doing that in very difficult situations. And uh, it's really appreciated by the community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other member of the public here with us today who'd like to speak on the health services agency's budget presentation? Seeing none here in chambers, I'll go online and see if there's members of the public who'd like to address us online. Yes, we do have speakers. Colin, use your two. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Barron, I uh, appreciate you have your hands full, Monica, um, but I, you, you stated how the role of health in our community is vital, and I ask myself, what supports health really, like ending poverty, having employment, having housing, a non-toxic environment? nutritious food all the time. Unfortunately, this budget does not address those contextual problems. And I see, I also ask, is this public health or pharmaceutical corporate wealth? So much goes into vaccines and pharmaceuticals, even the Supreme Court stated vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. And the state of affairs we're in, the cost of the quarantines that were opposed, uh, imposed to death, a uh, quote from a book here, as Dr. Fauci's policies took hold globally, 300 million humans fell into dire poverty, food insecurity, and starvation. Globally, the impact of lockdowns on health programs, food production, and supply chains plunged millions of people into severe hunger and malnutrition. I'm quoting from the real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I hardly, highly recommend everyone read this well-documented book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Chair, Board. Uh, and staff, um, I just want to uplift the amount of work that this department uh, just shared with us. Grant writing, going after those funds, being proactive, that's a lot of work, you know. And so just kudos to, to the directors and, and your staff, you know. Uh, I do ask that this county, this sitting board, right, um, do what it needs to do to leverage county resources and continue to uplift and support the unique and very important and critical services that that this department is uh is providing for people, right? Um yeah, I just uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that. And again, kudos to to the director and her staff. 
um, and continue to do the good work. Thank you. Karina, your microphone is now available. Hi, buenas tardes. My name is Karina Moreno, and I'm calling in from District 4. Um, and I appreciate the Zoom option to be able to do this and, and to participate in, in things that um, affect me in my community, even though I have to be at work. Um, so thank you guys for that. I also wanted to uplift um, how critical, especially with everything that's been going on, how much this department um, really leads into like safety and the groundwork of this being able to to really help a lot of people but also acknowledge too that like i believe 70 percent of these services are being used by people from district four and from waltonville so i also just wanted to call in and and participate and and try to understand more about this department and ask that you guys also support them thank you so much we have no further speakers chair all right, thank you very much to all those folks who were able to comment. Um, I'd like to bring it back to the board at this time to see if there's any questions or comments. Start the end with Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Director Morales and your, your whole team for doing this, which takes into account as much as possible where we are where we are uh, with the state budget process right now. And, um, and there's two thoughts I have uh, when you say that uh, I think 90, 95, 94 percent of our your budget is um, state and federal grants. Uh, number one, I'm thankful. And number two, I'm scared uh, because I don't know what's going to be coming uh, as of June 15th from the state. Um, and I really appreciate your focus on uh, the behavioral health, substance abuse, and homelessness, uh, those issues. Um, and the cuts proposed by the governor's budget could have a profound impact um, that we have. And I probably think um, what the legislative analyst is saying more than the governor about what needs to be cut. But I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the, the, above, the budget eliminates about 38 full-time positions. Uh, and because of the reduction, um, it's because of COVID. Um, how, how are you tracking the next, the next steps of where those folks are going, or are you able to do that? Well, I'll give you, uh, I'll start it and then I'll lean on uh, our director of administration to provide further details. Um, there's a couple of things that have been happening in our department. We did see the writing on the wall in terms of the rate changes in behavioral health, right? We saw the reduction early in the year of our rate and our revenues coming in. We also took advantage and looked at our clinics and really trying to increase the, the level of performance. And it's been very difficult um, with, uh, you know, not being able to hire key positions across our department. And the third thing is the changes with COVID, right? Um, we saw the state dollars shrinking with COVID. We knew it was just uh, an emergency with quick money coming our way to uh, quickly react and put in place mitigation strategy. With that, we had to leverage a lot of like uh, uh, limited term or uh, temporary positions to help with that. As all of this is taking place, this is what you're seeing reflected in our budget. So we're working with the folks impacted, um, uh, those limited term positions or those individuals that no longer want to continue with the county or want to continue with the county to see if we can find placements for them. And for the most part, we have been successful. So I'll pass it to Jessica so she can provide some details. Yeah, just to add on to that, about of the 28 limited term positions, we're under less than five that are still looking for spots. Since they were limited term positions, once they were hired, they they were well aware of the ending date as of June of this fiscal year. So a lot of them have been getting on county list and, and promoted to some permanent positions. Of those handful, some of them had just joined uh, the county team to help us during COVID and are, are not interested in continuing with the county. So um, we've done a great job in finding landing spots for those who are interested. And we will continue to do so through the end of June. Well, thank you for that effort. And, and I, uh, one other question. Um, you have about vacancy rates. Uh, I know that you have an increase of about 10%. Um, what is the general reason? Is it a high cost of living like the causes? Is it burnout? Is, why are the vacancy rates, uh, you know, at 10%? Is it because of the high cost of living here? Or is there 
Can you pinpoint any of that? I think it's a it's a combination of um, changes in government. I, I do believe COVID across any industry has had a, a different impact. Um, we are um, also tracking when people are leaving the reasons for their why they're leaving. Um, why, uh, in terms of recruitment, why it's been difficult for us to recruit. We've heard anecdotally, obviously, that the salaries continue to, um, when they see Santa Clara salaries or Bay Area salaries, it's hard for us to compete considering how expensive it is to live here as well. So you, you have a combination of things happening. And, and we also got to remember, we have a huge workforce that has retired in government as well. So you have a combination of multiple things taking place. Um, we are working with personnel on specific recruitment strategies for environmental health and behavioral health. We're trying to leverage grants to move forward with bonuses for some of our staff. Um, so there's, um, and, you know, I, I know that um, we've been trying to also hear from our team members of what works for them. And we've heard that the ongoing telework is also helpful for folks to retain their current positions in a county that's really expensive. So we're trying to take into account all these different factors to retain staff and make sure that they're engaged as well. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, you mentioned some of the things that keep you up at night. Um, the 38 employees that we're talking about, um, do we have some sort of a contingency plan or a plan B in case the state actually goes south on this budget um, on the items that you said? on the So right now, the, the only one that we're monitoring is the public health infrastructure grant. That's um, about $1.4 million dollars. Uh, for the Division of Public Health in our department. Um, it currently uh, funds or would fund about four positions. And so we're monitoring what that would be, working with personnel if we have to uh, put in gear any type of contingency plan to move forward with um, any type of changes at this point. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, Director Morales, uh, Jennifer, Tessica, thank you for the presentation. And I want to commend uh, everyone on your team for the fabulous work, really increasing revenues. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that uh, your department has basically doubled non-county revenues in the last nine years from 130 million to 260 million. And um, obviously it has a big positive impact on our community. So thank you for that. I mean, you also talked about a number of projects that was hope. Uh, there's the, of course, the Children's Crisis Resolution Center, the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing, 24/7 uh, Crisis Response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once all of these programs are in play, that should also really improve, particularly the uh, mental health landscape in our community. I want to ask about the 24/7 Crisis Response. I think we're looking at officially launching that, like June, July timeframe. Is that is that right? So the state mandate was January of this year. And um, at this rate, we've been able to secure our partnership with a family services agency to provide some of the actual um, support with us in terms of going out into the community, doing the uh, assessments and de-escalation and so forth. They've done a wonderful job also recruiting bilingual staff that we're very pleased with because that just really complements the need across all our county. So we're hoping to have this uh, launch hopefully late summer um, at this point. But we remember, we do have a mobile crisis already in place. It's just not 24-7. Right. Okay. So 24-7 by late summer. Yes. Okay. Do, and what are the ongoing costs of the anticipate for that program? That's a good question. So um, as you saw, we leveraged the money to actually work with FSA uh, to bring in and build the infrastructure for our own staff. Um, we're looking right now and are still getting clarity on the reimbursement pieces. Um, we have to have certain criteria met in order to start fully reimbursing. So um, because it's not fully live, we haven't met the criteria and we're ramping up to ensure that by the summer, were in place to do the reimbursement. Um, I'll get back to you on exactly what those numbers would mean for us um, at a future board meeting, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be fine. I mean, I'm sort of just wondering about this in the context of 
all these state mandates that you mentioned, right? And of course, it's, uh, this is a mandated program, and there's some funding to stand it up and some promise of reimbursement, but what is the net county cost going to be long term? That's really what I'm curious about. Uh, and, you know, I think all, many of our departments are dealing with these unfunded state mandates, uh, but probably yours more than any other. Um, and I can tell you, uh, as our county's new representative on the, uh, at CSAC, the California State Association of Counties, that this is a conversation that uh, really every board of supervisors across the state is having, is how are we going to deal with this uh, impact on our budget? And so I think um, it would be really helpful to just have a kind of itemized list of all of these unfunded state mandates and what the net county costs are, um, because we need to have a larger conversation with our state legislators. I mean, I appreciate uh, the intention of a lot of the new programs and laws that they've created, but ultimately we need to do these in a way that um, are are not going to tie our hands about you know what what we can and cannot spend money on and um you know ultimately we don't have money to stand up programs we can't stand up programs um so i think that would be helpful going forward both for, for your department and ultimately for others that are dealing with these unfunded mandates as well um there's a couple of other quick questions so I mean, you mentioned general fund contribution to your budget by 18.6 million dollars um and that's kind of actually 24, we're going up 24.4% this year. Um, can you explain, like, why is that such a big increase? I mean, I know that salary increase is like 3%, but 24 is quite a quite a bit greater than 20, uh, than 3, so. Yeah, um, so uh, Marcus Pimentel, our director of budgets, came to the board last year to propose using general fund for COLAs. So that's what you see, the reflection in our budget is, um, you know, uh, the $18 million versus the 14 from last year. It's just, the excuse me, it's just the reflection of the COLAs now being adjusted to have those as part of our general fund and right. for us to be able to cover them. Yeah, I mean, and of course you have, the I think most positions of any individual department. And so I think it's just uh, it, it's sort of surprising for me to realize that that 3% increase in the cost of living adjustment can actually, because you have so many positions, is magnified and ultimately leads to a 24% increase in total um, department need uh, for, for general fund contributions. So um, I think just important to Keep in mind as you know, as we do go into um, negotiations with, with various bargaining units, um, and then so that eighteen point six million. I, if I understand correctly, the majority of that goes towards behavioral health. That is correct. For the most part, we use that to do the federal match, and as I was mentioning, um, it's a very important fund for us because if we want to increase services, which we know are needed, um, that means we need a match. And we usually use a combination of Mental Health Services Act. So now it's been impacted, realignment, and the general fund to actually meet that match. So we will have to monitor that very carefully as well mm -hmm. um, and ensure that we, as we increase services, um, that we have a match to follow with that. Mm -hmm. So so that, and it's like a two to one match, that 18.6 million ends up being about roughly 30 to 36 million in, in funds for behavioral health. Right, so if you increase um, services by a million dollars, you'll get the federal match for another million dollars, bringing in $2 million to the mm -hmm. county, for example. Great. Uh, and how many people overall are utilizing mental health services in our county? We have about 6,000 clients, um, about 1,500 are young people. That is, um, that's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. Helping, that we're helping, so thank you. Supervisor Brown. Thank you, I don't, in some respects, I don't really know what to say because I feel like every time we're in the state, we're having these conversations, functionally nothing changes, right? I mean, the mandates that Supervisor Koenig's talking about, um, at the end of the day, the incentives are misaligned. I mean, the legislature is rewarded for individual one-off programmatic gifts, and uh, there's no long-term funding. And then your department, the county more broadly, is is left um, holding the responsibility without any funding stream. And then during 
poor budget times. I know we had had a speaker say, why would they, we be reliant on some of these general fund components? Well, at the end of the day, over 95% of the budget is actually coming from outside sources. So we're much more reliant on state and federal um, funding, which has been completely insecure. And at this, you know, the governor and the legislature has telegraphed that uh, while they claim no core programs will get cut, uh, that doesn't include the overwhelming number of uh, what I think we would all agree are core programs that both health and human services provide. So um, I, I think that we just need to be prepared for the reality that the programs that were finally built up and starting to show some results are going to have significant impacts. So there's going to be very uh, difficult trade-offs as a result of it. And ultimately, uh, for a whole host of reasons, I mean, the proposition system and how limited amount of actual flexibility that the state government actually has, the only places you really end up getting cut are in higher education and in health and human services uh, because they have about 25% discretion at the state side. So I, I think that the reality is by June 15th, Supervisor McPherson's point, uh, there won't be any good news coming in. The question would be how bad is the news? And I think that uh, what you're presenting to us is the best possible scenario of trying to maintain core services. I do think that it would be good if you reiterated an explanation of what appears to be that um, growth in general fund contribution is really sort of a, um, I don't want people leaving here thinking that there's a significant new investment occurring in your department that isn't actually occurring, even though it would look like that if you just did that. So if you wouldn't mind explaining just again to make sure it's exceptionally clear to the community and the board uh, why the discrepancy between the two years and the general fund funding. So there's an understanding that we're not making the, a large new investment into the into your department, but instead it's just in essence an accounting situation. Sure, I'll give it a try. So for actually this current fiscal year, when we presented our proposed budget, we were asked to reduce it by additional $4 million just to help the good of the county for this fiscal year. And we were in a position where we were able to do that. And so now we are, it's kind of double of our um, cost of a COLAs for this per, for next fiscal year. That makes sense. We're kind of making up for this current fiscal year because we didn't get the additional coverage for the COLAs. We were able to absorb that on our own. Okay. Does that clarify? No, it, it made sense to me all okay. along. It's funny, but I mean, if you just look at the raw numbers, right, it appears as though somehow $3 million to $4 million was magically found, and which wasn't the case. So, no, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Well, again, just want to express my appreciation for all the work we all do for people in our community and for the presentation that you've brought forward here today. Um, just I share a lot of the feelings with some of the folks who spoke earlier about, you know, how much more how many more services we need to provide for people um, who are experiencing or low income experiencing, you know, mental health distress in our community. And I think collectively we're trying to do the best we can to do just that. Um, and it is sad to see that some of the decisions being made at the state level that result in, you know, reduction in funds that we're receiving to provide these services also significantly impact our ability to match those funds to actually further maximize that funding. And so, um, I think it's important that we're continuing to share these impacts with our state and federal uh, representatives so that they understand how the decisions they're making impact us. Um, with that being said, I did have, well, actually, I also want to express appreciation for all the work that you all have done to leverage funding, and in particular with the um, 12 million for 24 7 mental health crisis response. I know that's something that for years now we've been hearing a lot of folks want to see those programs continue and expand, and it's just going to be great that we'll see that roll out this summer. I did have a question around the opioid funds. Um, I met with some um, veteran homeless service providers about a week ago. And um, one of them had been in Indiana and was mentioning that some of the folks out there were using the opioid settlement fundings for housing. And so I'm just wondering if there's opportunities here because, you know, for people who are homeless or experiencing substance use disorder, the opioid substance use disorder in particular, you know, getting them off the streets and into housing is oftentimes something that could help stabilize them. And so I'm just wondering if there's opportunities for those funds to be used to help um, whether it's with, you know, housing them in some of our homeless programs or what have you, but if there's any opportunity for those funds to go towards those efforts. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at the criteria that, again, we have to follow the state criteria for the dollars, um, there is a bucket there for capital infrastructure. So there's a couple of ways um, that we're trying to get the dollars out quickly. Um, we have... Uh, 
created, as you guys recall, I came to the board probably, I, don't, I can't recall right now, so somewhere in March or February to discuss with you the opioid settlement dollars. But at that point, I discussed with you that we were going to launch our community grants. Um, that's about $850,000, probably a little bit more than that, that will actually go through community grants. And we're looking for innovative ways for our community to use those dollars. That's an opportunity. The other way is that we also have um, set aside 25% of the funding. So right now we're talking about $2 million or so to also go into capital projects. We wanted to release the community grants as quickly as possible. So that RFP has launched. It's going through the Community Foundation. Our second phase is to also look at the 25%, um, figure out, again, these projects are very expensive. So it's basically pennies that you're talking compared to what it takes 25 million to $30 million. And we're trying to analyze what is the current need? What type of treatment, for example, would be needed um, in our community? We're also assessing the current investments that we're making for, uh, with the youth crisis, with the 34 shelters, and kind of combining and doing um, a landscape of what would be needed. And then thinking about launching the RFP for a capital project of some sort, or leveraging it, obviously, with an existing potential grant that we might get. So. We want to also monitor what the state is doing with the dollars I just shared with you to see how they're going to roll out a reduction or a full pause and when the best time is to actually leverage the money. Great, thank you. Um, the next question I have, it might be my last one, um, but I'm just wondering, and I want to appreciate the conversations that have been had around SB 43, but just knowing that this is going to be coming pretty quickly and impacting the county, it sounds like it's going to be a fairly expensive program. I'm just wondering, you know, what what's happening around allocating funding towards that um, during this budget cycle or in future cycles, because it sounds like if it's a 14 to... I'm sorry, my, my apologies, but if it sounds like it's a significant investment that we're going to need to make, it seems like we might be better off trying to start putting a, a little bit aside now rather than having to have all that come all at once. And so I'm just wondering um, what proposals there are for funding being allocated towards that during this budget. So our departments have been meeting with uh, the public defender's office, with the H's, as we call ourselves, to, uh, and other folks to really just get a sense of what the impact is. So as I mentioned to you, and it's also in the report, we're estimating about 800 individuals that might fit the new criteria. Um, with that, just based on what we know, and we're trying to really, you know, get a, a better sense, it would be about $20 million. Um, there's a couple ways to approach this, right? How and the right now, the fact that we're also implementing the CARE Act, are there opportunities to also think about the partnerships that we're building, the systems that we're putting in place so they can talk to each other, the referral process, right? The case management process, um, how we think about CalAIM and leveraging some of those uh, billable services as well. Um, and then really trying to kind of not just be a set alone SB 43 effort, but a continuum of care in the system that we're trying to design with all of the different movie parts that we have going on right now. We have been meeting, uh, but again, you know, without any funding and the fact that we have CARE Act right now, um, and we don't have to implement it right until further out. So we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on it as we're putting all these pieces together, reviewing what's required and seeing if any of those pieces can actually also be built as we're implementing all these other factors as well. Right. And I, I guess the one thing I'd add to that is, um, I know during, um, Mr. Pimentel's presentation, there was discussion about, you know, have, how we have these unfunded mandates and trying to work with other counties to see how we can leverage our funds collectively. If there's an opportunity for us to, you know, work with other counties and see how it's being implemented in other parts of the state, you know, I think it's just, you know, trying to use all the resources to our advantage to try to get these unfunded mandates implemented. So, so there's two counties um, in the state, SLO and San Francisco, that were um, working to set up meetings, learning from what they're doing. So there's, there, I hear you and <laughs> there's the limitation. I will also say that, um, you know, it's a little bit, because we don't have new funding, you can't set money aside, right? 
So the way we're trying to think about it is how do we maximize reimbursement for these services? And as they're being implemented, are there opportunities with, you know, um, enhanced case management, community supports, all brought through the aim. Um, so that that's where it gets really tricky for us and why we keep emphasizing an unfunded mandate for us does hinder our, our ability to move quickly on establishing a design when we have to think creatively about the, uh, maximizing in, uh, existing infrastructure to do that with no dollars. Great. And, and I'll just, you know, again, I think it'll be interesting to see how this Cal AIM reimbursement program works out. And since we're going to get a good preview of it as it relates to care courts and some of the other services we provide, it'll help inform the SB 43 rollout as well. So, so thank you all for your hard work. Thank you for your presentations. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to, it seems like Supervisor Hernandez might have a question. Or... Yeah, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, in times of, you know, budget deficit, you know, budget crisis, that we still hold um, the lens of equity to our budget as well. Um, you talked about systems that we're putting in place, and I'm not sure if that means, you know, software that can look at this, but I think, you know, looking at the demographics of where the funds go is going to be important to make critical decisions uh, in the lens of equity. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Are we going to go out to the public now? Should I just... No, we've already gone to the public. So well, if you would like to move the staff recommendation uh, yes. for the budget. I will move the staff recommendation for. Okay. So a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, seconded by Supervisor McPherson to move the staff budget recommendation for the Health Services Agency for Santa Cruz County. If there's no further questions or comments. I'll turn it over to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and Cummings. Aye. The passage unanimously. So um, given that we're on the topic of health and human services and health and well-being, we are going to take a we're going to come back at one and so we're going to take a lunch break. We'll come back at one and we'll have the health service or the human services department presentation at one o'clock recording st first 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. The next item on our budget uh, presentation agenda is item number eight, consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for the Human Services Department, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director of um, Human Services Department, uh, Randy Morris. Um, thank you and good afternoon, Chair Cummings, members of the board, and those uh, watching. Uh, as stated, I'm Randy Morris, the Director of Human Services. I am joined by our Deputy Director, Kimberly Peterson, and I'm also joined by Trish Daniels, who's our Director of Administrative Services, where our fiscal office lives. And I do want to take a minute to say thank you to Trish and our budget team, as well as the CAO's budget team, who works lock and step with our department's budget team to bring this uh, proposed 24-25 budget to your board for consideration. I want to highlight that we, like the healthcare agency, bring forward 85 to 90%, depending on the program, of federal and state funding for what we are asking of you for local general fund match. And I do want to take the opportunity, particularly mindful of all the public comment this morning, understandably so, with concerns about cuts that our budget is predominantly driven by decisions that get made at the state. So we are in front of you with a proposed budget and what you will hear is all pending what comes of the state budget. 
when the state budget is adopted, and it was discussed in some detail this morning, it'll play all the way through trailer bills in July, probably in August, we'll be in a much better position to share with you what um, our budget looks like next fiscal year. And I do feel responsible to share with you and as a shout out and thank you to our budget team who has been burning the midnight oil for the last three days, literally as of lunch hour, just looking like we are trending towards an $8 million reduction in our revenue. If the current proposed cuts hold, that will cause us to come back to you in August to effectuate those cuts. And I just feel responsible to share that because mindful of all the advocacy this morning to ask your board to direct us to do more and cut, stop cuts. If any such direction is given, we will not only have to come back to adjust by 8 million or more if they hold, but we'll also have to cut anything we're directed to add to the budget. So it's an awkward time for us. We want to do and support everything the community brought forward. We just are at risk of losing a lot of revenue if the state but budget cuts hold. So that is the somber reality of what has us in front of you today. And with that, if the clerk or the board could pull up the PowerPoint, because I want to start with something to calibrate that uh, doom and gloom, which is um, on the PowerPoint. There is a picture for the first time ever um, in county in this county and in human services that as of yesterday, we opened our new public lobby at 500 Westridge in Watsonville. And this is the picture of the signage entering into the parking lot. And Kimberly and Trish and I spent all afternoon yesterday walking through the lobby. It is such a comfortable and warm and welcoming environment, not very government, big, airy, open area. And um, it was just really a pleasure to see the work um, that your board effectuated years ago, our CAO's office, to help make sure the South County, which for human service was all in leased facilities, is now in a government-owned building and residents of South County can come not only for human services, but a whole host of other services. And that picture is here on purpose as we begin um, our budget presentation. Um, so like this morning, um, we will be going through a, a series of um, uh, materials that we want to present to you. I'm going to walk a little bit through our organizational structure and some of our accomplishments and successes. I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly and Trish. We'll walk through in a little more detail some of what is in front of you. Again, mindful that will likely change if there are cuts at the state level. And then I will come back to close it out. Speaking about the proposed uh, cuts from the state in a little more detail and also some future considerations that we're tracking. Um, to start with, I want to appreciate the mission and motto of the Human Services Department, we in partnership with healthcare are often considered the county uh, safety net. Uh, together, uh, we're half of the county and uh, almost half of the budget. And our mission is to strengthen the community by protecting vulnerable, uh, promoting self-sufficiency, alleviating poverty, and improving quality of life for all. And I do wanna highlight our motto, which is dedicated to making a difference. And I think, and if I can, um, borrow Supervisor Hernandez's words earlier this morning, um, equity has to play out when we're looking at cuts. It's not just when we have opportunity to expand services, when we have to make choices about cuts, we have to lean into that dedication to make sure the difference we make, even if we're cutting here and there is equitable and uh, relevant to the work we need to do in our community. This is uh, the organizational structure of the Human Services Department. Um, I sit as the director, Kimberly is the deputy director. We have six divisions. Um, if you allow me an analogy, which helps me think of kind of what this looks like, most people in the community know human services through the four direct services divisions. That's what people see. So if you use the analogy of the car, that's what's visible when people are driving on the road. We have the public child welfare division, the aging and disability programs and ALTC. We have all our self-sufficiency and employment programs and the acronym EBSD. And then the division that's newest uh, as of three and a half years ago, the Housing for Health division that has us in front of you every six months. Those divisions do not function without, without what I'm going to call the engine. And that is all the administrative infrastructure of our department without an effective engine. And our engine was undersized with everything that has come forward. And you heard a lot about that from health this morning, the need to sort of right size and have enough infrastructure to some move the work forward. So again, deep appreciation. This is one of the reasons we have Trish here to really speak to all the work the fiscal team and more are doing to help make sure these services work and make sense. I'm going to say a little bit about achievements. Not easy to pick uh, given the many, many things we do, but we wanted to highlight one from at least one from each of our four direct services divisions and want your board to be aware um, and the community to be aware. We provide services to approximately one third 
of residents in Santa Cruz County, predominantly through our largest program, Medi-Cal, which at the peak reached just shy of 94,000 people in Santa Cruz County on Medi-Cal. I'll say more about that in a moment. I also want to make comment, um, piggybacking on the 500 Westridge picture at the front, the comments about equity, about 48% of residents of South County get a service from Human Services. And if you look at our self-sufficiency caseload, Medi-Cal and CalFresh, about two-thirds of that caseload is South County. So I think all of this speaks to, as we have to pick and choose what to do with a budget that is projected to be reduced, we are predominantly being called by the programs we run to serve South County um, more than the rest of the county. So that's a balancing act, but I feel like it's important to raise that to Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is a federal program called Medicaid at the federal level. Uh, California calls it Medi-Cal. Um, as I said, about 94,000 people were enrolled at the peak, and that was because for three years under the public health emergency, the federal and state government waived all responsibilities for anybody enrolled in the program to have to do a yearly renewal. So everybody stayed on for three years. The state and federal government was very nervous about people losing health coverage and defaulting into no health care. People don't seek preventative care. And then they have very expensive costs that sometimes can bankrupt people literally. So we are pleased to report that we were above and at state averages and California is above national trends of retaining 85% people in Medi-Cal and the majority of people who are moving off Medi-Cal in that three year period actually had other health coverage. So we feel proud of this and I particularly wanna thank our staff in the EBSD division and all of our benefit reps and the clerical support who at high vacancy rates with lots of demands did this work to help make sure people stayed on their Medi-Cal, so thank you. Second, also really important, a California action that really um, has been a help to this community in particular, and that is California in age cohorts made undocumented immigrants eligible for public health coverage. The federal government doesn't pay their share. This is a state cost that they've made all Californians who are undocumented immigrants eligible for Medi-Cal. And we do a lot of partnership with community-based organizations and our staff have successfully enrolled 7,000 undocumented immigrants onto Medi-Cal. They now have access to health care and preventative services that they did not prior. Next accomplishment, um, this is an action that your board has taken to support what the governor has taken as an executive order years ago to recognize that we are an aging country. Uh, the United States of America by calendar year 2030, one in five are gonna be over the age of 60. California, that number is one in four. And in Santa Cruz County, that number is one in three. We are one of the um, most quickly aging communities in California and in the country. So what are we doing in master plan for aging? We initiated a comprehensive survey in this community, and this is already dated information because we are counting, tallying the, uh, the survey results that have come in, and it's actually already over 3,200. Why? This is an equity statement. Most people who respond to surveys tend to be white and middle class. And we intentionally, with your board support, got a contract to work with community providers and a consultant to make sure that we targeted our surveys to get the voices normally not heard. So the numbers that are growing are about 600 hand surveys that were done often monolingual in Spanish to make sure that the survey results actually are representative of our community. What's survey good for? Well, it helps level set the issues. It helps us look where we are not applying collective impact. It helps us work in partnership with cities and nonprofits, and it helps us together advocate with the state because many communities are going through these surveys, how and where to apply for new money to help address the gaps in our community. So we're very proud of the work and we'll back in front of your board for that next year. In our child welfare division, mindful I'm looking at um, as a father myself, many fathers up here on the dais, um, in our child welfare division and also in many of our self-sufficiency programs, demographically throughout the country, many of these programs predominantly serve mothers, often single mothers, but some of these programs have become very mother-centric and don't pay attention to the needs of fathers, sometimes single fathers or just fathers, period. So we established a fatherhood advisory council in our child welfare division, a great partnership with community-based organizations, public partners, and lived experience voice through one community-based organization contract who are working to look through how we can make sure our services are supportive of fathers in the community whose families touch our child welfare system. 
And then finally, I want to recognize the division that has us in front of you the most, our Housing for Health division. There's been a lot of negative media, understandably, because our state has put out a lot of money. It's been disparate all over the place. So just because you secure money doesn't mean it results in outcomes. But we secured in this last fiscal year $6 million of additional housing funds. And that is doesn't even account for what healthcare mentioned earlier today, where we partner with them on programs that they're running. But of these $6 million, these are projected to help about 140 households through a host of programs that are all these one-off grants from different places. And we will continue to report to your board about that. But I'm proud that in the complicated times, we're still finding a way to bring money to this community. And then finally, as I said at the beginning, we've moved into the Westridge facility. Thank you to the count, to the board and, board, and to the leadership of this county to uh, create this opportunity that we're just starting to um, enjoy. I will now turn it over to Kimberly, who will start to speak about some of the details of the budget. Good afternoon, board. Uh, so here you can overall summary of our budget request. It's largely a status quo budget. And what you're seeing is that uh, many of our expenditures are tied to revenue. So the decreases that you see here are connected to one-time funds for projects such as uh, Project Home Key. The slight increases that you see in the general fund, and I'm looking over at the far right column that says change. The slight increase in general fund is largely due to salary and benefit increases. Next slide, thank you. So for our primary budget goals, working within our exist our budget, we are mostly driven by four interrelated goals that support our mission and strategic priorities. And we continue to second center equity in the process. We want to um, intentionally prioritize populations and areas where there's been systemic disparities. We have collaboration, administrative infrastructure, housing, housing for health stability, and workforce. Through internal collaboration within our divisions, external collaboration with other departments, other, other general uh, government jurisdictions, community-based org and community-based organizations, and through continuous improvements to our administrative infrastructure, our department can continue to carry out services more effectively and improve housing for health stability. An example of this is how we are collaborating with health, probation, and the sheriff to implement CalAIM, which will not only increase access to Medi-Cal to traditionally underserved populations, but will also provide funding opportunities for Housing for Health Division. For our workforce, we have worked with personnel to successfully diversify our outreach and hiring efforts. So we have a wide pool of qualified candidates, including people representative of the community we serve. And we have created opportunities for our existing employees to grow and promote from within. We are not requesting any new positions on our budget, but we are requesting a couple of reclassifications. We're requesting to reclassify a benefit representative position to a benefit representative supervisor. This will allow us to embed a benefit representative supervisor into the training classes, which are nine months in duration. This will create a more consistent integrated support for those training classes. And the benefit representative class is one of the largest ones within our department, as Randy mentioned earlier. They're the ones that do eligibility, Medi-Cal, CalFresh, and CalWorks. Many of you have seen the graphic maze of housing for health funding. So the other reclassification we are asking for is to reclass the social worker position that is vacant into an analyst position. And that will be dedicated to um, grants management to secure funding and ensure that our grants um, are used, um, get gotten out the door as quickly as possible. <laughs> Lastly, we have a few positions in housing for health and our administrative services uh, for which we have ongoing funding into this next year. And so we'd like to extend those. Collectively, these requests will sta help stabilize and strengthen our training programs, move housing funding into the community for projects, and also help to leverage technology. And I will turn it over to Trish. Uh, 
Thank you, Kimberly. Trish Daniels, Director of Admin Services for the Human Services Department. Um, I do want to talk about revenues. As Randy stated in his opening remarks, the budget that's being presented for you today was prepared in January, so it does not reflect any of the proposed budget impacts that have resulted from the May revise. Um, Randy will continue to touch on those impacts in just a few minutes. Um, just similar to health, the bulk of our funds do come from federal and state uh, sources. For the most part, and in most years, they can be relatively stable. This year is um, absolutely a little bit of an uh, anomaly. And so we are in the midst of actually analyzing those impacts to, um, from the May revise to see what that means for our department. Um, we are also seeing a number of growing unfunded mandates, mainly in the areas of homeless services, mass care and shelter, and also SB 43, which Health and Randy will both speak to a little bit later. Next, I want to talk about where the money goes. So employee and salary benefits shown in the little blue bar, and we're really looking at that last blue bar over on the right for the 24-25 proposed budget. Um, that represents our salary and benefit costs, and it's about 45% of our total expenses. Uh, the next largest expense is the rust color. Um, that's uh, in budget speak, it's called other charges, but for us, that really, it's it's our entitlements, our categorical aid, and what that is, is those are cash payments to recipients that are eligible for programs, such as CalWORKs, foster care, adoptions, and in-home supportive services providers. Also notable is the white bar, which um, is services and supplies, and that includes the largest bulk of our contracted services with our community partners. Uh, we have about 14 million in the social services division and 13 million in the housing for health divisions, so about $27 million in contracts. Uh, this pie chart just simply shows that same information, but simply presented by budget divisions as shown in the online budget website. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about our funded staffing. Um, as Kimberly stated, we are not requesting any new positions. Um, and while our hiring challenges do still exist, our vacancy rates are improving. Um, the highest percentage of our employees are the benefit representative classification. In 23-24, we held two training classes, which resulted in 53 new benefit reps. Um, and the intention going forward is to hold at least two training classes per year. As Kimberly says, it's nine months, so they'll be staggered a little bit, but we should be able to um, complete two new classes each year. Um, in partnership with the personnel department, we have also created additional career pathways for HSD staff to allow them to promote within the human services department. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Randy. All right, so this is where I um, just have two more slides left. I'm gonna give a summary of what happened in the Jan, and just as a reminder, or to people in the community who don't know this, um, we are predominantly driven by the state budget. A big part of our money is federal money, but that's pretty stable, unless there's major changes, which I'll get to in a moment. There could be, depending on the election upcoming. So the state of California, the governor always releases a budget in January, and I'm just gonna summarize what's on the slide here. The th there was many, many proposed cuts, and those included a number of what's called deferrals of housing dollars that had been rolled over and the same amount of money was available each year, but instead the state said, we're looking at such a difficult horizon, we're gonna take the money we currently have and we're just gonna, whatever you haven't spent, defer it and spread it out into the year upcoming. CalWORKs, this was mentioned earlier, a number of our employees came forward. Um, in CalWORKs alone, we are looking at approximately $7 million of proposed reductions, including the entire elimination of that unit. And I'm going to say a little bit more about it and what happened in May. And then there was a handful of child welfare programs, um, small programs, but they were meaningful programs that were proposed to be cut. Unusual in my tenure, but not when the state's looking at this big of a deficit. Then in May, when the governor releases the May revise, often what happens is the state legislature and coalitions and advocates in the safety net fight really hard to restore proposed cuts in January. And then we see a May revise that restores some of those cuts. Unfortunately, this year, not a single cut was proposed to be restored. And there was a growing list of additional cuts. Those additional cuts include the housing programs that were proposed to be deferred are proposed to be deferred and entirely eliminated. So the governor 
has been creating a narrative through lots of press releases that I have put enough money out there. Now it's local accountability, and he doubled down on that in his uh, press conference he held, why he justified eliminating some of these programs, because I, the state, have given enough money. Now it's up to you to do something with it. We disagree. But those are all proposed to be eliminated. How works? And back to the comments earlier this morning, and um, Chair Cummings, your comment. Almost $7 million of addition totaled additional CalWORKs cuts. So the reference from our own employees saying, please find another funding stream within CalWORKs. That program is only a million dollars. There are 6 million additional dollars on top of that are proposed to be cuts, a big chunk of which were in the May revise. So if all those cuts hold, we have no there there to go back to. We're cutting not only sort of workforce, which we'll get to that unit, but also a number of other things, including contracts and our basic core allocation, which could impact future hiring. And then sadly, Given the master plan for aging, our big aging programs, adult protective services and in-home supportive services that were not proposed for any cuts in January were added to the list in May, entirely eliminating the training budget for the APS program, reducing the allocations to the APS program, eliminating some meaningful um, funding streams for IHSS and the complete elimination of undocumented immigrants newly eligible for Medi-Cal being eligible for IHSS. So all of that was proposed to be eliminated in the May revise. Hence, our worry about and our prediction that unless there's some miracle that happens, we are going to be back in front of you to amend our budget by millions of dollars um, in August. So next slide. So this is my next to final slide just to say, so what are we looking at? The state budget I have just spoken to, this is in my tenure here, this is my fifth budget presentation as your human service director. This is the one I am most staring at what is going to happen with the state budget because it is likely going to cause um, a lot of, of activity that we have to come back to you in August after the trailer bills resolve. Next, uh, the presidential election. Um, we are staring at a complicated election coming up. If the former president becomes the new president and the Senate, which is currently controlled by Democrats by a swing vote of the vice president, also flips, many of the entitlement programs that we run could be at risk. And usually those have been stable over the last many years with some balance between president and Senate. Um, so that could be a significant issue for those of us who work in health and human services. So we just need to see how that election plays out. We've talked plenty about housing and homelessness. Um, I would say as somebody who's worked in the safety net for over 30 years, but only three and a half years over a homeless office, um, I have never seen so much political rhetoric disconnected from reality of the policies and the funding. It is just ripe for finger pointing. And sadly, um, our governor, I think, is becoming in the last year probably the primary author of the finger pointing, saying it's local accountability. I would welcome him to come look at our books. We feel very confident we are using this disparate funding streams the best we can. We are, are making progress. And quite contrary to some of his comments that he actually funds success because we had an increase, uh, decrease in our point in time count, we lost funding. So the irony that he's out with his rhetoric that I reward success and we are successful when he cut our funding is an irony and a frustration about state rhetoric. Rapidly aging population, I already said that earlier, we are not well prepared in the safety net, um, particularly as more and more people become housing insecure. And this is an issue that is going to take the best of us, city, county, and nonprofit to work together and not be tempted to fight, which often happens when scarcity models get pressured. And I'm worried that that's going to be what's coming, but we need to work closely together to come together because we can't afford to be um, nickel and diming over the edges when we have such a big aging uh, trend coming in front of us. Um, second to last, SB, to last, SB 43, um, I want to recognize that this is predominantly falling on the healthcare agency who is responsible to manage the safety net of uh, mental health and substance use services. But I do want to recognize your board approved an action three years ago that moved the public conservator office from health to my office. That sits in my ALTC division, and we are responsible to file petitions when SB 43 goes live and there are more people eligible and they make referrals, they come to my department and we do not have enough staff. So we have to increase our staffing to manage the volume of increased referrals if FB 43 goes forward in addition to Public Defender County Council and Health. And then last is disaster response. We are fortunate to be sitting here um, in a different moment than we were a year ago after three months of biblical level floods and recovery efforts still going on. We had a lighter winter. 
But we, if you don't know, I want to lift up, we are mandated by state statute, county health uh, human service agencies to stand up mass care and shelter, and we have no funding to do it. It was no problem for about 25 years when we about every six or seven years had to do it once in a while. Now we've been doing it multiple times a year. You heard our healthcare colleagues, they have to have a medical group that stands up and stops their work. We have to stand up a whole group of people. And we also have state and federal mandates to serve those people on our caseloads in the disaster on top of the EOC, on top of actually standing up the shelters in partnership with others. So this is a huge unfunded mandate. That's a new normal we have to deal with. And this brings us to the closing slide which is the formal ask. It's articulated in the printed materials, but just to summarize, we're requesting your board to take action to vote on the revenues, expenses, the general fund, which draws those federal and state revenues and the status quo staffing. Mindful to end where I started, um, we predict we will be back to having to adjust the budget um, and amend it with reductions, depending on what happens with the state budget. And with that, I turn it back to your board for any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, what um, I'm going to do at this point is we'll open it up to see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, and then we'll bring it back for questions, comments, actions. And so with that, uh, I'll see if anybody here in chambers would like to speak to us on the help of the Human Services Department's uh, budget. Okay, seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's any members of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item. No speakers online, Chair. Okay, with that, we will bring it back to the board for any questions or comments before taking any action. And so I'll start with Supervisor Friend. I think. Oh. Yeah, a couple people just put their hands oh, up Oh, okay, here, never so mind. We'll go back to the public comment then. All right. Karina, your microphone's now available. Hi, Karina Moreno, uh, calling in from District 4 and... I am going to go on record for the very first time and admit that I made a mistake <laughs> and I apologize. Thank you, Randy, for that presentation. Um, but it's the human services where I know at least 70% of the people from Watsonville use these services and the human services department as a whole. I appreciate you guys for this presentation and the work and, and just the really good breakdown. But acknowledging that this is the lifeline for a lot of people in this county who are dependent on these housing services in one, either the first or second most expensive county in the nation, right? To get healthy or just, just get food access. Um, and I thank you guys because I don't know what the future holds. And I, I know I have the honor of sitting on the Human Services Commission and I look forward to supporting in the future any which way I can. But being someone who has been in this um, sector, in the nonprofit sector, and just seen it from all angles, personally, professionally. Um, I appreciate everything you guys are doing, and I look forward to supporting, and I just ask the board, you know, to also support in any which way that you can. But thank you. Pam, your microphone's now available. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Pam Sexton here, and I'm calling in from Watsonville. And I I want to just start by um I I would have liked to have joined more of the meeting um and the topics this morning, but was unable to because of work. And just to to highlight a request um to for budget hearings, I think a lot of people in the county would like to participate more, but the times that you have these are not um, conducive to to public participation. And and I I also want to thank thank the presenters, um, thank like thank you all for all this information. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that maybe next year we could get. Um, get the reports earlier so that the public can um, can make comments earlier. And and also if if it'd be possible to have meetings where it's not just our two minute input, but where there could be conversation. And finally, um, on this issue of the human services, I um, at Watson Mills Farmers Market over the weekend they had or on Friday at Farmer's Market, 
um, adult services was there. It was so wonderful to to have them out there. And as Karina just said, these services are so, so critical. Um, all of the services in the human um, human services, but especially the housing and disaster response. Um, I also work with Regeneración, Pajaro Valley Climate Action, and this, we're going to need these winter shelters. Um, please, these, this is a small amount of the budget, a, a small investment that would go huge to supporting our um, county's needs. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions or comments from uh, supervisors. And then I'll, when I make my comments, I'm actually going to circle back to some of the questions that were asked earlier by community members. But I'll turn it over to Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, in a very sobering presentation, I don't think that there's a lot of flexibility for uh, change here because this is one of those. Um, one of those Jenga departments that if you pull out one piece, you're going to end up hurting a lot of other things you didn't want to want to hurt. And so I'd be very cautious about anything, any changes. I, I appreciate that um, your commentary about coming back in August post the state budget. But I will say this, that no matter what the state does, there's not going to be an expansion of anything you're doing. So we should also set that baseline expectation that the question is the degree of the cuts, the severity of the cuts, not the programmatic growth in either your or the health space. Um, but again, I think that um, even the staff recommendations, including, I mean, one that could actually help grow some of the revenue over time are very important that you're making. And, and so it's, it's very modest and, and reasonable. Your work, the team's work, and I recognize that a lot of it is outward facing to the community, not necessarily inward facing to the county infrastructure. Um, it is so, I mean, that's what counties do. I mean, at the end of the day, what counties really do are, are, are safety net services, rural programs with safety net services. And so this is the majority of what we do. And uh, your agency does it exceedingly well. And, and you know, post the growth from Obamacare to today has seen a significant new set of responsibilities that were never put on your shoulders before and uh, without ongoing funding, of course, just like in the health space. And I think your, your team's doing a very fine job doing it. Um, I wish this, there was a different budget in my last year. Um, I wish that we were expanding things. Uh, it's hard to say that we're leaving it better for the community or future generations when, when this is what's being presented in front of us. I think that uh, we should recognize that um, state too, by the way. But anyway, I appreciate your team. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. I, I just uh, I don't think that we really are going to be in the expansion mode of of adding things on. I don't think it'd be very responsible. Thanks, yep. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Morrison. Team. Um, so I think you were right to begin the presentation with that photo of 500 Westridge because, I mean, as you said, so many of our South County residents are dependent on human services. Um, so it's great to have um, a permanent home down there. Um, also, just want to congratulate you on the hiring of 53 new benefit reps this past year. That's huge and will obviously bring uh, a lot of money into our community in the form of uh, state and federal benefits for, uh, for our residents. Um, we heard a lot about how it works family stabilization this morning. I think I heard you say that we're looking about seven or eight million in total cuts in CalWORKs, a million of which is that particular program. Is, did I hear that right? Yeah, and I want to put a caveat mindful of how excellent our uh, fiscal team is, who probably has an Excel spreadsheet with the exact numbers I'm not tracking, but it's, I think, slightly above $1 million that funds the family stabilization unit, which is six, uh, I believe, six social workers and a supervisor, I think three and the supervisor spoke this morning, have been doing a wonderful job advocating and at the state, by the way, so I don't recognize their spirit, fire in the belly. What they may not be aware of is when the May revise came out, on top of that one plus million, the grand total of the preliminary uh, review is that there's about $7 million in CalWORKs cuts. So when they made the reference, they've made it publicly, they wrote the letter, a lot of people made it to some counties, like Santa Cruz did run this program before the state funded it. But that came from 
the six million dollars that's also being proposed to cut. So we are in multiple scenarios right now of trying to figure out what, 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 and really not shying away from doubling down on advocating with the legislature, because that is not a big amount of money. And I agree with the staff who spoke. It's a very meaningful program. But if we lose that funding stream and the state doesn't restore that cut and we have those other six million dollars to cut and, 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 and. We're going to have to cut something else to find the money to pay for that because we have no cushion. Mm -hmm. And that other six million is food assistance? Uh, right no, now? it's CalWORKS. Well, On okay. top of that, I said seven million, about eight million total. We're still calculating the APS cuts, the IHSS cuts, the child welfare. I just wanted to focus because we knew there was so much attention on poverty and CalWORKS. So it's looking like eight plus million and trending. We're doing the analysis as we speak. Seven million of which is CalWORKS, one million of which is that unit. Okay. Um, and the other top program you talked about seeing significant cuts was housing programs. Uh, that's when we say housing programs, big general term. We're talking about health, uh, housing for health. Yeah, so program. let me break that down. Um, with the shift of the um, what was homeless office in the CEO within um, human services, we then blended together. And this is where I'm going to break bifurcate a number of grants that you hear Dr. Ratner and I up in front of you, the maze and a couple of state department of social services grants that come through all human services in all counties to help support housing and homelessness in APS, child welfare, and CalWORKs. Those three programs are all set to be eliminated on top of a handful of others, like because our point in time count went down, we lost, I think it was a million dollars of revenue. So we are entirely losing the CDSS housing and homeless grants that help those particular programs help people stay in and return to housing all but eliminated, and some others, which, as your board knows, are all one-time grants that are likely going to be expiring in the next one to two to three years. Right. Um, you also talked about the unfunded mandate for providing mass care and shelter. I think there's a little bit of uh, money in this budget for winter shelter, but... There's it, not. Not even that. Okay. No. I can speak to that if you'd like, if that, well, but I don't want to interrupt you, but I just, I yeah. wasn't clear about that's actually not in our proposed budget. So I'm assuming if there's no winter shelter in the budget, then other mass care and shelter that we would have to stand up in case of emergency would come from contingency. Yeah, let me, I'm happy to speak to that. In terms of the severe weather shelter stand up that we started last year, there is a portion, the county's portion for the unincorporated area is being carried in the OR3 budget. So there are funds for severe weather shelter that's different than evacuation shelter. Shelters. So that is that is in the OR3 budget. And we would be working with Santa Cruz and Watsonville again to see if we can build that partnership like we did last year. And, and I appreciate the clarification because last year it was held in our budget with Housing for Health. OR3, we're toggling back and forth. So Human Services doesn't hold that. We had the revenue stream from underspending last year, which we don't have anymore because we're looking at cuts. So appreciate Ms. Benson clarifying that's in the OR3 budget. Okay. Um, and is there any area where you're looking at significant vacancies, unfilled positions? Well, let, let's Kimberly and Trish talk broadly, but we are very proud of, and actually, if I just take a moment to the, all of the benefit reps who are here today and the union that represents them, I don't know how, I just want to take this minute, I don't know how we continue to get so many positive customer service surveys from people. We do surveys all the time. And the stress that group has been under with long wait times and log lobby times and people stressed out because they're mad. I, I just don't, I am just so proud of how our staff have held it together and still provide customer service. Those vacancy rates are improving dramatically because of those big hiring classes. And I think if I looked correctly, we're only a couple percent above vacancy rates as we were about four years ago. We had the great quit and the pandemic and a lot of people retired but we are trending up on the benefit reps. And the same thing happened with analysts and social workers. Everything's trending back. We're still not back to normal, but we're trending back. But I'll turn it to Kimberly and Trish for more details. Yeah, uh, for reference, I think about, uh, I'll speak mostly to the benefit representatives and social worker classifications. That's the, those are the ones that last year, I think there were great vacancies. Uh, I think last year there were around 17 uh, social worker vacancies. There's just, there's a handful now, maybe five. And with the um, benefit representatives, you know, there's a class of 30 um, in right now. I think we had uh, 25 vacancies not that long ago. We are down over the last number of months. We just have 12 vacancies currently. 
So it's we are doing much, much better than we were before. And that is large in large part, I would say, because of the partnership with um, personnel and how we've shifted up, how we've um, done hiring recruit and recruitment and also created opportunities for existing staff to promote into new positions where they've got additional growth. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you. That is uh, certainly a bright spot. So. Oh, I was just going to add, um, so overall, when the budget was prepared, our vacancy rate um, was 9.44%. When we were before you last year at budget hearings, we had about an 11% vacancy rate. So we are seeing some very small, modest improvements in our vacancy rates. Great. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, um, I just want to say, as much as I did health services uh, for the support we get from the state, I'm thankful, but I'm scared to death right now, too. But uh, uh, this, just the spectrum of services that the uh, Human Services Department uh, provide is really impressive and, and really uh, inspiring at that. Uh, we spend so much time um, talking about community-based organizations providing safety and services, to the most vulnerable and uh, we're very thankful for what they do and how you're you working with them to make sure we get the services out that people need in santa cruz county but i think we should um you know the the county itself provides the largest safety net of services and uh that can't be overstated of what you're doing and what you said some real trying situations um and not, not all those fun uh, those those are funded by the state, of course, um, but the county, I think, contributes about $25 million. Is that about right um, to, of our general fund money to make uh, sure the safety net stays in place? Yes, we we utilize our, uh, it's $26 million this year or for 24-25, and that is utilized to leverage. Um, there's local matches that are required, um, but also for every dollar that we spend, we will bring in, you know, another dollar on top of that. Got it. Okay. Yes, McPherson, I'm just having gone through this, if this is of help, about that 26 million translates to about 11-ish percent of our budget and about 9% of that other percent is mandated by the federal and state government that local counties must put that general fund in to draw that federal and state. And on the fringes is actually core, which lives in not this budget, but our overall budget. It's the only discretionary money that's completely up to your discretion and the city council behind it. And then little bits and pieces that fund some unfunded mandates like the public guardian office and veteran service office. So I just wanted to tell you, we are almost predominantly federal and state regulated mandated right. and then general fund right. matches that very little discretion right. of that general fund that Trish just listed. Yeah. Well, I just can't tell you how much I think uh, and appreciative of the Human Services Department, what you do with what you have. And uh, the uncertainty today uh, that we're, you're experiencing is uh, really troublesome, but uh, I, I hope that um, we're gonna come back for the final budget on June 4th here. And of course, the, the deadline is June 15th, which the leg state legislature usually goes right up to there. I, I just hope we can get an answer or have a good clear picture of what we're dealing with uh, by June 4th. Uh, that'll help everyone I know. And thank you very much for working with what you have so well. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. So I got this kind of same questions and statements for as that I had before, but you know, I want this budget that make sure that we look at this budget through the lens of equity and, but it's difficult to, know what that is because there's no numbers behind it sometimes in terms of demographically where these funds are spent. And so if in future budgets, we can look at that more precisely, uh, uh, that would be really good, uh, especially when it comes time to making decisions about guts, right? Or you have to work on these type of uh, budget issues. Uh, secondly, there are some folks that came uh, during public comment, and I just kind of wanted to address that, have you addressed it as well. But, you know, I think that also during, you know, pending budget cuts, it's important that we keep people housed and, you know, not add, not adding to the homelessness issue that we already have. Um, are we going to be making sure that we do, you know, address these issues that, you know, COPA was talking about and Community Bridges was talking about? Uh, making sure that we don't, making sure we keep people housed. Uh, 
Um, I want to confirm I'm hearing that as a very broad question and I broadly, of course, that's why the county stood up the Housing for Health office and we have many millions of dollars that are very categorically restricted, some of which are already purposed towards um, from those various funding streams depending on categorical eligibility for programs for preventing and one-time move-in costs and helping people pay a bill so they can stay out. We already have a bit of that. Your board, during a different action, which was the core hearings, agreed to take $500,000 and set it aside. It will not be effectuated until fiscal year 25 to focus on South County prevention. But for this upcoming fiscal year, we're dealing with cuts of state and federal grants and continuation of those we have, which are achieving what you're saying, but if I'm hearing ultimately we're going, we don't have a new revenue stream to pay for anything new. That would have to come from another source. And I've heard it, that there's some federal increases for like programs for aging and no, for not for aging, for food insecurity for, for seniors. Um, but today during the public comment, I heard that we're cutting 15% is what I heard during the public comment. I, I believe because that came from the agency community bridges that they are speaking about next fiscal year 25. And if I may use the moment, I think they're speaking to that because your board on April 30th, when we were in front of you during the core discussion, I was sitting right here and said, you have a choice to propose a carve out. In the prior cycle, you carved out money to dedicate funding to Meals on Wheels. I also said in that hearing, you also have the option when we're back in front of you in the fall to make that carve out then. You did not make that decision, but all of that was for fiscal year 25. So for this upcoming fiscal year, the core contracts remain exactly as is. There is no cuts, no cuts. I think I speculate that they misunderstood and put the two together and thought they were ad arguing in front of you today to not cut next year, but there's no cuts next year. That program is in its third year next year. When we're back in front of you in core, you can have you have that choice to carve out money again or not, or you have the 15% carve out and you have choices to fund that if you choose as a board. And then um, I guess June 15th, we're going to hear the end of what the state budget's going to be. Uh, you said you'll come back to us if it's bad, but um, do we have a plan B? Are we formulating a plan B just in case it is the biggest worst? Um, let me break this down mindful. I'm not the CAO's office, but I want to be careful with language. June 15th, the state legislature is responsible by state law to submit a budget to the governor. That's often where the budget lands. But then by June 30th, by state law, the governor has the option to take or leave or veto and strike out more. And as Marcus Pimentel mentioned this morning, there's then what's called trailer bills mm -hmm. that happen in July. So those three actions still play out out of our jurisdictional control. My comment was after all of that, we will then be tracking three issues. County staff, of which you heard from one unit that currently is scheduled to have that revenue go. CBO contracts, which we will have to track if the complete revenue stream is wiped out, if we don't have a backfill for it, having to end those contracts or downsize them. And then and not to be too political, but the North Star, why we're here and getting paid for clients, the people we serve. Some people are going to have their services reduced or eliminated. So we are tracking all of those things and we don't know how it's going to land. So we have to track all of that closely. From a budget perspective, maybe I need to defer to the CAO and Trish, our, our budget lead. We then have to come back to you if we've lost state revenue that's currently in what's in front of you today and come back and amend our budget to downsize it because we don't have that state revenue anymore, but we don't know. We don't know. I'm happy to address that. We, we do anticipate, as Randy talked about, that we will be really understanding the details of the state budget through the summer. And our expectation is we would be coming back to you probably in September as part of the adopted budget to really see what those cuts play out like. We'll also have additional information about status of Measure K, We'll have additional information around where our different reimbursements are. So uh, unfortunately, we will have a bit of play this summer as we figure out the final details for the next fiscal year. But that is our plan B, that we will be coming forward with a much more um, detailed understanding of where the cuts are and what our options are. And hopefully we will have options and it won't just be cuts. And Sup Supervisor Hernandez, you 
I'm sure well aware of this, but I feel like I need to say it for the county staff because two of you have mentioned the county staff. We have an MOU with the union that represent employees. and We have a process we must go through. So I, I actually can't be very specific. We work very closely with the CIO, with our personnel office and the union represent employees if there's any impact on positions. So that's what we do once we find out what happens to the state budget. If we have to go there, we are very fortunate that at this point, what we see is one unit of staff, not to minimize the advocacy from that unit. But there have been other budget seasons during the Great Recession where hundreds of people were bumped and downsized. This is much smaller relative to other bad times. All right. Um, thank you for the presentation again. I just want to appreciate everybody who was able to join and comment. And I want to thank my um, colleagues up here for, for their questions and comments as well, because I think a lot of mine um, were a lot of my questions were asked and, answer, and answered at this point in time. I um, So just to reiterate, what you, one of the things that you said that I think um, is really important to bring back is that Meals on Wheels, since they were allocated their funding during the previous core process, none of that funding is getting cut for this next fiscal year. So Correct. Right. State status quo. Right. Because that's, you've that's already you know, I think it just that. allows us the opportunity to then say to folks who are concerned, like, that funding is secure. Um, it's really sad to, to hear about, you know, the cuts to the CalWORKs and the Family Stabilization Unit. Um, I don't know if it would be appropriate or would be good for our office, you know, for our board to recommend sending a letter for that particular group to not be cut in the state's budget. Um, if that's something that we could do to be supportive, you know, I'd be happy to see that included or as, as a separate motion. But, you know, I know that, you know, they provide a lot of the safety net services that we desperately need to keep families stable and whole. And so I just want maybe if you can comment on that. Yeah, I was just going to make comment that this is the moment. I really appreciate our state association, California Welfare Directors Association. We all report up to CSAC. Uh, Supervisor Friend, soon Koenig, our representative Bruce has for a long time. Um, CWJ just published over the weekend a series of advocacy letters that were sent to the state um, legislative delegation. I'm happy to forward those to you. They're public documents, and then you can pick and choose which you want to go. But the reality is there's three separate documents from our state association proposing do not cut the aging programs, do not cut the CalWORKs program, and then different document do not cut any of the child welfare programs. So our state association is asking for all of it, mindful the state is going to pick and choose how to manage it with their budget, but I'm happy to share those with you. And well, I mean, when the time's appropriate, if a board member would be willing to include in the motion that the chair works with staff so that we can send letters on behalf of the board, I think that will help respond to some of the concerns we heard today. And, you know, the state's going to ultimately do what it wants, but the fact that our board is trying to be supportive of these services that are critical in our community, especially being the highest, the most expensive rental community in the country, I think is something that at a minimum we would be able to do to just acknowledge the concerns that were expressed here today. So, so when the time comes to make a motion, if somebody would, you know, include that, I think that maybe that would be a, a good way of supporting our staff here and our community. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, there was a lot of folks who came in speaking towards um, eviction protections. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that at all. And then I have some other comments I can make related to that. Um, the comment I'll make is more sort of a governance process point. Last year, you and your position um, added additional direction. And because the Housing for Health Office is an HSD, we effectuated that direction from your board and stood up a small um, uh, contract with Tenant Sanctuary. That funding source was from your office, another office added a little, and contingencies because we didn't have any money. Uh, we still don't have any money. So if your board puts any of your funding or the CAO's finds funding and it's asked to be put in our department, we could effectuate that. But the budget we have in front of you does not have any funding for that program. Um, that program was one time last year with money you gave us and some contingency money. I do want to underline, and I don't have the details, we do have a host of prevention programs, prevention funding here and there in that maze that we brought in front of you many times. But um, anything new or what I heard many people advocate for, that would be new money that had funding before. We would need to have another funding stream, which we human services don't have. Okay. Well, one of the things that um, I just want to speak to on that item in particular, because I am interested in seeing us continue that funding, 
And I'll just mention to so my colleagues understand kind of where I'm coming from on this. Um, the tenant sanctuary initially last year had somebody with their group who was in line for when we took action to um, take on that position as a tenant attorney. And subsequently that person actually ended up not taking the position. However, they were able to find someone to hire as a tenant attorney. And that person came on board around December slash January of this year. Since that person's been in place, they've been doing a great job as we heard from some of the people in the community here today at executing those services. But what it also means is that they likely have about six months worth of funding towards that that didn't get spent last year. And so um, I spoke to Carlos before he, he took off, but there looks like there's an opportunity for us to continue the funding over from this year that hasn't been spent to next year's budget. I'm also willing to add an addition of my $50,000 towards continuing that program. And so, and given that there is some uncertainty around um, what's happening with the with Measure K and some of the other things, what I'd like to recommend when it's time to make a motion is that we continue, um, that we add the continuing the tenant sanctuary, tenant legal services for consideration as a last day budget addition an amount not to exceed 150,000. And so I think that, you know, we can get more information back about if there's, if there's any funding left over from this year that can be continued on the next year, my 50,000, if we have a better sense with Measure K what's happening. It's not the full 150,000 and then we can work or I can work with tenant sanctuary to see other folks in the community who, who would want to donate. But I do think that given the success that this program has had in this small six month time frame, um, we should continue those services because absent that, that person would then lose their position. It took six months to find somebody to do that job in the first place. And I know that there's a lot of support from our health and human services, our, our housing for health policy director. I know that there's a lot of support from the public defender's office. So, you know, if we provide that direction to the CAO's office, we might be able to see if there's any pockets of funding out there to help uh, support keeping that program in place. And so. Chair Cummings, I do want to just uh, emphasize that because Tenant Sanctuary did not have an attorney on staff at the time when you provided that additional direction, um, the contract with them actually did not become effective until October 1st. So their contract is now set to expire September 30th. So we will have a little bit of carryover into the next fiscal year. Um, so um, it's not the full fiscal year we'd be looking at augmenting their funding for. It would be about nine months. Um, Great. Based on your request. Great. Yeah. Supervisor Brown. Trish, oh, sorry, Ms. Daniels, do you, do you have a sense of what that number is, though? I mean, it would help us inform. Mm -hmm. We know that there's 50000 that the chair can do, but what would the carryover amount be? So we can see the delta between the 150 and that that we're discussing. So the last time I looked at it, which was probably a couple of weeks ago, um, we had been about... Um, they had been, they had had their contract for about 50% of the year or 50% of the contract term that they had had. And they had spent about 35% of their funding at that time. Um, I will need to, um, I meant to look at it this morning and I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, but I, what I can do is I can get back to you guys and let you guys know like where they are at right now and what we are anticipating would be available to be rolled over into the following year. And if I can just comment briefly, the idea is that we, have this come back on the June 4th agenda. So between then and now, staff will be able to find, you know, can we find that much money? We're not committing to it today. It's just having it come back on the agenda for that meeting. So for direction, we will partner with the CEO's office. And then last day, we'll collectively, we'll bring something back. And I think if I'm hearing the question about the Delta, we'll say whatever was unspent, whatever else there is, and how far short that is based on and we'll work together with and the CEO. What I'm clear as well, too. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Um, you're talking about funding it through June 30th of 2025. Correct. Okay. And and if I may, I don't want to restrict this to just the CAO's office to just working with your department. I think, yes, I'll, 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 obviously they should work with your department. But there, if there are other sources of funding out there, I think it would be good for them to work with other departments as well. Absolutely, Chair. We will work across departments to see what's possible. Great. So it was a suggestion, but when I asked county council, do we need a motion for that? Like up to 150,000, depending on how much is already there. I think you would make a mo as part of the motion, as the chair indicated, you would give that direction to staff to bring it back. It's not on the agenda today, but it could be brought back and agendized for that meeting on June 4th. 
I mean, just doing some of the math, which was not my strength in college by any stretch. I mean, I think that it's probably a delta of about $75,000. And so I think that what we need to also then know is what's going to get cut. I mean, I just, I just want to, because if they're coming forward and saying that we found this money, I want to know what it's coming from. I mean, we need to have that, that honest of a discussion in June, not just, we found 75,000. It's here's the three things we're not funding as a result of that. So I, I, I completely support that. And I, and I, again, as I mentioned before, I think we will also know a little bit more about measure K. And if it turns out that we're going to be able to move forward with measure K funding by that point in time, then there is an opportunity for us to say, well, should we carve out something, some from homelessness and from affordable housing that would help address this issue since eviction protection helps people from becoming homeless and it's really going to be helping mostly low income people. And so I completely agree with where you're coming from on this. So also we're going to bring up uh, the kind of the request that we've had from the, the coalition uh, cause I'm not completely sure if those are separate, but, and how long their funding goes for, but I would also like to make sure that it does go up to June, 2025 as well. May I yes. Yes. ask for clarification, putting the, the potential additional direction in your question together. If this is responsive, I think as is the nature of the disparate funding all over the place in housing and homelessness. If this is agreeable to your board, I'm hearing tenant sanctuary specifically, and then I'm hearing the coalition, and then I heard COPA broadly. Like all of them are generally, but they're two different programs. So maybe the if this is what you're asking, we could, in partnership with CO and the full county, come back and speak to that ecosystem and make sure to responsive to Chair Cummings' specific direction about the specific contract that we hold, but that doesn't even get to your... So I think right. if we could more collectively talk about how is this money out there addressing vulnerable, low-income people at risk of eviction, and a lot of it happens. We hear the stories. Um, maybe that would be helpful because tenant sanctuary is a piece, but they also have a role in that collaborative and like, how does it all fit together? What's the county fund? What's their other fund? It, it's It's a complex ecosystem, and I think we could work together to make try to make that clear. So we'll bring it back to that. That's what I'm saying because it's complicated move, bunch of moving. Uh, can we just reference that the tenant sanctuary contract that the chair is talking about is uh, you know something that the county very specifically mm -hmm. has um, supported. The larger collaborative is a much larger program, and as we've talked about in this specific budget year, as um, Supervisor Friend mentioned. If you find money for that, it's because something else has been cut. There's there's not extra funding there. So I just want to highlight that that is a very different um, charge than trying to cover a gap in a tenant sanctuary uh, legal services contract. So, I mean, I think what Randy has suggested is us bring in some information about the programs more broadly around homelessness prevention and eviction prevention, but I want to be just upfront that the size of funding that I understand is necessary for the collaborative, um, this is a sort of a zero sum game. It's It would come from somewhere. It would imply a cut somewhere else. So they're asking for 250, correct? I am not aware about the amount that they're asking for. Yeah, I, I don't mind this, but uh, I don't want to get too specific on carve outs. We've had everybody up here wants more than they, they're getting and they probably more than they're going to get. So I, we can say that this could be among those things that we want to readdress should some uh, enlightening news come from the state. Um, but uh, I just don't want to get too specific. I don't, I don't disagree. This is a critical program that helps in more ways than one, but, uh, I want to make sure it's left open to that what other programs might We've just heard a, a day long issue about some things that are being cut or not going to be added because they don't have adequate funds. So I just don't want to get too specific. That's all. But I, I agree. This is an important program, but I want to leave it open. Understood. But I, so I'm hearing a general report back on these questions of homelessness prevention and ev ev eviction prevention what they look like, where what our current investments look like, the opportunity to continue the tenant sanctuary uh, legal program, ostensibly if we have additional funds to close those gaps. Um, 
but no specific commitments, more options for you to consider on last day. That sounds about, I think that sounds about right. Yeah. And I think the intention today is not to make a fiscal make a commitment. Decision. It's to say that, you know, we've been hearing from the eviction defense collab. They came out today. Um, I think it'd be really good if you all were able to connect with them and work with them to see what, you know, amounts of funding they're proposing. And if we were going to move forward, here's what would need to get cut. And, or if there's measure K funding available, there's possibilities for certain amounts to get allocated from there. Ultimately, we're going to have to make the decision. And, and, you know, oftentimes people come in with their, their dream ask and you can't get there. And I know that, um, you know, there's been some, um, rumblings around town about other not, or not nonprofits, but other, um, philanthropic organizations that might be interested in helping to support with some of this funding as well. So, I, you know, I think right now there's an opportunity for us to be responsive to what we heard today. And, um, and I think that some of that includes, you know, funding towards and support for eviction protection services and a range of them. Um, but, but I just want to let you all know that on my end, you know, I'm committed to the 50,000 from my office to um, tenant sanctuary. And it seems like that since we'll have some funding left over from last year, then it's likely that that can roll over to help um, deal with that organization in particular. So, and then for the other ones, we, I guess we'll just have to figure it out. Or for the clarification. Yeah. Supervisor Koenig, it looked like you had something to say. I'm ready to make a motion okay. if, uh, for there. All right. Um, so I'll move the recommended actions approving the 24-25 proposed budget for the Human Services Department with the additional direction to request that the chair write a letter to state legislators and agencies requesting that funding for CalWORKs family stabilization be maintained and to allocate $50,000 of Chair Cummings Office's funds to tenant sanctuary for eviction, eviction defense services uh, and to uh, request from the CAO's office and, and Human Services Department that they bring back options to fund an additional 150000 in eviction prevention um, presented to the board on June 4th, uh, including where cuts would have to be made to effectuate uh, that. Second. Just clarification, it was up to 150000 total inclusive of the carryover funds and Chair Cummings' contribution. Uh, so it would only be an additional $100,000 then well, it's a total of one hundred and fifty thousand okay. dollars, okay. inclusive of fifty thousand plus whatever's left over in the carryover. So we don't know. We don't it's know. Just, it's just an up to number. I see. You are you are All right, well, you are uh, a mod fifty percent of the size. I'll consider that a friendly amendment and uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. up to one hundred fifty thousand. Yes. Okay, I, I do want to add um, a friendly amendment because I think what I was hearing in the discussion was there were some other programs that we want to keep it open, but they had expressed that they come in today and expressed wanting to have additional funding. And so I'm not saying we're committed to anything, but I think the friendly amendment would be um, that we also consider funding for the eviction protection collab. And, and it's, we're not committing to anything, but you know, what we heard earlier today was it seems like there's a number of organizations, um, the conflict resource center, community bridges, and I can't remember, well, Ten Sanctuary and then Senior Services. And so I'm not saying that we commit to anything, but it sounded like, you know, if we were to explore funding those programs, what it would mean in terms of cuts and what it would mean in terms of funding sources. So that's amenable to. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I said it in a way that it's general. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yes. Yep. All right. Seeing no further questions or comments, I'll turn it to the clerk for the roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Fernandez. Aye. McPherson and Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. So with that, um, thank you, HSD, and please keep us posted. I look forward to working with you all so we can get a letter out to the state reps in support of, or to the governor's office to not cut CalWORKs programs. Okay. Moving on, uh, that brings us to public safety and justice. So we have two more items on our agenda. Next item is item number nine, consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for the public defender, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. And with that, I will turn it over to our director of the um, public defender's office, Heather Rogers. Welcome.
Good afternoon, Chair Cummings, members of the Board of Supervisors. It's been a longish day, but here we are. It's going to be fine. I'm Heather Rogers. I'm the public defender. I'm honored to serve this community in that capacity. I'd like to introduce you to my administrative services manager, Myrna Guerrero. We also have a whole budget team here with us today who've worked tirelessly on this budget. We have our chief deputy public defender, Athena Reese, our departmental analyst, Suzanne Willis, and CAO analyst, Gina demartini Coons. Everyone has contributed so much. Assistant CAO Nicole Coburn is also here today. As you know, our budget includes not just the public defender budget, but also the budget of our two conflict firms, a conflict firm and a conflict panel. And um, Ms. Coburn is here to address that if needed. Strong public defense is equity in action. Strong public defense breaks harmful cycles. Strong public defense is a wise investment. Strong public defense is our defense of Anna. We met Anna on a Friday afternoon in a holding cell at the Santa Cruz County Jail. One of our client advocates was there that afternoon as part of our early representation project. This is a project that links defenders with clients as close to law enforcement contact as possible. Anna had been arrested earlier in the day. She'd been driving her two small children when her ex-boyfriend accused her of domestic violence. She was pulled over, she was hauled away in handcuffs. And by the time our advocate met with her in this jail cell, she was frantic. She didn't know what would happen to her car. She was afraid it would be towed. She was worried about the housing that she had recently secured at the family shelter for herself and her kids. And mostly she was worried about her children. Where were they? What was happening to them? Were they going to be okay? Now we knew that Anna may not see a judge until Monday or Tuesday. And in that time, her life could unravel. She'd tried to post bail. She couldn't afford it. She was facing felony charges, maybe even prison. And that's where our team comes in. Our advocate immediately set to work, trying to shore up the pieces of Anna's life so that she would have something to go home to. She called the family shelter to make sure that Anna's housing would be there for her. She called Anna's sister to move the car and most importantly, to find the children and make sure they had a safe, friendly, familiar place to stay while we tried to sort out getting Anna out of custody. And at the same time, our social worker and our attorney were working on a release plan. Early that next week, we took the release plan to the judge, a plan that included supportive services, a plan that told more of the story of who Anna was and how she had pulled herself up to get housing for her kids as a single mom to make something of her life and the judge released Anna on her own recognizance so her kids would have a safe place to be. That was when our investigator stepped in. Our investigator interviewed the witnesses and found out that there was evidence that Anna's ex-boyfriend was lying, that there had been no violence, that it was actually Anna who was the victim of abuse. Eventually, the case was dismissed. In the meantime, Anna, with the help of our social workers, our advocates, our attorney, our investigator, a whole team that was there to provide her wraparound support, got hooked up with supportive services. We were able to stabilize her housing. The arrest had led to a child protective services investigation. We were able to help her with that to make sure that she stayed with her kids. And in the end, the case was dismissed based on our investigator's hard work and Anna is now stable, raising her family, and taking advantages of the services that we were able to help her find. So when I sit here and I listen to these things that we've heard today, heartbreaking, heartbreaking things, my heart goes out because we are all serving the same clients. Health, human services, public defender, we are confronting the same things. We are all serving Anna. We are all serving people who are struggling with poverty, who are struggling with histories riddled with violence and trauma. 
people who are unhoused or housing unstable, you know, people who are suffering from substance use disorders and mental health disorders, and they need our help. But what I want to tell you about Anna, which is true about all of our clients that you've heard about today, is that they are also hopeful, resilient, and brave. Community-based whole person defense, the kind of defense that looks at the person behind the case, is the kind of defense that empowers people to lift themselves up and out of the system. And we work with our partners in health. We work, work with our partners in human services to make sure that clients like Anna get what they need to break harmful cycles and thrive. Anna is just one example of the thousands of clients we've served this year in over 6,000 cases, and they need your support. This is what's on our menu today. We're gonna to tell you a little bit about what we stand for, what we do, and most importantly and critically today, what we need from you to continue to provide strong public defense to this community. Our mission, vision, and values guide our work. We take every word of this seriously. It is our mission to courageously defend the accused, to demand equal justice for all, and most importantly, to empower our clients with inspired advocacy. Our vision is that we'll lead the charge in transforming public defense, empowering those we serve, amplifying their voices. And these are values that I know I share with all of you and with all of the directors that presented today. Values that include being client focused, collaborative, courageous, creative, culturally responsive, and compassionate. Supervisors, we've talked a lot today about equity, and I think it's critical that we continue to do that, that we continue to you know, honor our successes in this area, but also to be real that we still have a long way to go. And at the Public Defender's Office, our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is a core part of the work that we do serving historically marginalized communities. For us, it's a verb. Equity is a verb. It's equity in action. Equity means that if you go right now to our Watsonville office, you will see a team of defenders there ready to serve our community. An open door, a smiling face, people there to make sure that our clients in Watsonville get culturally responsive, appropriate services, that they too have access to justice. Equity in action means that we are looking for a workplace that is diverse, where people feel that they belong, where people are included. And we're proud to have received this year the CalBars Gold Leadership Seal for DEI, which required putting into action a lot of different things in our workplace to make sure that we really were equity in action and not just talking about it. The equity in action is the kind of defense that Anna got, the kind of defense that people with means get, the kind of defense where if you are arrested and your children are taken from you and you're scared in a holding cell, that a defender shows up and doesn't just hand you a card and say, see you on Monday, but gets immediately to work, stabilizing you and your family so that you have something to go home to. This is our leadership team. I'm so proud of what these people have accomplished. Like everyone you've heard from today, all of these directors were doing a lot with a little, and these people are really doing a lot. Our legal division is headed by Athena Reese, my chief deputy public defender. Caitlin Becker is our director of holistic defense, and she's not here in the audience because she's serving clients who need her this afternoon. Sierra Thompson, our interim training equity and development director. Sergio Zamudio, our chief investigator and Myrna Guerrero, our administrative services manager, who really keeps our shop running day in and day out. Most importantly, 
Each of these people represents a team of defenders who are working tirelessly on the line to defend this community, to defend people like Anna. And we are here to support them. Everything that I ask for today is to support our client facing defenders in serving our clients. Strong public defense is not optional. The Constitution requires that government fund public defense at a level that ensures due process, a fair trial, and effective representation. This is difficult as a public defender because I do not determine my workload. My workload is determined based on the number of cases prosecutors file. My workload is determined based on how efficient the courts are. And my workload, like so many of our workloads, is determined by the mandates that we get from government, many of which unfortunately recently have been unfunded, and we are responsive to those. And I thank all of you in this community for giving us what we need to continue to provide effective public defense, even in difficult times. We have a saying as public defenders, you'll know why we do it and you'll know what we do when we are there for a family member or we are there for you. And the unfortunate thing about public defense is it's a little bit like the emergency room. You don't know you need it until you need it. But the sad truth is that most of us will be touched by the criminal legal system at some point in our life. One in three adults has been arrested or convicted of a crime. Over 80 million adults in the U.S. have a criminal record, and one in 10 of us will be imprisoned at some point during our lifetime. Very few people can afford a private defense attorney. Public defenders truly are the defenders of the people. We are here for this community. We are here for you. Last year, we were here for you in more than 6,000 cases. That includes criminal cases that are filed, but so much more. We also defend clients in probate, in conservatorships, in contempt cases, in juvenile justice matters, in record clearance, and in post-conviction relief. We provide wraparound support to clients, which means that we have a team of defenders, social workers, advocates, investigators, attorneys, paralegals, and assistants who work with each client to determine what drove them into the system so that we can help them understand how to get out of it. Our 24 seven emergency defense hotline is for a child or an adult who's facing interrogation and requests a public defender. In our collateral consequences and reentry unit, we cleared more than a thousand records last year while handling handfuls of post-conviction relief matters, helping to get people out of prison who no longer need to be there and reenter their communities. Early representation, we'll talk a little bit more about later. Essentially, it's this idea that people like Anna need an attorney right now, not in three days, five days, seven days, when it's too late and they've lost everything. Vertical representation just means that we are not interested in assembly line justice. If you're an assigned an attorney and a defense team in my office, we want that same team to be with you through the conclusion of the case and not to have you passed around. I want each of our clients to know who represents them and to truly believe they have a team of skilled defenders in their corner. Holistic representation is that the type of representation that we do, which doesn't just look at the elements of the crime, but actually looks at the person behind the case. Why are you here? What do you want for yourself? And what is stopping you from getting it? And that's when we can reach out to health, to human services, to our CBOs, and say, why don't we all wrap around this person to get a different result this time, to reach a better outcome? And the work that we do is not just in the courtroom. Our defenders are all over this community, on commissions, on boards, at fairs, providing resources, getting to know people, meeting our clients where they're at, and making sure that the County of Santa Cruz has public defense that is cutting edge and actually resolving the root causes of system involvement and not just business as usual. These are just some of the things that we accomplish in our first fiscal year of providing this type of defense. And what you can see is that we truly are the emergency room of the criminal justice system. 
As defenders, our clients have complex and urgent needs. It should come as no surprise after hearing from other directors this morning that our areas of greatest need are in the areas of homelessness and mental health and substance use. I'm proud that our defenders are tackling those issues every day, doing holistic intakes that flag these issues so that we can offer supportive services and try to give people what they need to stay out of the system. We talked earlier about the jail as being, you know, a de facto mental health institution. Public defense is that ER. And what we need to do is get better at this. We need to get better at triaging and actually solving the root problems so that people just have one visit to the ER and not 10 or 20 in their lifetime. That's my goal. Early representation is one of the most important things that we're doing to advance equity because for clients like Anna, and frankly for any of us, if we had been arrested on our way here today, three, five, seven days, it's too late. Your life has fallen apart. To the extent that we can get into jail cells and help people shore things up to maintain the status quo, we're going to be able to help them retain their housing. We're going to be able to help them keep their children. And we're going to be able to help them get a better result. That's our goal. These numbers are just a dent in what we've done. This is the data from our first fiscal year. Our problems are getting, our, our programs are getting more robust, our problems as well. And we're doing our best to confront them every day. What this slide really shows is that early representation is helping the people who are most impacted by systemic inequities. You can see here that in our first year, 14% of the people we served in this program are unhoused. 33% have one or more children, which, which means that if we're seeing people in jail cells who are caring for children, it means that we're destabilizing families by not better understanding what they need from us to thrive. And many of our clients belong to groups that have been historically oppressed and continue to bear the brunt of mass incarceration. Our out of custody early representation program, which we're accomplishing with the help of the Watsonville Police Department and Chief Samora, is helping people get access to counsel as close to their arrest as possible when we can still do things like talk about restorative justice when we can really get cases diverted, and most importantly, when we can offer people links to supportive services right there when they need it the most. These are our budget goals, and really the first one is the only one that matters, and everything else is how we get there. Constitutionally sufficient defense. Defense that safeguards human liberty, human dignity, defense for people like Anna and the thousands of other people every morning in these courtrooms who need us desperately. This is our budget request. You can see that we have some additional staff that I'll tell you about in a moment. We have increased personnel costs like other departments. Uh, okay. So our requested changes is we have three social workers who will be transitioning from county contractors. I'm not sure the slides you're seeing reflect the amendments um, related to the care court budget. We also will have um, three positions related to care court funding. That includes a senior social worker, a departmental analyst, and an attorney. The three social workers who are transitioning from county contractors, I think is an example of being smart with the resources that we've been given. As you know, you approved a contract uh, in my very first year that allowed us to have three Partners for Justice client advocates try holistic defense out in Santa Cruz County and see how it worked. What we learned is it's tremendously successful. The county social workers have the same um, upfront costs as the contractors, but they come with the added benefit of being able to recoup Medi-Cal administrative activities. 
So we're expecting this transition to lead to our social workers paying for about 80% of their salaries, which again is just a smart way to use the resources we have. The budget that we're asking for today will give us effective public defense. The community-based whole person defense model that we use at Public Defender combines zealous advocacy with holistic representation and robust community engagement. We're tackling the root causes of system involvement with upstream interventions to avoid downstream consequences. We've talked about how early representation advances equity and about how record clearance and post-conviction relief remove obstacles to our clients' successful reentry into their communities. On this slide, you can see that um, our revenue comes from AB 109 treatment funds, state care act funding and state reimbursement for activities related to supporting Medi-Cal. On the next slide, you'll see that we also get funding through intra-fund transfers related to Prop 47 and cafes. Our expenditures, um, like so many others in the county, are related a lot to salaries and employee benefits. Our defenders are also, of course, our greatest asset. This also reflects increases um, in our services and supplies. In particular, the mental health crisis in this county has led to the need for increased experts to provide reports and expert services around mental health. So here we have... Uh, so this slide is a little inaccurate. My, my apologies, supervisors. We, we should actually have a change of six FTEs here. It's the three social workers transitioned from our advocates along with the three personnel related to the care court funding. Again, that's an analyst, a senior social worker, and an attorney. And Rupti, for a second, I'm just wondering if it'd be worth us taking a pause, if, if it'd be better to upload the accurate slides. I'm gonna be happy to pause the presentation. I think so. Yeah, it's difficult because I feel like I'm speaking to numbers that aren't reflected here yeah. for the public to see. Exactly. I appreciate that. Thank yep. you, Supervisor. So we'll just take a brief, um, like two minute, three minute break. That would be great. Okay. Yeah, we'll take a brief two, three minute break and then we'll return when we have the accurate slides uploaded.
presentation on the public defender's office and thank you all for taking for the break to make the changes so I'll turn it back over to heather rogers thank you so much chair cummings i appreciate that so we uh, i think you're on we have correct slides up now so i'm just going to go back a little bit just to make sure that that you and also the community have the right numbers so this is actually our budget request with the six personnel that i talked about that includes the three social workers who are converted from advocates and the three defenders who will staff and support care court. This lays it out a little more granularly. It's a departmental administrative analyst, a senior social worker, and an attorney too, who will support care court. And here we have our revenues from AB 109. We also have CARE Act funding to help um, stand up that new court here in Santa Cruz County. And then Medi-Cal administrative activities funds which we're doing everything we can at Public Defender to recoup so that we can be reimbursed for our activities in those areas. This slide shows our major expenses, salaries and employee benefits, as well as the services and supplies I talked about. It also shows an intra-fund transfer, which is actually money that we get from Prop 47 and CAFES to fund three of our advocates. Again, here are funded staffing. And now back to where we left off. So the state budget is troubling. Um, we have care court beginning in December of 2024, which is an expensive venture. It's a brand new court that we're standing up in collaboration with our partners who you've heard from this morning. We're also collaborating with county partners on Cal AIM, trying to understand how we can use the justice impacted uh, piece of that revenue to serve our community in, in the most robust way possible. The governor cut uh, funding for post-conviction relief, which was devastating to our budget. We've already stood up a unit to provide that relief, and we're already deep into those cases. We'll continue to represent those clients, but we are now doing it as an unfunded mandate. We don't really know how many clients will end up in care court. We're predicting in this first year around 30. It could be more, it could be less. Either way, we have to staff that court, and we have to make sure that there are folks there to provide services there. We're interested in uh, pre-care court interventions and how we can try to get ahead of care court by you know, using community-based whole person defense to wrap around people before they actually end up there. That's something we'll continue to explore with our partners. And we're still curious about what's going to happen with the, the new resentencings and uh, unfunded mandates that came out on January 1st around post-conviction relief. Um, the governor is asking us to defend hundreds more people without the funding to do that and we will do our best so future considerations i think it's important for the board to remember that parity between the prosecution and the defense corrects systemic inequities the care court and calame require stabilization of our core services if we're overworked and under resourced it's difficult for us to take on new mandates and pivot in a way that best serves the community as public defenders, we are increasingly at the forefront of policy issues and solutions related to matters that have traditionally been thought of as public health. But the truth is, is that public defense is public health. Public defense is public safety because the drivers right now of people into our system are poverty and the things that go along with it. Ineffective public defense is not an option. The Constitution demands um, funding for public defense, even in rough cycles. And we will give every dollar, um, we will take every dollar that you give us and we'll make the best use of it. We're looking at upstream solutions because we really believe that they will lead to downstream savings and improved outcomes for our community. So this is our, um, our request and our final slide. And I want to end by by sharing um, some words that I recently heard from Brian Stevenson, who is the author of Just Mercy. Just Mercy tells the story of Walter McMillan, who was placed on death row for a murder that he didn't commit. The story talks about how public defense is critical to righting historic wrongs. We believe that very much at Public Defender, and we're doing that every day. But what Brian said that really struck me and that I've thought about a lot today as I've listened to the other directors present their budgets 
is the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. We live in a nation, unfortunately, where poverty perpetuates injustices and the criminal legal system all too often perpetuates inequities. Every day in our jail, our courtrooms, and our community, our defenders are fighting for justice. Thank you for giving us what we need to do that. I ask that you please approve our proposed budget, including supplemental materials, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Thank you for that amazing and compelling presentation, and just want to thank you all for the amazing work that you do in our community to keep people out of the criminal justice system and on a pathway towards improving their lives. Um, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up to uh, members of the public to see if there's any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. If there's anyone who's here in person, you can come up to the podium and you'll be given two minutes. Hello again. Yep, here you go. Okay. Uh, my name again is Susan Cohen, and thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. Um, I am asking that you approve the Public Defender's Office uh, budget. Their goals mirror those of many community-based organizations as well as community members' interests that address the needs of the most vulnerable people. I can't say it better than you just said it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, those suffering met with mental health, those experiencing homelessness, and those who are currently abusing substances, which is mainly the way they are dealing with suffering from mental health, mental illness. We desperately need these programs that the Public Defender's Office offers, and especially since there's an ongoing epidemic of criminalizing these people. So please uh, take this very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else here uh, who'd like to speak to us on this item in chambers? Seeing none, I'll go to see if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Yeah, uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon, Chair, Board. Um, you know, just want to say gracias to the Public Defender's Office uh, for all the work, uh, all the care and intentionality that this office is putting into um, helping people going through this really hard time in their lives, you know, as a formerly incarcerated individual myself, uh, I understand the impact of being supported through that process, right? Um, it's a complex situation and system, right? Um, but I do want to encourage this board to support this office, right? To support your investment in the community. This is part, this is this is what investment looks like. You know, um creating something, you know, historically Santa Cruz didn't have a county department, right? Y'all did this, right? So kudos to y'all for making this happen. Um and since it's a, a new department, right? It just it needs that much more support right now, you know, just to get it off the ground to keep it to safeguard it, you know, from any type of budget impacts, any type of, you know, um, whatever it is. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I just, I see that disparities within the public safety and justice departments, right? Um, and when we think about equity, right, if this, this county has a proven equity statement, well, the equity within departments, right, encourages us to support uplift and continue to fund uh continue to increase this public defender's office and its staff and the great work that they're doing because we see the crime rates are continuing to do decline right we see all those good things so um thank you very much thank you pam your microphone's now available hi thank you pam sexton again um and calling from watsonville and yeah, I, I also want to just thank, I'm so glad that I was able to make this presentation and um, that was a great presentation. And I also want to ask the supervisors to give their full support here. I am an adult educator. I teach at the Watsonville Adult School, which is um, our adult school covers the whole county. 
and in my work i um i work with people who have have interfaced with the criminal justice system and and just highlighting what was said in the in the report um it's it's cheaper it's a better for our community it makes our community safer to address root causes and to to address things upstream and so i yeah it's it also it's cheaper to meet people's basic needs um the incarceration experience um and this is speaking from with individuals who've who've experienced this in mind it contributes to this downward cycle of economic dependence social isolation substance use um and abuse and and other physical and mental health problems and and we shouldn't that issue of justice it shouldn't um be who can afford the lawyer to get the proper defense and our recidivism rates are horrendous and the number of people in our jails who um who are are there for too long is also on misdemeanors is way too high thank you thank you and the further speakers too all right well i will bring it back to the board for any comments questions and action and i'll start to my left with supervisor hernandez well first of all thank you for all the great work that you do and i think my comments about equity probably you know doesn't add anything to this because the very work that you do is all about equity so thank you for that my only question would be is um how, do we expect have we looked at uh how much cal aim reimbursement we're looking at especially when it comes to like the care act and the outreach work if we can you know be able to affect it that way and you know we talked a lot about unfunded mandates and of course we got this 130,000 with care court and it's something that we do have to do as a as a state mandate uh but yeah i mean is there anything that we could do to increase the the uh whatever is a state reimburse reimbursable i think so so we are really really looking creatively at all of the state funding streams and trying to think about the work that we do and how we can fit it into the rubric of public health, which it really is. Um, traditionally, public defense hasn't looked at itself that way, um, but we have found even through, you know, doing two years of MA reimbursement that we were able to, you know, really save our holistic defense unit this year, that it really does pay for itself, right, in ways that are amazing. Um, and so my goal is to continue to be really creative and to really draw upon the expertise of the directors in health and human services and their teams of analysts who have very graciously offered up their support to us, which is how we've been able to recoup as much as we have. I think we will be able to, because really, if you think about it, a lot of what we are doing is providing public health services. We're hooking people up with benefits. We're linking them to supportive services. We're trying to shore up their social safety nets when they're in the criminal legal system so that we can get them the best outcome and keep them out of it. And I, I think that exactly as you say, CalAIM will be a source of that for us in addition to the MA reimbursements that we already have taken advantage of and continue to take advantage of. So I hope so. You know, I, the state is asking a lot of us and we have to be creative and nimble and we will be. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I just, um, for me, this is a particularly interesting uh, department budget because uh, to watch because it's it's so new and it's growing and it's reaching impact and you've done a phenomenal job of just establishing the office and the hiring of their personnel is really impressive. Uh, I want to emphasize also um, the the loss of the public defense pilot program uh, funding. Uh, you got it earlier than we're we're going to see it more in the board of supervisors level this year. But how you've been able to adjust to that as well as you can, um, and the state trimming back funding doesn't uh, mean that you trim back your representation to your clients at all. So you made that clear. Uh, I do have a question um, with the lower income clients that you often have. 
our county has had success in recent years to uh, draw down more Medi-Cal funding to uh, connect it to our services. Can you talk more about the connection of that um, between the public defender's office and this area and the increase in the social workers that you've outlined here? Of course, I'd be happy to. So one of the things that we do for every client who um, seeks a public defender is we do a holistic intake and that intake, you know, flags factors that are drivers into the criminal legal system. So we look at um, substance use, we look at mental health, housing, employment, we look at dependence, and we also look at whether someone qualifies for benefits and is getting them. And so what we then do is we actually help them apply for benefits. We do what it takes to get them benefits. And then we help them understand how those benefits can help them shore up their lives in ways that will help their criminal case, but also help them reach enmeshed legal and social goals. Because a criminal case is often just the canary in the coal mine of some bigger problem um, that needs solving, right? So what we've been able to see is that so much of what that team does for every client is actually Medi-Cal reimbursable. And so we're becoming more savvy in looking at our social work teams and our advocates and understanding how we can draw down more money there. So one of the things we did in this budget is convert three contractors to full times, which you might say, well, that's going to cost more money. But actually, it's going to cost us less money because as county employees, our social workers can draw down um, Medi-Cal funds to almost pay for themselves, right? And so these are things that as a new director, I didn't understand. And again, you know, big thanks to, um, to Health and Human Services and the directors in those departments and their teams who are helping us understand how we can, you know, do more with less. And, and that's exactly what we're doing in this budget cycle. Well, uh, it's truly impressive, and uh, congratulations to you and the establishment, uh, this growing department, and their whole staff of what you've done. It's Thank um, you. it's really it makes us proud in Santa Cruz County that people are able to get the defense when they need it. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Supervisor Conig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, to our public defender. Um, and so you, you're just saying that you're becoming more savvy, learning how to drive. Pull on various uh, sources of state funds and federal funds. Um, is that the eight hundred ten thousand that is in this budget is is largely the Medi-Cal funds for social workers? So there's Medi-Cal funds there. We also have been able to take advantage of AB 109 treatment funds. We also are taking advantage of the Prop 47 CAFES grant. Um, you know, all of these are ways to shore up what we lost from the state, you know, just being very creative about how can we continue to provide these services um, while using as little general fund as as we can, um, you know, seeing just the great need for general fund that we've heard from from our, our sister departments this morning. But yes, you can see that our revenues are increasing, which I never thought that would be possible as a public defender to have increased revenues. Um, but it turns out that there are ways to actually bring in more state money, and we're determined to do that. Great. Um, I mean, as you were sort of alluding to, of course, um, you know, maybe it's as a new department, still very dependent on general fund revenue. I mean, it's uh, you know about ninety percent of the budget. Um, where would you where would you say that you're saving the county money? Well, I think we're saving the county money in um, in downstream costs. So if you think of a client like Anna, who in the past maybe would have languished in jail for two, three, four weeks, and maybe even have had a felony on her charge, her children then would have been in the foster care system. She would have lost her housing and her car. And when she emerged from custody, she would have had nothing. I mean, I think that one case pays for our entire department, if you really think about it. So for every one of these thousands of human beings that are now having a defender come in and look at their enmeshed legal and social needs and link them to the supportive services that already exist in this community to meet those needs, I mean, really one or two of those cases will pay for our department probably in perpetuity. And the other great thing about it is we have CBOs and other departments who are looking for these referrals. What we've learned is that so many of the grants that folks get, you know, need referrals from exactly the kind of clients that we have. And so it's this symbiotic relationship where we can continue to support the provision of services throughout the community just by working together and working smarter. Great, thank you. Great. Well, I just want to thank you again for 
all your work, and I really want to commend the uh, CAO's office for funding um, the public defender's office here in the county. And I know there was uh, some tension around, you know, when this was first getting created, if it should come into the county or not. But obviously, you know, the benefits that come with having in the county, I think, are, um, you know, really substantial with the fact that by creating this kind of holistic program, and by being with, embedded within the county, we're able to work with all these other departments to really bring forward what people need, you know, who are who are experiencing poverty and who are ending up in the criminal justice system. And, you know, I just think about this as an opportunity for us to not only keep people out of the criminal justice system, which, which saves us a lot of money. And as we've heard from some of our community members is one of the community priorities, but it also keeps people who are you know working within our community, keeping them to be able to have jobs, keeping them out of homelessness. And because as we've seen, when people end up in homelessness, it costs so much more money to get them out of homelessness and restable than it does to try to address the issue before it becomes a crisis situation. So just really want to um, express my full support um, for your department and um, for this, you know, um, investment in, from our general fund into the services that you all provide. I would actually like to ask County Council one brief question. So um, I know that Many cities within the county have been interested in understanding, you know, the rollout of care courts. And I know that the CARE Act was an item that was on our consent, but given the CARE um, court and funding for CARE court goes to the public defender, and that's kind of a part of this conversation, I'm wondering if it would be appropriate that we can add some additional direction for the chair to send letters um, to the um, other to the cities within the county, kind of making them aware of the investments that the county is making in CARE courts as a part of this item. Can you say that one more time, the very end? If the board could direct the chair to send a letter to the cities within the county about the investments that the county's making into the care courts. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that would be a problem to okay. do that as an additional direction on this budget. Okay. Sure, Let yeah. me just add that, that, I mean, our assistant county administrator officer and public defender have done the roadshow to the local cities on exactly this and given pretty extensive presentations. So if this would be in, in addition to what has already happened at the local city councils within the last six months, so it's up to you. Okay, I mean, we could make a clarification sure. or addition. Um, Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO, we did do a roadshow a while ago with um, a presentation or two. We do plan to do another set round of presentations as we gear up and are closer to the launch date in December. So we will be going to all the city councils to make a presentation with our whole team. Great. Well, then I don't need to have that direction and one less letter. <laughs> that needs to go out. So, okay. Um, Supervisor Hernandez. I'll make the motion to approve the proposed budget of the Office of Public Defenders, including all supplemental materials. Check. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Supervisor Friend. I'll turn it to the clerk for roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And, um, with that, I'm just going to ask my, the board members, do we need to take a break or should we go straight into probation and, and conclude our day? No, no, I don't care. I don't care. But everybody. All right. So with that, um, we will move on to the last item on today's agenda, which is item number 10. Consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for the probation department, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. With that, I'll turn it over to the director of probation, Fernando Geraldo. No. I think your mic's off. Try that again. There you go. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings and members of the board. Fernando Geraldo, Chief of Probation. Um, <clears throat> Really excited to be here today to present our proposed uh, fiscal year 2024-25 budget. Um, up here with me today is Valerie Thompson, our assistant chief, uh, Melissa Allen, my administrative services manager, and behind me, my awesome executive leadership team uh, that operate pretrial services, the juvenile hall, adult services, and juvenile supervision services. I do want to be uh, begin by acknowledging um, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Friend, I, I know you've got a few more months left, but this is your last budget hearing, and I've been 
before you for my entire time as chief probation officer. So I do want to acknowledge your support to our department, your kind words. Um, and, um, and Supervisor McPherson, I'll never forget our trip to Pennsylvania to the Annie Casey Foundation event where you got to see firsthand the tremendous impact nationally that this department has had. And you've never forgotten that. So I really appreciate this. So I wish you both the best. I know I'll see you, but just want to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, our CEO, Carlos Palacios, assistant CAO Nicole Coburn, uh, our analyst David Brown, and I see Ruby Mar Marquez over there as well um, for their ongoing support. And we really appreciate that. And as always, I must acknowledge my staff and management team just for their unwavering dedication to community well being. Their commitment is consistently aligned with our budgetary objectives resulting in a fiscally responsible and impactful budget that addresses the county requirements while bolstering essential services, particularly in the realm of public safety. I do have this on. Now, this presentation over, over, overview really summarizes at, I, at a high level our primary department bill changes. These will be described in more detail in just a second. But uh, as you see, some of these have been addressed or discussed earlier today. Cal AIM is a big issue, and we've been very involved in that. So we'll we'll talk a bit about the uh, the impact of that. Our mission, and this is a new and updated mission. We updated our strategic plan last year after our initial strategic plan from 2016 to 2022 expired. And we thought it was a really critical time with all our new staff and new managers, and particularly as the field of probation evolves and to really stay in front and step ahead of, of what's coming. So our new mission statement is to contribute to community well-being through positive engagement, connection to services, and support the, for those impacted by crime. And our vision is a safe, equitable, and thriving community. This strategic plan, this is just a vision and mission. There's much more to it, but was crafted by our internal department co-design team, by our partners, uh, had the voice of individuals with lived experience. Uh, a lot of surveys were done, so it's rich and informed also by data. So uh, um, I hope to come back uh, and present our strategic plan because I think it's it's really important that uh, that we have that as a line of sight for the future. And really of note, uh, importantly, the operational goals and objectives outlined in our plan are aligned with the broader operational goals and objectives of this of the county. Well, I, you know, unlike other departments, I didn't have pictures of, of the leadership team, but they're right behind me. So you could actually see them live here. So wave your hand. So apologize for that. Um, uh, but these these folks are so important for making everything that we do happen. Again, we have our Sarah Berman, our juvenile hall superintendent. Uh, we have Jose Flores, who's our juvenile division director, Yolanda James Sevilla, pretrial division director, adult services director, Sarah Fletcher, uh, and you've already met Melissa Allen. But these exceptional leaders with their expertise and commitment to excellence have been instrumental in spearheading our journey towards modernizing probation practices. Their collective dedication has propelled us forward, enabling us to continually refine and enhance our approach to meet the evolving needs of our community and the demands of probation, uh, contemporary probation standards. Our achievements, um, I'll keep it short because there's so many, but uh, we've really been intentional in creating equitable opportunities for, for those we serve. Uh, always proud to show photos of our annual two-week Azteca's Youth Summer Camp, which we call the Prevention and Intervention Program. And we wonder what's what's soccer got to do with probation. But uh, this program's in South County. We've, we're always proud of the work that we do out there with our youth and proud of the volunteers, our staff that that run this program and, and the those who help fund this program. Um, last year, we had over 200 participants uh, with support from the district attorney's office, other justice stakeholders. Uh, and many of you who come out and go out in the field and support us. We'll be there uh, this July. Uh, we'll be in South County uh, for, for two weeks of camp, July 8th and July 15th. So make note of that. If you want to come out and have some fun, say hi to the kids, say hi to the folks that are out there. They, they'd really love that. Um, and we'll go to the next photo. You saw a similar photo in our public defender's uh, presentation, but I'm going to have uh, Valerie uh, say a word about this, just the profound impact that this leadership network uh, will have in our community. Press the button. Press the button. There's a button. <laughs> oh, there you go. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. So last year, the Annie E. Casey Foundation opened up another opportunity to 
add an additional class to their Applied Leadership Network, which is a leadership program sponsored by the Casey Foundation to lead equitable results in communities that they serve. And is also how I met our now chief, uh, Fernando Geraldo, as we were in the second class many years ago. I won't say how many. But this particular class has a team from Santa Cruz, uh, which includes Jose Flores from our department, Maria Rodriguez from CAB, um, Sarah Emmert from United Way, Gloria Carroll from HSD, David Rodriguez from um, Watsonville PD, and then Caitlin Becker from the PDO's office. And so they're working to scale diversions in the county with a cross sector of partners in order to keep youth out of detention and out of the juvenile justice system. So we're looking for great things from them and great partnerships to be built to support that across the community. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge all the folks, it's county partners and volunteers that just, we held a prom dress drive uh, in South County for those folks that uh, a lot of, we know maybe ourselves included in that experience, prom time comes around, how am I going to afford a dress, a suit, shoes or whatever? And, and people were able to bring out hundreds of outfits and even do hair or makeup and all that. So these are just the kind of things that have an impact in the community that's important that no one realizes that probation does, aside from our important role in community supervision. Uh, and the last photo there is just our trunk or treat, which is such an amazing event that we have uh, both at the sheriff's office and out in the uh, fairgrounds in Watsonville. Um, and we already have a date scheduled coming up in October. Really importantly, I want to touch on our public safety achievements. These outcomes are taken from our 2023 annual reports. And as part of the public safety ecosystem, we have a critical role in keeping the community safe through diversion, pretrial alternatives, and community supervision. Our highly trained staff employ supervision strategies that coach individuals to success and address accountability. Just briefly, I'll talk about pretrial. Pretrial is a jail alternative programming uh, that provides community monitoring. So it's an alternative to being in jail. And as you've previously heard, uh, uh, when folks are languishing in jail, there's a lot at stake to lose housing, lose their, 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 their family members, potentially lose their jobs. We had a 91% of the individuals on pretrial did not commit a new criminal activity and 86 appeared for court. So this is out, these are outstanding. Um, and thank our pretrial staff who, who are always working with these clients to really uplift them and make sure that they, they make their court appearances. Um, you look at our juvenile hall population, we've had a 79% decrease since 1997. Uh, average daily population was 10 in 2023. And we also have pretrial services or the equivalent in juvenile probation, and we have a 98% success rate. So this proves that we can uh, really serve people in the community uh, in many cases rather than, than in the jail, and they'll do just fine, and the community will be safe, which is the most important part. The slide shows our budget. Uh, you've seen this slide before. As you see, um, there is a general fund contribution of $11.4 million. Our expenditures are... 36.8 million revenues, 25.4 uh, million. And we have, we're not asking for any new staff. It's staying the same. So we are at 134 staff. Talk about our primary budget goals. These uh, mo modest budget goals underscore a dedication to maximizing limited resources for impactful outcomes across diverse populations. They prioritize the implementation of new legislation, bridge technological technological gaps, and effectively, effectively address the evolving needs of probation. Uh, we're working hard uh, on the planning and implementation of CalAIM. We're already screening uh, everyone that comes into our juvenile hall. Our pretrial services along with the jail are screening all admissions into the jail. And as you know, CalAIM now allows folks to um, get their Medi-Cal restarted 90 days prior to leaving. So that's really important so folks can start receiving services. Uh, and then for the reentry part, uh, receive enhanced uh, um, care management. But I'm really proud. I, I, you know, I'm part of the large networks of chiefs and counties and our county is doing a, a tremendous job. There's some counties that are scratching their head around what Cal Lame is. It's going to be a lot. I mean, there's unfunded parts to this, but I think uh, we're doing as good as we can and, uh, to implement this. I really want to thank our, our partners with this. Um, 
really important really is, again, you, is investing in technology and data sharing that expedites the data, automates the process flow and workflow. And so that's something that we're really working on to do. And it would really help with our pre-trial services as well, because there's a lot of paperwork that's involved in that. Might have skipped. Okay. So here's our requested uh, change. Um, we are requesting in our pretrial division an extra help deputy probation officer um, to support pretrial services. And that, again, that would be extra help. Um, in the administrative services division, we are we want to add a departmental fiscal officer, and we do that by unfunding uh, an administrative services officer. Um, but I just do want to show you how our pretrial population since 2015 has increased by 692% from an average daily population of in the high 30s to what it was in 2023, exceeding almost almost 300. Uh, and in some instances, uh, our population on pretrial is actually more than those who are in the main jail. So that really shows you the importance of having a pretrial program. If we didn't have that, if we didn't have such a success, successful team, we'd have a lot more folks uh, languishing in jail. So I, uh, it's an important program and, uh, and I'm glad you supported, but we're looking for more support and uh, with the extra help staff would really, really be uh, supportive for us. And again, in the juvenile hall, um, it's key that we implement Cal AIM uh, and really get, you know, expedite folks getting those medical and behavioral health, physical health services that they need upon release to have a successful reentry and just a path towards success. So the community benefit, I think our, on, on our mind, and I've, I've said it already, is really how impl the implementation of Cal AIM can help our clients, can help them get their health care benefits, can help them get housing, um, bridge those extensive gaps that they have. It's particularly for those the vulnerable population, which will lead to successful reentry and having folks, folks get their, their basic needs met. Um, and again, if we strengthen pretrial services, uh, this will increase direct supports for our pretrial clients, which will result in approved court appearances. They'll remain arrest free and, in, and this really increases community well being for all, not just for clients, but the entire community. So these are our revenue trends. State allocations remain relatively consistent. The May revise did not uh, impact our. Um, our budget um, in this in, the, in just slight ways, but unlike other departments that you heard of today, uh, we're, we're doing okay right now. Uh, Ninety-eight point five of our annual uh, revenues come from uh, mostly from state and grant funding and other sources. Our annual intergovernmental revenue. Um, the proposed again state budget does not include significant reductions to our department, other than a $150,000 reduction in the Community Corrections Partnership planning money. That's one-time money that we get annually. So obviously that is a hit, um, but you know we had kept our fingers crossed that it wouldn't be worse. And so I'm hoping it doesn't uh, doesn't continue to they find you know places to to take money from uh, local governments. So this budget really allows us to sustain our operational plan and goals. Our expenditure trends, salaries and benefits are 62% of our annual expenses, and that's that's typical of any department. Uh, services and supplies are 26%. And our only change worth noting is the percentage of services and supplies, which is an increase about 6%, but that's mostly due to Cal AIM revenue. We are recipients of Cal AIM path, path, uh, path, path funding round two and round three as well. So that's in our budget, but that's gonna help for planning and implementation and screening. Uh, parts of that. I just want to uh, acknowledge my team um, uh, for an additional revenue trend uh, for the last few years that's been increasing and it's mitigated other decreases such as Title IV reduction. Our Medi Med MA revenues, which is Medi-Cal administrative claiming, brings our department $1.1 million each year. Uh, and it takes a lot of work. We all, every one of us here claims, claims, does the claiming every day, uh, and our staff as well. And over last year, we saw an increase of two hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Again, I, ideally, we would have, we'd like to see an increase in revenue to support pretrial services. SB one twenty-nine partly funds pretrial, but we don't think it's enough. Um, and so that's some, um, that's an area that you know, we could definitely use help in. This, this is a 
very similar slide just to to what I talked about in terms of our uh, requested and adopted budget. So um, here, this uh, slide again shows something, uh, our number of staff across uh, each division. Um, as you can see, our uh, adult division is our biggest division. Um, overall, we have we have a, actually now it's a, a four point, I don't believe this was updated, but it's a 4.6% vacancy rate. We have a total of six vacancies in our department currently. currently. And that's really mostly due to uh, retirements. People do retire occasionally. Um, also, um, promotions. So when we get in, you know, um, so that's generally that. We pretty have a high retention rate in our department. So, and uh, we have a really great pipeline, a local pipeline of talent of uh, new folks coming in and ready to become work in our department, whether it's probation officer, accounting, or analyst, and so on. So, um, and these. These vacancies that we have, we have six. We're on our way to to um, to filling those. But as you know, you fill two and one one leaves or one retires. It's just the way it is. Just talk a little bit about just staffing trends. Uh, we do offer a one day remote hybrid schedule for some staff, not all. Obviously, juvenile hall staff need to be there twenty four seven, as other front front counter folks need to be there. So we offer that, but that's a, that's an incentive. Uh, we do flex scheduling for some, which is a four ten hour work week. We continue to do virtual trainings and conferences. We facilitate that and encourage that. Recruitment strategies. Uh, I think we're do really well at that, um, and we're excited about there's a county job fair next week, May 30th, that we'll be there as well with our staff from different uh, units. Uh, we have a lot of interns in our department. We have interns from UCSC, Caprio, uh, Monterey Bay, Cal State, uh, San Jose State as well. So that's always exciting to see the young people who are actually perhaps considering careers, and that's a pipeline. Do a lot of recruitment with posting in diverse organizations, high school reach, outreach. You'll see our staff at a lot of high school career fairs are speaking to classes about what probation does, and again, college college recruitment. And uh, many of us here are uh, UCSC banana slugs. I think half the team here behind me, including myself. So uh, we believe in uh, going to the school here and, and really giving back to our community for many years. This is our administrative division. This is where you do see uh, a change. However, it's not an adding an FTE. It's really what we're requesting is to um, uh, fund a department f fiscal officer by unfunding, which is vacant now at administrative services officer position. And really, we believe that's super important for us. That Those MA revenues that we get, that's very complicated um, accounting. So that's just one area. But as you know, we also are the recipients uh, very regularly of, of grants from the boat, usually from the state, require a lot of accounting, a lot of auditing. So this, this person, individual, would be responsible for that. And we also will see a benefit, I think. We'll see increased MA revenues to us, which is which is super important for us. Current projects, the juvenile hall renovation project, we did actually pass the most recent fire marshal inspector. I get that asked a lot. And so we hope to go out to bid uh, in late 2024 for construction of both the gym project as well as the, the renovation project. So fingers clap crossed, but we've made a lot of progress. And so we're very excited about that. New projects or requests really are just some minor facilities upgrades. Um, um, again, for often the juvenile hall, which is uh, built in 1967, so it does require a lot of work. So thanks, uh, GSD, for always you know helping us out with some of the issues up there. I want to talk about the knowns. Uh, our base allocation, we know base allocations, which are a number of state entitlements that come to the probation department um, that can fluctuate because uh, they, they're, they're tax revenue based, but they, they do remain steady. Um, we know that we uh, uh, $150,000 was eliminated from our AB 109 planning dollars. SB 678, which pr uh, provides $1.7 million and SB 129, which is about uh, 750,000 annually remains consistent. That supports pre-trial 
As always, legislative uh, proposals, uh, those are unknown. We see a lot of those that, that could impact us, impact uh, county jobs, and impact or disrupt our services uh, to work, like 10, or to our juveniles, like SB 1057. Uh, and then there's, of course, the, uh, the election impacts. Future considerations, our use of secure youth treatment facilities, that's SYTF. As you know, we don't locally house youth who are committed by the court to secure youth facilities. We were fortunate that we house, we can house them. I wish it was closer, but Sonoma County has graciously offered to house them and they, we trust that they're providing them great services and, and care of those youth. We've gone into a contract with another county uh, in case we do need that. Um, the Mobile Success Center, just touch upon that. That's really when we talk about equity, it's accessibility. A lot of clients can't get to our offices. Uh, it's one of the most difficult things, really, is, is their, their transportation can't pay for gas. We do a lot of uh, vouchers for the buses, but the Mobile Success Center will allow us, us to go to where our clients are. So we're, the van, we expect the van to come. It's a, a fully outfitted Sprinter van, and we expect that to come in the fall. Um, Another exciting thing is we are expanding our Water Street offices, so we'll actually have the entire first floor, but it's really about um, staff morale, having more space for staff, but we're pretty crowded over there, so we're going to expand that, and I think, you know, when staff feel good about their office and workspace, I think the, the return is they're working uh, even better with the clients that we serve each and every day. It's a really, really busy office over there and across the street. You know, we also have our our probation success center as we do in South County. So our final slide. So our request is approve the proposed budget for the probation department, including any supplemental materials, which includes revenues of 25.4 million, expenses of 36.8 million, a general fund contribution of 11.4 million, uh, and the staffing is add one departmental fiscal officer by unfunding one administrative services officer and add one extra help deputy probation officer. So thank you for the time. And, um, I'll take questions. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation and great work as always within your department. Um, thank you. We'll have some questions and comments for you. Um, but what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open up to the public to see if there's any member of the public who's joining us here today in chambers who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, you can come up and you'll have two minutes to speak. Okay, seeing no one here in chambers, I'd like to ask the clerk if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Thank, uh, once again, good afternoon, Chair and Board. Um, so I'm thinking about the budget. Uh, I know probation, you know, does adult, there's a, there's a lot of work, right? Uh, adult and juvenile. So I'll keep my comments uh, short and maybe uh, provide a suggestion on how the county can save money, right? Uh, according to the ADPs on the juvenile hall, right? Um, there is a lot of empty beds, you know, and that's just the reality. Um, there's, you know, which is a good thing, right? That is, that's something that we want to see. Um, but I'm just thinking of how can we restructure and save money or reinvest some of that money if we were to deactivate, uh, these empty cells. I don't know how that formula works, right? But I seen the governor, uh, did it on state side, right? Uh, saving $80 million by deactivating units. Uh, beds and closing down prisons, you know, so there is precedent. It can be done. Um, and essentially it's just, uh, really thinking about being fiscally responsible. Um, and yeah, what does that look like? You know, I said it earlier in the, my general public comment too, around looking at the, at the same thing around the sheriff's office. Right. Um, so there, I think there's things that we can do differently, um, and, or do something with these empty beds, you know, um, so, yeah, there's a, a work to be done, but the, you know, we we are we are looking at a positive trend here where less folks are getting involved in the system, you know, um, and I think that's everybody's hopes and and the work that essentially that we're doing through these health services, you know, providing opportunities, housing, you know, it's just uh, yeah. So, anyways, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Pam, your microphone's now available. Hi, thank you. Um, 
Pam Sexton again. And yeah, I just wanted to share and I, um, also thinking of, of how to save money. And I, um, am, I, this year I read a book that I'd really like to recommend that raises questions for me that I'll, I'll pose here. But the book that I read is called Mass Supervision, Probation, Parole, and the Illusion of Safety and Freedom by Vincent Chiraldi. And Vincent Chiraldi is a juvenile justice expert um, based on the East Coast. But in the book, he talks about a lot of national issues and, um, and, and different places. But on the national level, what he argues based on data is that um, the goals, he goes through the history of probation, which was super fascinating for me. And I think important for, for all of us to know, and especially when we're looking at things like public budget, um, but how the, how it started and, and the goals of it are to decrease incarceration and increase safety, but how in our history, it's failed on both of those things. And so I guess my questions are, you know, looking locally, I, I noticed the in the 90s, uh, a quote about the pretrial folks getting out. Um, and I guess that's a recidivism rate. And I wonder in what time frame, because my understanding is the recidivism rate is extremely high. And just this idea that probation, it it causes um, more incarceration because so many people go in on small infractions and also that it disrupts lives. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions, comments, and then we'll take some action. I'll turn it over to Supervisor Friend. Uh, first, thing, thanks for the kind words. It's uh, working with you has been been great. Uh, you have to say that because you're my constituent and you want your road fixed, and I understand. <laughs> I want that speed bump, yeah. please. <laughs> I, I know what you want. <laughs> but your your team has been nationally recognized and has been a model. In fact, when I've even done work at both CSAC and NACO, uh, your team is is brought up as a model. So know that your uh, this little place is making a big difference across the country, which is a pretty pretty cool thing. Um, it was good to see that the governor. The governor's proposal, anyway, I never know what the legislature will do, is more or less maintaining most of the public safety. I mean, I understand why, but most of the public safety uh, uh, funds for you and, and others right now. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, it, this, these future boards are going to have to grapple, continue to grapple with this, this what feels like uh, long-term deferred discussion about what to really do with Juvenile Hall similar to what we're doing even with um, long-term other massive capital projects like landfill and other things. And and so I think that at some point we're going to have to have broader discussions about the, the main jail, broader discussions about um, juvenile hall. And I understand we have plans and I understand it's, but it seems like every year we're just talking about the gym and about those things. But I mean, I'm saying from a broader, I mean, for like every year, so like a little bit groundhog day, you know, um, that these, the, the members that are still left here, I think that, that maybe in the next year or two, we should start a broader conversation about what that transition to some other facility is going to look like or what the facility rebuilds are going to look like, what your plans for that are, so we can at least uh, start to daylight to the community what the expectations are. But, but other than that, um, that's a problem for these three and two new other folks, but your, your team's doing uh, really important and really remarkable work. just want to compliment you on it. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor so, Donegan. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, incredible work. I mean, the, the numbers speak for themselves, 692% increase in the pretrial population. I mean, it's a huge number of folks that have been diverted from jail, a uh, 79% reduction in the average um, you know, daily uh, uh, juveniles at Juvenile Hall. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and it does, I mean, it's sort of victims of your own success, I suppose, in, to, to this respect in terms of the, you know, this question that was brought up both by members of the public uh, and my supervisor friend of, uh, well, could we utilize juvenile hall better? Are there opportunities for some kind of optimization there? Because I mean, it is a huge part of the general fund contribution, right? I mean, if I got it right at 7.8 million out of the 11.4, um, it's significant. And, and of course, there's a lot of empty beds there. Now, I don't 
think that just, you know, you can't just like close one bed, right? And, and save money. Uh, you know, you could get the, the overhead costs of keeping the whole facility open are what they are. Um, but, you know, one question is with the uh, out of county secure youth treatment facilities, is there any opportunity to like upgrade a portion of juvenile hall to be able to handle, uh, you know, secure youth treatment type programs? Yeah, that, um, you know, hopefully we can have local discussions. Obviously, that's costly to to do that kind of renovation uh, because the desire all along for at least SBA 23, which which realigned that youth population, was for them to be closer to home. Uh, and Sonoma isn't isn't close to home; it's at least two hours away. Uh, and so uh, that would be, you know, something. If I had a, a magic wand and there was lots of money, but we're talking about this time uh, that we're in, how do we, you know, do that con type of construction? I will say, we've actually decreased the number of beds that we have, and we've converted uh, a couple rooms into soft counseling rooms, um, meaning that. Um, staff um, can or met behavioral health staff can meet with clients and sit with them actually in the units they can now but now they have a private space that's been we took two rooms and they're they don't look as much as you can now make them look like a jail cell so we've been doing that downsizing the rooms and turning and taking advantage of the the space but i uh, i completely understand the expenses and the and, and what we could envision uh, locally um, with our facility we have in the past uh, and it was a very big, shocking um, cost to to doing something different. And the question is then: How much are we currently spending, or you know, on security treatment facilities outside of the county? Uh, each um, youth for a year would cost one hundred and ten thousand dollars. We get funding from the state for that, so it's not to the general fund cost. Uh, we currently have two young people who are in Sonoma County. We have a very low commitment rate. That's great. It's unpredictable, however, but um, but right now our costs are covered by those realignment dollars, and it's helping us all. Those dollars also helped us to do a little renovation and modifying in the juvenile hall. Um, but those that state dollars, if if all of a sudden we had a huge volume of youth who were in custody, perhaps looking at STYF, um, that could be problematic um, in in the future. Um, for us, but right now, um, largely due to the collaborations and partnerships, we're just really focused on diverting as many youth as we can from the juvenile justice system, so they don't they're not exposed to that possibility as well. And we do a lot of diversion work uh, in the adult side too. Okay, thank you, thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Well, thank you for the presentation, and thank you for all the work you guys do as well. Uh, you know, it seems like a lot of the work that uh, probation does is almost shifting in a way uh, from the time I did the tour with the department and today's presentation to towards a more like preventative uh, social justice model, almost like a so social worker rather than a more punitive system, right? Uh, which I believe is a good thing, right? It's, it's great. Um, I'd like to see more of it, especially to reduce some of the we uh recidivism rates amongst adults, youth, or not even get youth in the system, right? Um, so I you know, the same question that I, I kind of ask, the only question that I have is um are we looking at some of the uh Calame reimbursements as well? Any additional areas where we can look at Calame reimbursements? You know, I know they're doing stuff like wellness coaches or for for youth and like the, the largely the the services that would be provided a pre-release in custody would be uh, provided by behavioral health, health services agency so they would be being reimbursed for those services and that could actually free up general fund that is the big question that everyone he has though how much how much will we be the county be reimbursed uh, so it looks promising but we have yet to know what what that would look like and that that so it's more of a freeing up general fund perhaps that can be shifted and redirected somewhere else but we don't know as far as probation our our big our big role is really is drawing down the medical administrative activities which is a little bit different given that we don't provide those type of uh, services um um, and, and just going back to your point of social workers, uh, we have on staff, I think, I believe our, our three of our managers, including myself, are, are MSWs. We're social workers and a number of our staff are as well. So I think that's what you're seeing is a result of that, just because we have to work in that. We actually have an accountability and an enforcement aspect as well. But uh, but initially, what can we do to really not have folks penetrate and go into the deep end? And that's just prevention and, and intervention. 
<laughs> Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chief um, Fernando Geraldo, and uh, your Chief Assistant, uh, Valerie Thompson. I do have fond memories of Philadelphia, Danny Casey. I'll never forget it. Uh, Van Jones, probably the most liberal guy on the planet, and Newt Gingrich were really good buddies. And they talked about how they could get their act together. And boy, could we use some more of that today. Huh? It was really impressive. It was really something. But I, I do want to point out the importance of the fiscal officer that uh, you, you recommended here. And I think it's a true, uh, as true with other departments as well, that um, the management of grants that uh, you have been so successful at um, requires an enormous amount of work. And uh, it makes sense to have a dedicated position for that. I'm glad that you have that. And I think it's going to really pay literally uh, very good dividends for the county. And I also want to mention the investment in implementing the Cal AIM, as you mentioned, uh, and the outcomes we expect to see as a result of um, the result of the true pretrial support. But uh, you, you've been fantastic. It's been a great team effort that you have. And to your, your team of employees uh, who are here and otherwise, uh, thank you for what you do. It's really an impressive record that you've established here for Santa Cruz County. Thanks so much. And um, one of you look back to the slide with the um, graph that had kind of the population of folks who are in um, in jail, and then how that's changed over time. Yeah, so that slide. Um, so, and I can show you, tell you a little bit about that. As you know, well, so there's a big shift, as you see, in COVID, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's great that the jail's been able to keep a lower population. So COVID definitely impacted both the jail and the probation department. That was uh, our staff rose to the occasion. You know, other folks uh, were running away, I mean, understandably, but we had to be there every day and uh, and release those people. So it was just a health crisis. And I really commend my staff for, for showing up uh, and, you know, with the right equipment in order to do that job. But it's it's gone up, up significantly. That red line shows all facilities, not just the main jail, it's Roundtree, um, Lane Street, as well as the, the main jail. So when I talked about our numbers exceeding, I think at times the main jail, we're just talking about the main jail, but I think it just reflects the importance of probation as a mm -hmm. release valve for facilities uh, and not just to let anybody out because they're taking up space or it's costly, but it's it's the right thing to do for these individuals, given the, the, the great outcomes that we have. Right. And I just wanted to see if maybe you might be able to answer a couple of questions I had related to this. And so I'm just wondering because, you know, pretrials going up, jail populations kind of staying flat. It's not going back to what it was is there anything in particular you might be able to speak to in terms of whether it's programs that were the, the way pro probation was shifted during covid and pre-trial is there anything in particular there that's helped contribute to us kind of keeping the populations down well uh, certainly during uh during covid there was the the zero bail aspect of that that you just couldn't bring you know a low level misdemeanor into the jail that definitely contributed to that, to the number of arrests out in the field. And some, a lot of that, those practices have, have remained, right? Uh, you know, we, we have limited capacity across all our departments to address every need. So let's focus on the most high, what we call high need, high risk, uh, and deal with that. And sometimes that, that means maybe an arrest, or if it's a low level, we're, we'll do, we'll do something differently. Uh, we'll use the sobering center, like the sheriff opened up a, a great program uh, recently. So those are ways that really kind of reduce reliance on incarceration for the lower, lower level. We really believe that, you know, it's reserved for those that really, you know, are a public safety risk. Um, that's why they're in there. Uh, and some are just in there because they're waiting to go to CDCR or, or perhaps a state hospital. So I think those things shifted. We, we um, so the number of arrests shifted, um, and the courts trusting. Um, I should say that there there's a lot of decision makers. It's not just the jail or probation around who you know who gets released. There's a lot of players. You have your the, uh, the prosecutor, you have the public defender, and the judges. And so I think they have confidence in our pretrial program. So that was another thing working with them as we expanded through SB 129, built capacity, and they see the statistics as well. So they have confidence that. All right, we can let this individual go. So I think the uh, the judges uh, and our just entire court system is is really confident in pretrial uh, and making the the right decisions that are informed by a uh, public safety assessment. Well, it's just great to hear that you know we were able to take a time of crisis and use it as a learning opportunity, and now as a result, we're able to kind of reduce 
the number of people who are seeing in our jails. And I know that from the many years that I've been just hearing things from the community, and sometimes the things that happen from outside are projected on us. But what we're doing here is really trying to address concerns about putting people in jail and overcrowding our jails and really trying to figure out what are the holistic ways that we can approach keeping people out of jail after they've, you know, um, after they've broken the law and really try to work with them to improve their quality of life and give back to their community. So I just want to thank you all um, for all the work that you're doing around this and very supportive of retrial as, as was expressed by Supervisor McPherson, you know, having a fiscal officer is really going to help us continue to find grants, find funding, and make sure that it's all executed in a way that is less of an impact on our general fund and, and also um, getting funding into the county. Um, the next um, question I had was related to the renovation project. I'm just wondering, I'd heard a lot about the uh, the, the gym, but I heard less about the renovation project um, in the meetings that we've had previously. And so yes. I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to the renovation. Yeah, project. the renovation uh, project and uh, is known as the seed, this table grant. And really w since we were, we were, we haven't been in a position to really build a new juvenile hall the state was releasing money that actually uh, would allow counties with juvenile halls to increase their programming space, enhance it, but not build beds. We didn't want to build beds. Clearly, we don't need more beds. So we went for this grant. And now I believe it was probably 20, 2014, 2015, um, you, you joined us. Uh, to, to make the pitch to Sacramento to the, the funders. So what the, the grant has will do um, and is it really, first of all, it's just, you know, it's like anytime you open up the hood in the car, you see something wrong. So it's got to deal with all the update, all the, the infrastructure. And what do you call that? The earthquake, you know, all the retrofitting. retrofitting size. But aside from that, it's going to renovate. Our kitchen is, is, is old and I don't, and they do it. They do great meals and work up there, but we need a brand new kitchen that's safer, better equipped. So it's a new brand new kitchen. Um, this is the renovation side. It's going to help renovate our programming space, bring softer, better lighting, and so on into the units. Um, change out some of the doors. If you haven't been to the facility, uh, we do need improvements and uh, security upgrades. Uh, also, also upgrades outside in the parking lot um, in terms of where parking is and cr uh, create a sally port. So a lot of it is safety upgrades, but also just programming space in, in the institution, particularly in the kitchen. The C to table is that it involves a, a garden, creating a garden, having a greenhouse out in the, in, in the unit on the grounds and, and being able to grow, grow food, which is, uh, which other counties actually do with great success where the young people can offer that to their families when they come visit, but also we could use it in the kitchen uh, to teach them a skill. Cooking is, you know, a way to people's heart. So that's kind of what we want to do. And I guess on that note, I'll just add that when I was a college intern working with the uh, University of Illinois <clears throat> extension, we actually had a um, master gardener program within the county jail. And so I don't know if there's an opportunity to partner with the UC office, the UC extension offices, but um, I know they have master gardener programs as well. And so that might, we, we would love to, as we get close to that, that's, that's what we'd like to do. We've had actually garden projects in the past out behind the freedom office for a while. So that's, we're going to really lean into volunteers and programs like that. So thanks for right. that suggestion. Yeah. And then I guess the only um, last comments I have, uh, I'm just really, it's really great to hear about the interns uh, that you all are having in your departments. I know we've been talking about trying to increase internship opportunities and to hear that you all are really able to get students from UCS and all the outreach you're doing is really going to make a difference in trying to make sure that we have a pipeline for people to come into the county to fill vacancies as we see retirements, you know, continue to occur over the next few years. So I'm really happy to see all the work that you're doing and um, just Please keep us, in, you know, informed as the year progresses, and there's opportunities for us to support. Just let us know how we can. And I will be. Con I was just thinking to myself. I've gone to all the jail facilities and done tours so far, except juvenile halls. Oh, so we should and, we should circle back. We're to, uh, we're, we're absolutely, our superintendent yeah. is here, and we'll we'll get that scheduled and okay. do that. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, I think uh, most people would like to leave. Otherwise, but I could you know go on forever. <laughs> but um, but. Uh, seriously, I guess we, if there's a board member who will be willing to move the probation budget, we can wrap up our meeting for today. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion on the 
appropriation budget by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Friend. And with that, I'll turn to the clerk for, clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all again. And then tomorrow we will resume our meeting at 9 a.m. And so we'll see you all then. Yeah.